Hi, welcome to Climate Action Day. Um, Jen and I are super excited to have you today. And um, Jen, over to you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our main event, Climate Action Day 2022. We are thrilled to have you joining us. And we cannot wait for a full day of speakers and students and a lot of sharing that is going to be action packed and here for all of you. We are really super excited to have you. And first of all, I would like to thank everybody who has been part of Climate Action Project as well for the last, uh, the past weeks. We know that you went uh, outside your comfort zone and you really went the extra mile. And we really appreciate this because today will be about climate education. We will be having a lot of exciting speakers today. Uh, you can find all of those at our website and I will uh, pop up a banner so you're able to find it. Climateactionday.net, you will find a lineup, you will find the speakers. And we also added a few resources, Jen. Can you elaborate a little bit on those? I'd love to. So if you go to the website, you'll be able to tune in live the whole day. So if you're able to join for a little bit of time or the entire event, we are thrilled you're here. I'm seeing tons of comments in the YouTube chat coming from YouTube and Twitter all around the world. And we have resources ready for classrooms. So a couple of them that you can check out. One is a resource to help you host a watch party event. So we have full schools joining this year and they're watching. We're waving hi to you all. We're so happy that you are joining with us. So they have community members. They have parents. Of course, their students and teachers joining in live. So hosting a watch party, we are thrilled to have you all with us for that part of our day. We also have a speaker guide for classrooms. So if you check out the speaker guide, you will be able to see that we have bios, photos, related resources, including links and some fun tips and quotes, and then some prompts for further discussion. So questions that you as teachers can ask with your students to be thinking about messages that our speakers today are going to bring. Two more resources. We have activity worksheets for classrooms. So those are divided up into two sets. One set is for our primary classrooms. So saying hi to all of our primary classrooms, please, please be sure to say hello in the chat box so we can see where you're joining from and then our secondary classrooms. So as you know, with the Climate Action Project, Climate Action Day, we are on a mission at Take Action Global of climate education for all. So we have students as young as age four all the way up through university joining with us. So we believe this conversation is for everyone. So thank you for being with us here today. That's amazing. So we have been working on a schedule um, of a lot of different uh, kind of speakers, basically. And they all will approach climate and education in a different way. We have a president, we have a princess, we have young activists. We have a lot of students, hundreds of students of, across the world in every continent. Well, not Antarctica this time. Last year we had. Um, we have a magician. We have dancers. We try to bring you a lot of fun today. A lot of food for thought as well. So we want you to think about uh, what you learned throughout the past weeks, but also share it with us. We will give something away, and that will be like in 15 minutes, something like that. And it's so, so great to have like uh, an altars sharing with you and so many different people from different perspectives. I would like to use uh, this moment as well to share something what we created because um, all of you, you have been trying to focus on climate change 
you have been learning about it and you have been sharing your findings online so that everybody is able to learn from each other. And probably you discovered that climate change can be very different in your country as it is in a different uh, in a, other people's uh, countries, basically, other participants. And um, we try to go beyond learning about. We also try to come up with solutions and take action for it. But still, some people, they are not really um, sure that there is a big impact of climate education. So they're not really sure that your work really matters. Your work as a student, your work as a teacher. And that is why we decided to come up with a new app, which we launched last year during the project. And it's called the Earth Project app. It's free. And it would be really, really great if you can take your phone right now. It can be like an Android machine, iOS, whatever you want. And please install our app because it is going to show you what kind of actions you and everyone can take. Small, small actions like going to school by bike, stop eating red meat or just for like one week using your phone less, um, et cetera, et cetera. We have like 25 different actions also to plant a tree. And after you've been uh, taking one of those actions, you can see your direct impact, the amount of carbon avoided. And you can even create like a team and do an effort with a group of people. It can be a small challenge between you and another group of students or like between schools or in your office, whatever you want. And then you can see what the impact is of your actions, of your change of behavior, basically. There's a leaderboard and we promise we will keep working on the app to make it more fun. We will add new parts of gamification to it. So please make sure to install our app. You can find it at earthproject.org. Thank you so much. Jen? So I know, Kun, this conversation we've been having around climate education has been one we've been having for years. And we have some people who have been with us from the start. And they come back year after year for the Climate Action Project. They share it with their friends, their colleagues. So we went from maybe one teacher in a school to a couple to now full schools, full countries joining in. So if you have been with us from the start or this is your first year participating in the Climate Action Project, we are thrilled to have you. We are going to have some guests here today that you have met before. So we're going to be welcoming back some of our good old friends that have joined with Climate Action Day in the past, or you've maybe met through some of our webinars. And then we are thrilled to welcome in lots of new friends. So we have a wonderful program today, and we're so grateful for all of the people who said yes and who said we care about climate education and we care about classrooms and teachers and students, and we need your voices as part of the conversation. So you're going to be able to hear from them in the speaker guide. You will be also able to find their Twitter handles. So you can give them some love on Twitter and send them messages. We have a hashtag that you can use, which is hashtag climate action edu. So if you want to tag that in on any of your social posts, if you're sharing on Twitter or on Facebook, LinkedIn, we are going to be able to find you there. We have communities across social media and across the planet. So you can see here our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts. So we'd love to see what you all are doing in your local areas as we're sharing out and broadcasting to the world. In addition to our awesome speakers, we are really excited to share that we have 25 classrooms who will be joining us today. They are from all around the world and they're going to be presenting their solutions. So 
if you weren't a participant in the Climate Action Project, which we're in week six right now, we're finishing up. So Climate Action Project welcomes students and teachers to come together for six weeks and we look at causes and effects. And in a very short period of time, our classrooms come together and they create solutions. So you're gonna hear some of those today. And solutions look like a lot of different things with the Climate Action Project. They can look like inventions, advocacy campaigns. We have a lot of arts that are brought in. So we'll have theater productions and song performances and lots of things in between. So shout out to all of our 25 classrooms for the work they've done to prepare for presenting today. And you're gonna be hearing from them shortly. That's great. I'm really curious where you are coming from. Feel free to drop your country, your city in our chat. And so everybody is able to see where you come from. So Jen, I'm excited. How about you? We are ready. We have been preparing for this day, I think really since last Climate Action Day. <laughs> so one full year of preparation and we couldn't have done it without our amazing team behind the scenes. They are running social media, they're creating graphics. If you've checked out our team on our tag website, you'll see that we have people that we are global and we have young people that are part of our team. So we wanna make sure that we have representation in a lot of different ways. I see you're adding here, Kuhn, we have Turkey, Serbia, I saw Russia, Egypt, hi friends in Egypt, Belgium, Romania, we have wonderful teachers in Romania, Syria, Macedonia, Poland, Hi to our friends in India and in Sri Lanka. So keep sharing. We are thrilled to have you all posting where you're joining from. Bangladesh, Taiwan. We have 149 countries represented with our program, don't we, Kun? Yes, we do. And uh, it's really, really great to see how it's still growing every year. Every year we think like okay this is the maximum amount, amount of potential countries you know but still it's growing and that is really really great also uh, great to see that countries which are really uh, for for whom it's really challenging to join that they are still uh, making sure to be part of uh, climate action project and climate action day whether it's like a war or like uh, time zones or like effects of climate change um, we are really really happy you're able to join us thank you so much great so Jen I think what we can do today and now is shifting to our first speaker of the day and this would be the president the former president of Finland uh, President Tarja Halonen, and she has a message for us. So let's listen to her. Dear friends, I'm very happy to take part in the Climate Action Day. This day demonstrates the urgency of scaling up action to tackle climate change and that we all can be a part of the solution. Climate change is one of the biggest challenges to sustainable development. It is a challenge that cannot wait until tomorrow. Climate change, environmental degradation and loss of biodiversity are exposing humankind to unprecedented threats regarding safeguarding our living conditions and human rights. The impacts of climate change are increasingly being felt around the world. You, young people and children, often stand at the forefront in the fight against the climate change. Dear friends, combating climate change also opens an opportunity for change. A more sustainable path enhances well-being, global justice and equality. Worldwide young people, you are leading the way for a more equal and resilient future. It is vital that youth are empowered to actively participate 
and contribute to the development of their societies. I very much look forward to hearing about your ideas and solutions from around the world. Together, we can and we will make a difference for a sustainable world. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful message. Great. Jen, so what will be happening next? Next, we have an announcement to make. So we are really excited to, of course, see all of the pictures every week with the Climate Action Project. We have teachers who are submitting the progress. It's so cool to see. We have videos, photos, people sharing about their successes. And today, we want to keep that going with a special challenge. Correct. So what we want you to do is submit a picture and we will be sharing the link right now. This is always a little bit of click, click, click. <laughs> <laughs> the link is coming up. Yes. So this is the link where we would like you to submit a picture of. It can be you with your students or maybe you are a student. And this could be like you and your peers or you on yourself watching the show, but also um, taking action for climate. It could be you working with your group on a, on a solution for climate change. It could be you and a group um, brainstorming, having discussions with each other. It could be that you are taking action in some way. All of those pictures you most likely took uh, already during the past weeks. So we want you, you to submit those pictures at this link, bit.ly slash 2022 Climate Action Day. We will drop it in the chat as well. Now, the great thing is that um, we have somebody joining in a few minutes. <laughs> And she will share what you can win with this. But we will come back to this. Yeah. Okay. So we will come back to this. And there's some kind of a challenge. Mm -hmm. There's some kind of something mm -hmm. you can win. There's a giveaway, um, which is relevant as well. And um, we will give this to the 500 people who have been submitting first. I can already see our guest popping up. <laughs> <laughs> I was already a little bit stressed. <laughs> so thank you, Georgina, for that. <laughs> but let's uh, introduce our friend, Georgina. So Georgina um, has been on the show last year as well. And she is an author. Georgina Stevens in the UK. She wrote wonderful books. And she's going to share about one book in particular a little bit more. Hi, Georgina. Hi. Hi. I'm so <laughs> pleased to be with you again. I think this is just such a fantastic program that you run. And I'm thrilled to be invited. Lovely to see you both. That's and everyone great. else. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can share a little bit more about yourself. Of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I'm Georgina. I'm a writer. I have um, I write children's books about environmental issues. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about climate action uh, today, <laughs> if I can get it in. Uh, thank you very much. So smooth. Um, and I've worked in sustainability and on environmental issues for about 22 years now. I know I look too young, but maybe that's what's kept me young. You know, the passion for, for what I do. I think I have the best job in the world. Um, I grew up on a farm and I was immediately transfixed by this incredible planet that we live on. And I knew that I wanted to do everything I could to understand it and uh, to work in it and to preserve it and to preserve all the amazing creatures I saw around me on that farm. So I was really lucky. And, and from there, I worked as an environmental consultant out in China for a while. And, and also, um, and then started working for WWF, learned so much more about animals. Um, 
and then from there work with lots of companies helping them understand what they could do to to make positive change to this planet and then when i had my son i decided i the world needed more books children needed more better books on on the environment and what we can all do and having always been a writer i just thought i think i can probably do that <laughs> And then I went straight into a publishers and just said, you don't have enough children's books that are good enough on climate change. I'll write you one, expecting them to just say, OK, <laughs> and they let me. And now I've, I've done a few. So that's me in a nutshell. Thank you for asking. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. So Georgina wrote this wonderful book, this most wonderful book. And I think we all learned throughout the past weeks that shipping those books by <laughs> wouldn't be a good idea right so they're, they're so them... heavy they're so big sorry i'm struggling to get it in frame they're huge yeah. they're sort of the size of your whole chest so no it's not a good idea to ship them so yeah. Kern and i have decided we'd love to give away 500 e-copies of this beautiful book and um, I've made the publisher work really hard to make the e-copy look really good and to make it really user-friendly in uh, a particular app so I hope you'll really enjoy it even though it's an e-copy. Tim? Yeah and shall I say more? Yeah. <laughs> shall I say more? <laughs> I can talk for ages, but you need to monitor this. Um, I'm going to sit here so you can see the little bit. <laughs> That's better, isn't it? Throw that beautiful cover off. So we've come up with an idea. And shall I talk through the idea? We would like to give away 500 copies of this lovely book um, to uh, the first 500 of you amazing people that would like to... Um, draw a picture for us and not just draw, but conjure up a picture for us of how you would like to see the world in 2030, not very long away. Um, we want to see your visions for how beautiful this world could be. And we want to see how you think we can get there as well. So um, Cohen and Jennifer are gonna say, um, share a document with you which you can include that picture in you might want to draw something you might have a picture uh, that you found online that you would like to share um, and we would like to see those because what the world needs now is inspiration on how we can make change and the way we get there is we share our visions for what can be done so if you would like to share those with us the 500 of you that do so will receive an e-copy of this book and if you also want to share on twitter because don't we all know that Twitter needs the more, more positive energy and more solutions from young people like you and your incredible teachers? So that's what we would like. And I, um, I can't wait to see your pictures and ideas and your, you know, your vision for how we can make this world a beautiful place. That's great. So before you're getting nervous, um, it could be a picture of you taking action, Finding a solution, uh, making a drawing, because we have all ages. It could be you watching this event right now. So um, please submit it in this link at the bottom. And you will be receiving Georgina's great book, ebook. Not going to ship. That would be a very bad idea with all of the carbon. That's what we try to avoid. And so many trees. So... <laughs> Georgina, because you've been a bit late, we will ask you to come back. I'd love to come okay. back. <laughs> so come we'll back save you a, a seat. in a few moments uh, with a guest. So yes. that's your challenge, okay? Yeah. <laughs> See you then. We'll Thank you for having soon. me. Thank, Thank you, you so Georgina. Much. And we'll keep sharing this link all day long so you'll have many opportunities to get that photo ready to submit for our awesome challenge to have the opportunity to receive your very own ebook of Georgina's lovely book, Climate Action. Thanks, Georgina. Bye for now. See you shortly. See in a little bit. Okay, that's great. So um, we have a while to go. We will be online for a few hours. And I must say, we have come to my favorite moments already. 
because we've been doing this for um, a few years now, since 2020, that we invited a very special person who will ask some questions to some young, very inspiring people. And we have been doing a few webinars this year, and there was one question which is coming back, and it's clearly coming from young people, from students, and they really wonder what they can do. And this is not just like going to school by bike. This is like, how can I have a big influence on my environment, basically? What can I do? And how to talk with people who don't really believe in, in uh, climate change? How to do that in my uh, circumstances? So we're re we are really, really, really excited to have a few speakers today. And those include the princess, Princess Esmeralda of Belgium. Let me hide this banner. Um, but also with two young people who will be introduced by the princess, which are Remy Zahiga from uh, the Republic of Congo and Benjamin van Bunderen Robrechts from Belgium. And I'm able to announce that name in a good way. Benjamin, because <laughs> we're from the same country. Um, so, Esmeralda, Princess, Madam, great to see you. How are you? I'm very well, and I have to say it's one of my favorite time of the year also to be on your program. That's I'm wonderful. always so inspired by all the young people, by the teachers, and all what you do. That's great. So um, I think before we start with the panel, the small panel, it would be great to hear and so that everyone knows what you are doing as well, because you're an activist and a journalist as well, and you're doing great things. And we would love to hear a bit more about those. So can you share a bit about your work, please? So I have been working on conservation for many, many years and also on fighting the climate crisis and particularly um, trying to support indigenous communities because, as you know, they are on the forefront of the battle against the climate crisis, against the loss of biodiversity. And recently I have been to Brazil, in the Amazon, where I have never been, and just to see the situation, not only of biodiversity, which is in a catastrophic loss, you know that we have lost 13% of the Amazon rainforest. And scientists tell us that when we will reach 25%, then it will be really a tipping point and the forest will not absorb carbon anymore, will become a savanna and has an enormous impact on the climate of the whole world. So 13%, you would say, yeah, we still have time. Not really, because some part of the forest on the east part have already lost 31%. So it could go much faster. And I have been seeing the impact on the communities, obviously, that live with the natural resources and are the best guardians. So I would say two things. We, we really need, first of all, to be really fighting with them in collaboration, because, for example, the WWF report has shown that all the lands administrated by indigenous communities are in perfect uh, ecological state. So it's a proof. We need much more demarcated land, which means protected land for the indigenous people. We need to fight with them. We need to obviously uh, uh, ask them when there's a project of conservation, they must be part of it. That's one point. The other point, which is very important, I think, is to try to make ecocide an international crime at the criminal court. Mm -hmm. There's a big campaign uh, from the organization Stop Ecocide International to make that as a fifth crime against peace. And when you see that we are losing our ecosystem, which is our life support system, I think it's important to make it a crime and to see the effects on the local communities which are poisoned, which are killed, many, many problems. So I think those two things are very important. And uh, you said before, young people are asking what to do. Greta said 
we need a billion activists. And it's true. Not only in the street, not everybody can go in the street, but just talking, uh, getting informed, trying to reach as many people as possible. That's what I would like to say and see. That's a wonderful message. Thank you so much. So let's bring in our young uh, activists. Hi, Benjamin. Hi. And Hi. hopefully we can see uh, Remy as well. Um, he's trying to fix his webcam, but I hope we can hear him. Thank you so much. So, Esmeralda, the floor is yours. So, I don't know if Remy can hear us. Okay, in the meantime, my first question will be then for... Yes, yes, ah, yes, there. I can. Yes. Okay. Mm. So, Remy, because I just talked about the Amazon and the very difficult situation of the communities and the forests, I would like to ask you, because you are an activist for the Congo Basin Forest, what is the situation there? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Princess Esmeralda, for this question. It is really a great pleasure for me uh, to take part uh, for this uh, discussion. As you know, uh, I am Roy Mizaiga from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I am a climate activist, but also a, a young person raising awareness to protect the Congo Basin Forest, which is the world's well second lungs, and also uh, raising awareness about the, the promotion of the indigenous people rights. Yeah, as you know, uh, I have been following your 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 thought about uh, the, the, the destruction of the Amazon. What I can see, uh, it is the same problem that is happening in Congo. As the Congo Basin Forest, it has a lot of minerals. And as you know, right now, the world is, is going for minerals, new technologies. So enterprises, corporations from developed countries are coming just for minerals, as you know. So they are searching for minerals and uh, searching for minerals, uh, it destroy also the forest, but also yeah, uh, searching for wood, cutting wood in the forest because uh, wood it is it has been been like uh, gold, exporting good, uh, exporting wood in developed countries, and also yeah, climate change. Climate change is also affecting the forest. Uh, the forest is uh, is is losing the ability uh, to act directly as carbon sink. Because uh, in 2018, I, I read a report from the University of Maryland uh, showing that if we don't do anything now, the Congo Basin Forest will be gone by 2000. So as a young person and uh, living the destruction of the forest right now, I am trying my best to show the international community, our leaders at the national, at the international level, and also uh, at the local level, how this forest, it is very interesting for us to, to keep it, to protect it, because it is playing a huge role for the mitigating the climate crisis. And uh, it is something very hard because the world is looking for minerals is looking for everything for the development and also excluding the, the the local communities in every process because as you know right now everyone is struggling to go to cop to cop 27 to bring the voice of the local communities unfortunately we as the young people as young person from the global south we as young people most affected by climate crisis we are not getting such opportunities uh, to be uh, in those conferences so that our voices can be heard. So it is a great pleasure for me uh, to take this opportunity and to bring my voice here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Remy. And I want to ask now Ben, who is an activist from the North, and uh, why you became a climate activist. Um, so hi, thanks for having me on. Um, I think I've been an activist for like four years, but... Um, Last in the summer of 21, a good friend of mine, Rosa, died in the in the floods here in Belgium caused by climate change. We were at a climate camp, and with all climate activists talking about how we are going to 
changed the world for the better. And um, it was raining very hard and there was a small stream that ran the stream next to our building. And um, I don't know how it happened, but it was raining so much that the water level was rising. And then in a matter of seconds, Rosa was taken by the water and dragged with it. I, I ran next to her and I jumped into the water. But um, I could really feel the power of climate change around me. Like you can feel the anger of, of the climate. And luckily I was able to get out of the stream because like it, it turned into a monster. And I was hit by something against my arm and I was able to, to, to get out, but Rosa couldn't and she was found three days later, seven kilometers further down the stream against the fence of a farmer. So it really shows that the climate crisis is here. It's in Belgium, it's in the global south, it's everywhere. And we need to do everything we can to fight against it. Thank you for this, Benjamin. It's very, very painful story, but I know you want to make the link with the global south that has been experiencing that kind of situation for many years now. So what would you say to the young people? What can we all do uh, young and old to to support this fight i think we should all like join the fight and like any action now like it doesn't matter how small it is has a big impact we all need to fight we need to we need to learn about the climate and talk about it to as many people as possible to show everyone that we really need to act because otherwise we won't have a future anymore so I really think we should we should all do whatever we can to fight for the climate, to fight for all the climate victims, and to make sure that they're like that we stop it now because otherwise countless more will die. Remy, around the world we know that every week there are almost four environmental defenders killed, and uh, the majority indigenous people. You yourself uh, have been threatened. What can we do uh, on this uh, on this matter? Yeah, as you know, uh, especially in the global south, uh, freedom exp of expression it is really very hard. When you express yourself about what is happening, about the truth, so you look like you are uh, an enemy for the, the the authorities and those who are destroying. So I think the best uh, the best thing is also uh, to support young people, activists from everywhere around the world that uh, are in, uh, in difficulty about securities, but also trying to connect them with NGOs that helps uh, in, in time of uh, violation of their rights, you know. So my message also to young people and other people around the world, it is also uh, to tell them to join the fight, as Benjamin said, we need to work together. We need to unite together so that we we make a very strong, uh, a very strong movement, a very strong network, so that we ask for the climate action now and also make polluters pay. We need accountability because we, as countries in the global south, we are uh, we are we are contributing very less to the climate uh, to the climate crisis. We need also a support uh, to our community, support to our, our country so that we move forward. Uh, last time, the, the, my country, Congo, launched the, 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 the ocean of global, uh, the ocean of block of oil. And, you know, uh, some of these blocks are located in protected areas, you know. So what they said, yeah, we need money. We can't continue keeping resources in the ground while there is poverty, you know. So I think it is also time for uh, countries in the global north to support those in the, in the global south so that uh, they keep the environment. Because if they don't get money, our leaders will run uh, to, to destroy the environment. And they say, yeah, we need money, you know, something people are living in poverty, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for this. Uh... There is a big responsibility from, uh, from the north, from the western country on this. And hopefully at the COP27, we will put the emphasis on loss and damages and, uh, and help for the global south. 
Well, thank you to both of you. Uh, you are very inspiring. And uh, I hope you can continue your fight. And I hope uh, many people will support you. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure to join this. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your movie star moving stories. Um, thank you so much, Princess Esmeralda, uh, to you as well for sharing your um, perspective and what you shared about the Amazon is, is new to me. I didn't realize that. And I try to keep track of the news. Um, there's so much happening and I'm so grateful for you sharing about this as well. And hopefully you. see you next year as well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, Jen. Hi, Kuhn. That was really remarkable and wonderful yeah. to hear from Princess Esmeralda. Again, I have such fond memories of marching with you in New York City with Greta Thunberg and the Fridays for the Future students, just blocks and blocks and blocks of young people leading the way. And then in the end, you kind of scurried off to go to the Indigenous People's March to meet Princess Esmeralda, which was just such a, a, a memorable uh, time, I think, for all of us as this was really getting moving. But to hear from Benjamin and Remy and, and their work and their stories, I, I feel um, very inspired too. Thank you so much. Yes. Today, we will be having a lot of students joining us as well. And uh, we would like to show the first group of students sharing their message and their findings. And this is a, a school from Taiwan. I love I love their their intention and their enthusiasm for this message and this movement to take action for a planet. So thank you to our friends in Taiwan and to Ronnie for bringing together all of those students to share today. Okay. So I think we're ready for our next yes. interview. I we think... get to bring back our good friend, <laughs> Georgina, author of Climate Action. If you missed earlier, we have a really cool giveaway going, so we'll share a little bit about that. But Georgina has offered to bring on her friend, Maya Mailer, from Our Kids Climate, co-director. And they're going to have a little talk and share about some of their inspiration in their work today. So Georgina and Maya, I will turn it over to you both. Thank you for being here with us. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, and thank you, Maya, for being with us. Um, it's wonderful to have you. Um, and last year, as Jennifer mentioned, I got to interview Elizabeth Wathuti, who was just such an inspiring voice um, at COP26. And he went in and addressed all of the world leaders. And 
um, she was such an inspiration and, and actually almost brought me to tears in the in the interview that we did. No pressure, Maya. But um, but that's also why it's so wonderful to have you because you are one of the most inspiring campaigners that I've ever met in my long career as a as a um, in in the environmental movement and um, one of the strongest voices out there, certainly in the UK, making yourself heard. And as Jennifer said, a quick intro, and we'd love to hear more from you, but I just want to give a quick overview of what I know of you. Um, you are co-founder of Mothers Rise Up, who are an incredibly creative organisation of mothers and parents really drawing attention to the climate crisis in the most outlandishly creative and um, very brave, confident way. And it's a really refreshing um, and stand out a position I think Mothers Rise Up have. A lot of people know of you. And some of you who are listening today may have seen um, Maya and the Mothers Rise Up team. They have some incredible props that they take out on the streets, including an enormous pushchair and some beautiful phoenixes, uh, which are going to be out um, later this weekend. Uh, over here in the UK. Sorry if I'm, I hope I'm not giving too much away. But Amaya is also um, a co-director at Our Kids Climate, who she's going to tell us more about. Um, and just on Mothers Rise Up quickly, very specifically targeting the insurance industry and calling them out in these very creative ways, which has really um, surprised, surprised a lot of the insurance industries, I think, a lot of the companies. And um, and that's what has helped it to stand out. So um, Maya, tell us more about yourself. I know not only these two wonderful organizations at the moment you're really um, heading up, you've had a long career in, um, in across the world. Tell us more about it. And if you could tell us how it has brought you to become a, an environmental campaigner now. Sure. Hi, Georgina and, and everyone listening. It's just amazing to know that there are thousands of students and teachers listening from around the world. It's a real honor to be here. Um, so I'm Maya and I live in London in the UK and I have three kids who are 11, 9 and 4. And like Georgina said, so I started out as an aid worker working with um, an international NGO, Oxfam. And I was with Oxfam in South Sudan and in Kenya and then I was traveling a lot to the Middle East after the Syria war started and there was the huge refugee crisis. Um, and in all of my travels, I would speak to farmers who talked about extreme weather and unpredictable weather and how it was making it even more difficult for them and their families. But to be honest, at that time, so that was going back now about 10 years ago, I didn't really make the connection with the changing climate. I was very much focused on the human rights abuses that people were facing um, and conflict situations. And it was really only when the youth strikes happened and my own children started coming back from school asking me questions, you know, mummy, is the world gonna get so hot that it's going to explode? That I started to make the connections in my mind and I really realized that everything I'd worked for up until then, trying to progress human rights, keep women and girls safe in, in conflict situations was completely connected up with climate. And it was a question of justice. And that's really, that was the beginning of my journey. And then I got connected with these incredible mothers in the UK, completely by chance. And we formed um, Mothers Rise Up. And as you mentioned, Georgina, that's all about creative street action to call out some of the big enablers of the fossil fuel industry, like the insurance companies. And, and maybe we can get into a bit of that later. And then at the same time, I started working with Our Kids Climate, which is a wonderful global network that brings together parent groups and intergenerational groups from all around the world. There are many groups in Africa, across the continent of Africa, Asia, um, North America, South America, who are all working around this idea of care for the next generation and looking at family-friendly climate actions. It's a very diverse network. 
and we're taking a small delegation of mother activists um, to COP next week. And I feel really privileged and, and honored to be part of that delegation. So that, that's all kicking off next week in, in Sharm El Sheikh. That's fantastic. Can you tell us more? Can you tell us more about the how you're going to approach COP? Um, from what I understand, you've got meetings with certain um, delegates at the conference, but you're also going to be campaigning outside. I'd love to hear more about how you see those two different um, actions interacting, because I think I think that's pro probably the, the the secret to your success and the cut through. Tell us yeah. more. So at COP27 this year, we, we, our Kids Climate and our sister network, Parents of Future Global, are bringing a small delegation of mothers from South Africa, Botswana, Ghana, India, Brazil, and then myself from the UK. And yeah. these are all wonderful, accomplished um, grassroots activists. And we are going with a very clear message to put kids first. So if you if you look at the hashtag kids first, you'll start to see some of our, our messaging. Um, I mean, we all know this, that children are bearing the brunt of a climate crisis that they didn't create. And that to me is just a grave, grave injustice. And as we've heard already, children in the global south um, are really on the front lines, even though those countries have done the least to contribute to carbon pollution and UNICEF says that a billion children are at risk of climate disasters. And yet there's been very little discussion of this, of the intergenerational um, impact of climate and the impact on children at the COP. So we are working with many organizations to really get that message across about how children are being affected by the climate in many different ways, and also encouraging and urging leaders to step up and from our perspective that means a rapid transition away from dangerous fossil fuels to life-saving clean energy that will also clean up the air that children are breathing um, and as I think other speakers have mentioned richer countries need to deliver on these year-long promise of climate finance so that countries in the global south can make that transition and can also deal with the consequences of, of the climate crisis. So we'll be speaking on panels, um, but we're also taking that more outsider approach. We've got a beautiful film that I hope to be able to share with this network and um, that will be ready in the next day or two that captures the voices of children from around the world, from Mexico to Tanzania to the Pacific Islands and some of the youngest children whose voice is often not heard enough, even though it's the it's that generation that is bearing the brunt and will bear the brunt of, of, of climate breakdown. So we have our beautiful Kids First video. We have postcards. You can see some of them behind me that are illustrated by different children's authors that we'll be handing out um, at the COP and handing them to delegates. And then, as you say, because I think our view is that you need to be inside the spaces, but you also have to be outside. So there will also be protests happening um, in London and around the world where we'll be deliver delivering our kids first message out on the streets in creative and beautiful ways. Wow, that is comprehensive. Um, how can anyone help? Can we retweet and um, tweet about our uh, kids first is that the message that you would like to get across yes please so look at the kids first hashtag look at our kids climate and parents of future global um, and in a day or two um, we're launching the film on the 10th of november which is youth day at the cop we would love people to share that film and amplify the call that i think all of us can 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 agree on that world leaders need to step up for the next generation and those yet to be born and, and put kids first. So we've just had a reminder that we've only got a minute left. I'm oh, mortified. Okay. I know, I thought we had so much more time. I wanted to ask you really urgently, you're, what do you suggest people do? So young and old, um, everyone's being asked this question, what's your suggestion for one thing to do now? You know what, I don't think there's a silver bullet. I think anything is better than nothing because it, will, it needs everything. 
but I would encourage people to get active. Join a climate group because we really need that systems change. So yeah. join the group that speaks to you so that we can stop the fossil fuel enablers from threatening our precious shared home and our children and their future. It's so important to stand up and be counted in whatever way we can, isn't it? And I think I've joined you on one of your incredible like, um, campaigns last year at COP. And the other thing, the thing that I found there that was so nourishing was sisterhood and um, being in community with other people who understand and feel the same. So I would absolutely echo what you said and encourage people to go join stand up be heard and do what they can do not everyone can get on the streets but if you can do if you can't there's a myriad of other things that you can do thank you so much you um, Maya. Me. that's fascinating it's just wonderful to hear from you and yeah thanks for being with us thank you so much and um, best of luck with the rest of the day thank you Maya thank you Georgina we appreciate you both being with us and we will see you all very soon see you later Okay, so we are cruising right along with our day. I know we have a very exciting session coming up. We are able to see in the backstage, we have our special guests. We have classrooms from around the world. They'll be joining in just a few minutes. But before we head to that session, we'd love to hear from some of our Climate Action Project classrooms. 2022 is an exciting year for Qatar because of the FIFA World Cup and sustainability. Do you feel Qatar is being sustainable in the 2022 World Cup? Yeah, I feel like they're trying to be more sustainable for this year. More people can be more comfortable and breathe better. Do you think Qatar is on the right track for sustainability? Yes, because, for example, for the World Cup, they emphasize public transport and using the hair card. Well, they also uh, made the stadium sustainable by making them like uh, foldable and removing chairs, like Stadium 994 and uh, Albate Stadium. Do you think Qatar is on the right path to sustainability? Uh, it certainly looks like it is a priority for them and, uh, and that they're on the right path, yes. How so? Well, I think that they're in line with the UN sustainability goal. They're looking at green energy, they're looking at climate change um, technologies. We've got a long way to go, but I think that they are certainly committing uh, their time and energy to it. Now that Qatar is a step closer to sustainability, we can't wait to welcome you. Bye bye! Bye bye! Bye bye! Bye bye! That was fantastic. So, we have, uh, I think, are we going to do one more video here, Kuhn? Yes. One more. One from Georgia and the U.S. Amazing. Hi. Hi. Hi, we're Johns Creek High School from Georgia, USA. We're working on bringing awareness to recycling and planting environmentally friendly plants with TikToks to bring awareness to what's going on in the world. Recycling is a big problem in the world, especially in GACHS. One way we can solve this problem is by setting up recycling bins around the school. Specifically adding recycling bins to the lunchroom because there's only trash cans. We need to separate the food in the trays, so we need a recycling bin and a trash can. Keeping the food in the trays separate can help benefit the community and environment. Save our community and help our school. Hey, you should recycle. Don't put things in there. Go recycle and plant some new native trees. We want to give thanks to our teachers and school for supporting us in building our project. In friendship and solidarity, we now pass this message of action on to you, our global friends. Bye, everyone. Bye. And then we have a special group. We promised some uh, entertainment today, but with a message as well. Jen? We are happy to welcome our dance team from Penn State to share a beautiful folk dance from Indigenous Farming Practices. So here they are. Hello, my name is Sorali Parikh, and I've been an intern with the Global TJEC Network since March 2020. The Global TJEC Network provides professional development opportunities for ag educators and their students. My current focus as an ag G10 intern is to make a repository of climate change education resources for our educators. 
Additionally, as a Penn State student, I'm on a dance team called Sher Bhangra. Sher Bhangra is a competitive dance team that showcases a folk dance from the region of Punjab called Bhangra. Bhangra uses props as a part of the folk dance. All of these props historically had a practical use in Punjabi agriculture. The first prop is a sup. A sup is typically a wooden clapper. When it is closed hard, it makes a loud sound resembling thunder. Farmers used it back in the day to scare away crows and field rodents when they were eating their crops. Another prop we use is called a kunda. Traditionally, the kunda is a five-foot wooden stick with a hook at the end of it, like a cane. Nowadays, both ends of the stick have colored flags for aesthetics. Historically, the kunda was used as a cane or walking stick for farmers who spent long hours walking and farming all day. It was also used to whack down crops like a sickle. A dance move related to the celebration of agriculture is the fasla. The fasla is where dancers sway their, their arms side to side to resemble the swaying of crops in the wind. We hope you enjoy the short performance we have put together and can recognize the agricultural references in the dance. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Amazing. How cool was that? I loved it. Here we can see, we're able to see on our side into the backstage. So I see kids dancing and they're ready to go. So I think we're set for our next se session, Kuhn. I am energized, ready to Me go. Me too. This is going to be excited. We really loved our first chat and next chats with our friends at NASA, uh, Rick and Bob. This time they brought friends guests and we will be having a lot of students with questions as well so rick and bob hello and how are Ave you all? and mr dj creamer welcome thank you good to be here so uh, i guess we can go ahead and get started um i'll do i'm rick davis with nasa headquarters in the mars exploration program and we're delighted to be here Bob Cullum, can you quickly introduce yourself and then we'll go to Ave and TJ. Sure. I'm Bob. I work at the NASA headquarters as well on the Mars Exploration Program. Ave. Yes, I'm Ave Kluge. I'm, uh, I'm, this, I'm a senior technical advisor to the office of the administrator. Thank you. TJ, welcome. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. Uh, I've been with NASA since 95 and I was able to fly to the space station and. Uh, 
And TJ's got a tremendous experience in space, so we're thrilled to have him here with us today. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and call up the slides, and we have some slides, and then we're going to open it up to question and answers from the students that are tied in. So, Bob, if you could, please. Bring it up now. Everyone seeing those? Yep. Okay, great. So let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, Mars is a really cool exploration area for exploration, Ex incredibly exciting and incredibly challenging, much like climate change. Um, and the, that there are a couple of key points here. You got to be really careful that you don't um, assume something's easy when it's hard. And this is a perfect example of it. Here's a, a, a desert in Jordan and then the Gale Crater in Mars. And they look very, very similar, except they're dramatically different. Mars, for example, uh, it, 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 on a warm day down at the equator, it gets up to freezing, and then it can drop 120 degrees at night. Uh, the pressure is almost like being in the vacuum of space, it's, uh, but it does have an atmosphere, sort of like being um, up at 35,000 meters or 120,000 feet, if I'm doing my conversions right. Um, and it is a very strange place. However, and it's not like being on that desert in Jordan. Actually, Bob, let's go to the next slide. It's more like hiking up K2 in the Himalayas or Mount Everest, where, um, but probably times a thousand, if not 10,000 in terms of how dangerous and hard it is to do. But human beings are remarkably adaptive and learn, and learn quickly. And so by doing things step by step and easing your way into it, we actually learn to do these things. And, and I, I think all of us feel that we'll figure out how to handle the major challenges facing our amazing planet. Next slide. In this pitch, we're going to give you a little bit of an overview of all the pieces you need to have to go to Mars to give you a sense of the challenge. And then we're going to uh, drill down in and talk about one piece of it um, so that you can get a sense of it. And it's great to have TJ here because he's been incredibly involved with the space station, which we'll talk about here in a moment. And then we're going to talk about why going to into space and going to Mars in particular is important for helping us take care of this amazing planet. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, sorry. Go back, Bob. I'm sorry. So a quick introduction. These are all the pieces that you need to have to send humans all the way out to our second planet. You need to have a lot of rockets, which is what you're seeing in that upper left hand corner to push uh, all the pieces and all the food and everything the humans are going to need when they're sitting on the surface of Mars. You need to be able, to, when you come back from Mars, you're going at incredibly fast speeds and you need to be able to re-enter the atmosphere. Then you need to, uh, um, when you go out to Mars, it can take anywhere from six to nine months to get out there. And then you're parked in the Martian system for 500 days before you can come home and it's going to take another six to nine months. So all together, by the time you leave home to the time you get back, it's about three years before you'll see your family again. Um, and then you need, once you get down to the surface, you have suits, you have habitats, you have pressurized rovers and all these pieces that we're showing here. And we're going to drill in just for a little bit on that Mars transfer vehicle or the mothership. But all of these are challenges that are really exciting. Um, and the good news is we're doing a lot of them. But the key point on anything like this is to do it step by step so that you can actually figure out how to do it. A lot of times the path changes, but you get smarter as you take those steps. Next slide, please. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the mother, the Mars transfer vehicle, the mo Mars mothership. Um, what's amazing is that we actually have a lot of experience in space right now. So if three people stay in space one day, we call that three human days in space. And what's fascinating is that across the human species right now, we are in excess of 61,000 human days in space, which is really incredible. Now, one little alarming thing, but we'll learn how to do that, too, is that the longest time spent by one person is 438 days. And that is literally almost one third of the total time someone could spend in space on the way out to Mars. And we probably need to get uh, smarter about how that impacts people. Um, but the good news is we have a lot of time and space. I like to point out that we have zero time on the surface of Mars. And so we need to be mindful of that and, and step our way into that as we learn to live on a second planet. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the good news that the, the, this, these are pictures from the space station, and I, I will just quickly overview them. But the bottom line is 
we really know how to keep people busy and doing amazing science and um, and essentially building up the space station. And that's what you're seeing in those left hand uh, pictures. You can spend we actually can't, used to run our crews ragged uh, scheduling them. And we've actually had to learn to dial back a little bit about that. Uh, we have to keep them in shape because when they're in zero gravity, uh, your your muscles start atrophying because you're not using them and uh, your bones start decalcifying and there are a number of other issues. Um, and then it's an extremely stressful environment. And, uh, you know, you also have to have their downtime. And here's a, I love this picture. There are windows on the space station. You're going to need windows on ships going to Mars. But it's not just for looking out the window and having coffee, which she's having right here. Um, but it's also, you can use those to when something's approaching you, you can grab it and it helps to actually look out the windows and do that. And we found them to be incredibly uh, useful. Um, you'll also, uh, if you want people, you know, this vehicle could get hit by a piece of space junk. And so people need to be on their game. It's an extremely hostile environment. Um, and so you want to give people their downtime. And I often like to say that if, uh, if you want to make people work really productively in these hostile environments, you need to have in your mind that they need a lot of the pleasures that they have on earth or the, the things they're used to for their downtime, such as drinking coffee, such as watching movies, such as uh, listening to music. Um, and if we think about all those things, we actually can allow them to have a semblance of a normal life and then be able to handle stresses even better. And TJ, with that, I'll see if you have any comments that you might want to add to that. Well, Rick, you said the right things. Um, the stressful environment is largely because the astronauts want to do really well and to do the, the operations that, that the planning teams have uh, scheduled for us, to be able to do the science that the people have um, been interested in working their lives to get these experiments on, on board, and we want to do it correctly. Um, but similarly, um, you've hit everything that, that you need to in, in, in terms of the day. The exercise, two to two and a half hours uh, per day, is very important for our health, largely for return, because of the space environment causes some bad effects on, on the body. But when I say return, both the planned return, but also perhaps an emergency return to Earth um, from space station, we want to be fit enough to do the recovery once we land. And then the final thing that I'll, I'll mention, just to highlight, because Rick uh, spent some time on it, the um, the camaraderie and, and the ability to look on the, an absolutely beautiful planet um, through the windows it has been very key to our operations. I had the pleasure of, of being up there when we installed uh, the cupola that you see in the right-hand picture. And, uh, and the bottom line is it is an absolutely uh, heart-stopping, breathtaking, mind-blowing um, vista that you get to see as you look through through those windows. The uh, ability to experience the, the space environment look on, upon the absolute gorgeous scenes that you can see through the windows is a real boon for the uh, the camaraderie on board and the psycho psychological support. That's great, TJ. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll go to the next slide, if we can, please, Bob. So in that picture of the cupola that TJ was just describing and how mind-blowing it is, there's actually going to be another view as we head out to Mars that is where you're going to be somewhere along the mission where the Earth are, is in that lower left-hand corner and it's a tiny blue dot and you have to know where to look. And our second planet is going to be a tiny uh, orangish reddish dot that you have to know where to look and you're in a black vast sea of space. Now there would be amazing star fields but the impact on the human being in that environment is not even possible to imagine quite yet. And I actually would like to see, uh, TJ, I'll bounce it back to you to see if you have any immediate thoughts on that. Um, I, I think that the thing that strikes us when we think about doing these kind of operations as we go farther and farther away is just how incredibly vast the distances are. And, and that plays into how we do operations. Um, it takes a really, really long time to get anywhere farther away from Earth. And why is that important? I'll just give you two reasons off the top of my head. The communications between the control centers and the ground people and the crews on orbit or uh, in transit become, the delays become longer and longer, of course, as, as the distances grow to the point where it can actually affect immediate ac um, actions on board the vehicle or on in, at the encampment when you're on the surface. 
the distance plays a factor. The other thing that the distance plays a factor in is the exposure to radiation that the crews will be getting as they go in transit. We, we want to have short trips. Um, so I'm going to springboard on that, Rick, for just a second. Short trips means less radiation exposure. The best short trips would be six months up um, between Earth and Mars and then six months back from Mars to Earth. That's the best, shortest legs we currently can get. So that's a year of travel already. And in order to get those best short trips, the planets have to be aligned at the right time, which means you're going to be on the surface of Mars at least two years. And it's got a thinner atmosphere. You have less protection, even greater radiation exposure. So one of the things that we've got to be able to work on is how to protect the crews as we go farther and farther away with the increased time delays as well, Rick. Okay, great, TJ. And then with that, Bob, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, now we want to briefly talk about how going into space and to Mars in particular, it helps us take better care of the Earth. And we'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, bottom line is we would not even be able to understand how global warming is occurring if we did not have this fleet of satellites. And this is the current fleet that the, only the United States has. The European Space Agency has a similar fleet and many other countries do trying to understand how glaciers are melting, how to understand how water levels are rising. And these, this view of our home planet from space is critical for being able to measure and understand how we are impacting the environment here. Next slide, please. Uh, the second lay is, you know, and it, I'm an engineer, and as we all, most of us are, and on this from NASA. And the point being is, you're taught one thing: do not make decisions based off one data point. And we're often trying to manage this planet with just the data point of this planet by comparing how Earth compares to other planets. We actually have a more thorough understanding of how they evolve and how they respond to climate change and a lot of other factors. And so for Mars is the only other planet in our solar system where we can put a geologist or a climatologist on the surface and really understand what they're doing. The fact of the matter is, is Mars looked like Earth for probably a billion years. And then it diverged and became a essentially a frozen planet. And understanding why that is helps us really understand what the, what the risks are to our planet. Next slide, please. I'm not, uh, Mars also has, um, does not, when you send a mission out to Mars, TJ alluded to some of the challenges, but there's basically so expensive to send anything that you uh, can't be complacent. You have to recycle everything. Even poop and pee becomes a valuable resource that we have to reuse in addition to everything else. Could you do that without going to Mars, learn how to do that kind of recycling? Absolutely. But it, it, when you have a challenge like this, it really forces us to do it better than what we might do otherwise and faster. Avi, do you have anything you want to add to that? You're mute, Avi. No, not this time. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please, Bob. Um, and then the last thing going to Mars does is it changes our perspective and, and, and prompts new thinking. Here's that same view. But what I'd like to show is that when the Apollo missions actually went all the way out to the moon for the first time, when they saw the Earth rising over the horizon, many attribute the awareness that the Earth is as fragile as it is to that perspective. Um, and many attribute the, the beginning of the environmental movement uh, uh, there uh, with that view. And when we are in this other case, we are going to see a different view of our planet that actually I think many of us are convinced will really uh, allow us to better understand our options. And plus, these are multinational efforts. We work together. Um, and that, and we're going to do that all the way out to Mars. It will not happen otherwise. And that understanding that we are doing this together is critical to solving these problems and challenges, just as climate change and dealing with it will be too. Next slide, please. And then Mars is a human effort, just as solving the climate challenges is a human effort. And only through ideas and approaching problems step by step uh, or we, will we solve them? But I, I think all of us uh, dealing with Mars are absolutely possible, convinced that it's possible, but you have to take steps. With that, I'll go and see if anyone has anything else they want to add. Ave, anything else real quickly? No, 
I think you've touched on it. Only, I only add that the yeah, math is very interesting and uh, uh, provides a lot of exciting opportunities and challenges as well. That's Great. awesome. Bob? I, I think uh, what I hope to that you can all take away from this is that Mars is just, it's a really exciting challenge. There's a lot of problems we have to, to face and there's a lot to learn from it. And that's not gonna be a challenge that just scientists or just engineers can overcome. We need all sorts of disciplines to make Mars a, a reality. You know, we need storytellers, we need accountants, we need lawyers, we need, we need policymakers, thank goodness. And so if this is something you want to help with, if, if you're passionate about it, there's a place for you in space exploration. So don't underestimate your ability to contribute. Great. Thanks, Bob. TJ, last word to you before we turn it over to the students. Uh, no, no, so one, one thing you, you mentioned is, is the challenge is getting there. But, it, but let me simply advertise the idea of we have many, many challenges to be able to put people there and to return people safely. And those challenges, those engineering challenges, we end up using back here on Earth as technological advances. Um, one real quick example is you mentioned the recycling of everything. We take our recycler to, to disaster areas on Earth to provide clean water. We're using the same technology to, that, we, that we are employing to solve the challenges for these hard missions like to Mars and return to help our, ourselves here. Yeah, that's great, TJ. Thank you. And now, Cohen, we can go over and turn it over to, and see if the students have any questions. And you guys make it hard for us. Come up with hard questions. Okay, let's bring in the students. Jen, maybe it would be great for you to introduce the groups of students. I would love to. They are <laughs> eager and ready. They are prepared with some questions for the team. So our first group of students <laughs> They are coming to us live from New Jersey, Morris Union Joint Share Commission's Developmental Learning Center Hi. in New Providence, New Jersey. Welcome, Tyler, Giovanni, and Matthew. We'd love to hear your questions for our team from NASA and Mr. Creamer. Oh, hey. Well, hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello, astronaut. How are you doing? We're <laughs> very well, thank you. Hello. Hello. Have you seen an alien? <laughs> no. I, I, <laughs> uh, I have a question too. No, I, I understand your question. Everything that we saw when we were in space, we could identify. So we saw no unidentified flying objects. Um, but no, no aliens. Not yet. <laughs> Can you jump or dance in space? Well, there. I will tell you, it's a little bit difficult to do that because gravity on Earth keeps our feet on the ground and we use the ground to move around. So it's a little bit different when we're floating, but we have had astronauts dancing on space because they can free float and they do their twirls and spins and all that kind of stuff. Jumping, uh, you can jump once, but you don't come back down. <laughs> What other questions, have you guys? Been to other planets? Have we? Have, have I been to other planets? No, have not. I've only been um, into orbit on the space station, and, and the only people who've gone and put feet on another heavenly body are those explorers who went to the moon. We haven't gone farther than that yet. Yeah, and there were twelve of them, and that was almost. It was basically fifty years ago. We're ready to go back there. And we are ready to actually, we're getting ready to start sending human beings all the way out to Mars. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Thank you, friends from New Jersey. And thank you for preparing. Wonderful yes. with your note cards. Awesome questions. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> and now we're going to jump from the United States over to our friends in Jamaica. Whoa. So we are going to go to Jamaica Live. Hello, everyone in Jamaica. Wonderful to see you all. We'd love for you to introduce your school and then share your questions for our friends here from NASA. So go ahead, guys. All right, good morning. Um, my name is Trout Perilajani. And my question is, what is NASA currently doing to contract lobbying from plastic corporations? 
Can, can you say that again? I want to make sure we understand that. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. All right, sorry. So this is the Heinz Simon School, and my name is Chirag Pahilajani. Okay. My question is, what is NASA currently doing to counteract lobbying from large plastic corporations? Ah, uh, well, so, so Ave, do you want to take that one, or I can do it? The question, I didn't hear the last part very well. So basically, how, how is NASA counteracting lobbying from plastic corporations? Uh, Rick, go ahead and I'll, I'll Yeah, so, you know, I would say that uh, we do not interact with large plastic corporations that much, um, but we are very uh, concerned about uh, not just lobbying, but anything that's actually leading to polluting the atmosphere, our planet. Um, and we, there's a lot to worry about in that regard. But, you know, I, I wouldn't say that's, a, that's something we can affect change on that much. Have anything you want to add to that? Yes, and uh, NASA has a process by which we bring in uh, corporations. So we have a fair uh, process whereby uh, companies bid or at least uh, come to us asking to work for us. So we have a process by which we go through. So lobbying does not really uh, play a role uh, in that sense. We look at the technical merits of these companies and what they can provide for us to get to moon, Mars, or wherever we are going in space. So that's how it goes. So lobbying is, is, is not part of it, but we try to make the public hear what we are doing. And I, I think that chart we showed about all the Earth observing missions, everything we learn about the planet from space helps teach us about pollution and about climate change. And you know, we make that data available to the public and where it goes from there is a bit out of our hands, as I said. So some of that data that we're talking about that we make available to public are like, what are the dust um, migrations around the world because the dust affects the weather? What do the crop fields look like? And can, do we need to irrigate in different areas uh, as opposed to the normal areas, because certain areas of the crop fields are under irrigated. We can show data from our observation how to address some of these issues and, and what what weather um, results can happen because of our observations of how the earth is behaving. And I would just maybe add that, you know, having that data is really important for making sure the right policy make, uh, decisions get made. And that's, and TJ just gave a great example of, of the types of data that's really critical to have and to have it consistently. Uh, maybe another question? Thank you for having me on. My name is Chase Francis, and I'd like to mention how cool it is that I'm actually <laughs> on here with astronaut. <laughs> great to have you. My how feasible is it provided large scale support to replace coal energy with nuclear? Uh, so I'll start that and I'm gonna turn it over to Ave. Um, so one of the things that we are looking at is when you're on Mars or the moon, these are really cold bodies and you need a lot of power and it needs to be very compact. And, that, and then when you're um, moving uh, large spacecraft out there where there's a lot of advantages for using uh, very compact nuclear systems. Um, and we're seeing a lot of potential there. And I personally believe that is an example of the type of technology that TJ alluded to, that we will develop in space because we need it to be super light and super efficient um, and that will have dramatic impacts to doing the kinds of things you're talking about in your question. Is there anything you want to add to that? Yes. Uh, uh, as you know, like Rick said, we have extreme conditions in space. So we need, uh, just like here on Earth, we need power to cool the astronauts, to cool the environment where they'll be staying. We need power to be able to drill and uh, if we have to mine, mine and even move around. There are limitations to solar power. So nuclear is one of the options that uh, uh, hopefully will become available. So uh, Rick and I, we've been, even the vehicles that will take us to Mars, we've been trying to develop that, uh, uh, two of them using nuclear uh, proportion so that we will at least not run out of power whilst we are midway or we are on the flooded and don't know what to do. So, so yeah, so that's all I want to add. Thank you. And I, I might add that on Mars, the tilt of the planet's a lot more uh, exaggerated than it is on Earth. 
And so what that means is that in the wintertime, it's dark a lot. So you can't use solar arrays if you're up in those higher latitudes. And so that really forces you to look at nuclear too um, for the surface power to be able to do that. So that's a great question too, thanks. Okay. Wonderful questions from our friends in Jamaica. And they're having a full day event, welcoming cool. their whole community. They're having celebrations around climate action. So we appreciate them taking time to share their questions. So our last school group, we will hop from Jamaica now over to Turkey. Right. And as our friends you guys. in Turkey joining, and they have been right. eagerly waiting, I'll let them introduce their school. And they have two questions okay. for you all on the NASA team. Hi, from Turkey, Yunwale Campus College. We are very excited. <laughs> and fly with a Clippers students. We we'll have a question for you. First of all, we would like to start with Ahmed. Please, Ahmed. Hi, my name is Ahmed. I'm nine years old. I'm studying at Yeni Mahalle Campus College, three class. I want to be a computer engineer in the future. Why not, NASA? I want to ask my question to my astronauts. What are the what are the top ways space exploration and scientific studies can help us find solutions to climate change? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for asking that question and very thoughtful it is. Um, I, the first thing, because of your interest in the computer science world um, and your question regarding climate change, I will say that one of the things that we find very complex in, in our analysis is how to handle the chaotic system called the climate, the weather predictions. And the better and better we are able to, to model how our uh, local regional climate um, weather systems are affected, as well as the, the global climate, the better we'll be able to understand where the problems will be and the possible solutions that we can can implement what can we change and what would the outcome be from those modeling systems rick did you have any other ads to that yeah the only thing i would add to that is that mars also has a climate and so understanding how that climate works it will help us make better models of how this planet works because we get more it, you have more data points and that's really critical for us uh bringing solutions to the table ave or bobby anything you want to add Yes, I would, have to, I would like to add that since you are interested in computer engineering, <laughs> AI is coming about artificial intelligence. So uh, definitely we have a lot of uh, space junk. Uh, I mean, a lot of uh, defunct starlight in space that are re-entering the atmosphere. And when they re-enter, they burn out. And when they burn out, they create other climate uh, issues. So I think your your background, uh, your your aspirations, and that seem to be in place. So like they said, you could model things that will let us. We have them now that could help us track uh, the space uh, 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 objects. However, with advanced uh, computing, we might be able to figure out how even to deflect them or figure out what to do so that they don't come back to Earth. We send them to somewhere else. So, so I would like to add that, and I would like you to continue pursuing your dreams very well. And maybe we can go to the last question, Jen, before we all need to move on. It'd be wonderful. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vitsud Buyuk. I'm 16 years old. I'm at 11th grade at Campus College. Uh, one of my biggest dreams is studying chemistry at the United States. Climate change is one of the biggest issues we're fighting these days. And if we remain um, indifferent to this issue, it will continue to be a little problem for us. Uh, I want to find solutions for that, and I have a question about it. Uh, the Earth, oceans, and atmosphere have started to warm up as a result of human activities in the last 100 years, and the release of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, we can say that the clearest indicator of global warming is the increase in world temperature. Accordingly, uh, the melting of glaciers and the rise of sea level are expected to naturally change the climate. Uh, do you think we can say that global warming threatens the world? So I'll start and then see if anyone has anything to add. Um, first of all, you have to measure it. And so that's what those all those satellites that we showed you are doing. They're giving us incredible insight that you know, 50 years ago was simply not possible. And it's not just the United States doing it. It's 
countries all across this planet are doing that. And that is giving it tremendous insight. And then I want to drive, go back to this idea of comparing Mars to Earth, because Mars actually has glaciers too. It had whole oceans and it has gl glaciers and uh, they froze up over time. So it went the opposite direction. Um, and they're just covered with dust. You can think of it that simply, but there are literally whole oceans and glaciers at Mars. And understanding by like doing coring that we do in Antarctica and understanding what happened to that climate will be really helpful for understanding how our climate is and our glaciers and our oceans are responding um, in terms of getting more data points. And so it's, it's a more data to help us really understand how s uh, planets in a solar system work. And I'll see if anyone else on the team has any other uh, comments on that. Let's, uh, TJ, let's start with you, see if you have anything to add. Oh, no, sir, I think, you, I think you covered it perfectly. Um, the, the similarities that, are, that exist from Mars as a planet in comparison to ours um, are, are extensive to including you know, that volcanoes as well as volcanoes that dwarf anything that we have here on Earth uh, as well as canyons that make the Grand Canyon in the United States look small. We, and, we, and we can learn a lot about what happened to Mars and how we can use that end state of Mars to, in the process of how Mars got there to be able to help model what we're doing here on Earth. Rick, I think you covered it really well and the similarities uh, make Mars very attractive. Okay, cool. Bob, anything? I, I'll just say, if I've learned anything working in space exploration, mm. it's that we can figure out a solution to the problem. So as, <laughs> as big as a threat, you know, human-driven climate change might be for our way of life, we've got a lot of brilliant people out there and a lot of talented and creative people who, you know, are ready to face it. So I, I'm optimistic about the future. Okay, cool. I have a last word to you, man. I want to add that. The young lady studying chemistry could probably help us one day solve some of this problem. So keep the <laughs> studies up. Thank and you. your English is great. <laughs> Remarkable. Well, thank you to our friends in Turkey, Jamaica, New Jersey within the United States. We are honored to have you, your questions and your brilliance as part of our session here with this awesome NASA team. And on behalf of me and Kuhn, I wanna thank you all for always saying yes. Every time <laughs> we send you a message, I know there's a lot going on. We're seeing what you're doing on this planet and beyond, of course, and you never fail to accept our invitation. So to all of you and now to TJ, a new member of our team, first time on for Climate Action Day. Thank you to you for saying yes as well. And Ave, Bob and Rick, welcome back. And we hope to see you well, all. Thank you all year. so much too. You're doing amazing work. So thank you. Thank you so much. All right, we take appreciate care. you all. Talk to you all soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks for having me. me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so next we will be having a special guest, but also somebody from our own team who will be running an interview. Next, we will be having Alan and Hila. And I know, Alan, that you requested us to play a small video. So let's start with that, and then we shift to Hila and the interview. Thank you. Great. Thanks.
Hello, Ellen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, to everyone listening, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Ellen Winworth. Um, she is the founder of Water Bear, which is an interactive streaming platform that is the first of its kind and completely dedicated to the future of our planet, which is amazing. And she has done amazing work executive producing My Octopus Teacher, which earned the Documentary and Academy Award for the Best Documentary Feature. Based in the Netherlands, Ellen is a champion of climate activism through filmmaking, and we are very honoured to have you with us today um, to share your story with us. So thank you so much for joining us. Nice um, to see you again. Nice to see you too. So my first question for you today, um, through filmmaking and storytelling, I guess a lot of that relies on empathy and how you can create empathy with your audience. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what do you think the role of empathy is in climate activism? Well, you know, in um, in climate activism, we very often talk about changing hearts and minds. So the, ve the very quickest way to changing hearts and minds is actually appealing to the heart first and then the mind. So if you compare, for instance, what happened to people when they watched my octopus teacher compared with showing them lots of pie charts and graphs and um, giving them lots of statistics, I think you can see that um, film has a really, really important role in reaching people where it matters and reaching them quickly because time is something we don't really have a mm. lot of right now. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so going off that idea of like connecting with people's hearts and minds, I know that you've talked a lot about um, in your previous interviews about the power of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And talking to students who work with TAG, I know a lot of them are interested in storytelling. So do you have any advice that you would give to young storytellers and how they can use empathy and storytelling for climate activism? I think it's very smart to start with yourself. So when I, I you know, the, the reason why I bring up Octopus Teacher quite often is because a good film happens to you. A good film doesn't have to be constructed you know, built out of nothing, but a good film in a way happens when you just at the right time know the right person, have the right access, encounter something small that could have a very big meaning. And then suddenly you're in it yourself. And that's where empathy begins. I think empathy begins mm -hmm. with yourself, um, especially films about climate are tough. So first thing you need is to be empathetic towards your own um, climate anxiety, towards the climate anxiety of the people in your team and the people that you're working with, and go from there. If you bring that into the team, you're going to be working with friends. And if you're, if you're post-producing with the same team, with the same management style in a way, you're going to create a film that is from the inside, um, mm. I think, strong and empathetic. That's really interesting because so with a lot of your work, you've done um, documentary films. Mm -hmm. um, and so do you think that that idea of leading with yourself and empathy from yourself is specific to documentary films? Or do you think that it brings a unique style or perspective to activism through storytelling as opposed to fictional movies, for example? That's a good question. I would always do it um, because if you're going to use the elaborate toolkit that is at your disposal when you make a film then you're going to want to be very very connected with that toolkit and your motivation has to be very very clear so the film has to start with you and the mm -hmm. film has to start in a way also with self-care to think hey if I made this film about my friend who had a nervous breakdown and met an octopus I definitely felt there's also something in this for me. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a fantastic experience. I'm going to be able to satisfy a lot of things I'm curious about. I can help my friend, but I can also help myself and I can help the planet. So those mm -hmm. are, I'm sure, applicable to fiction as well. So would you say that that is what initially draws you to projects or drew you to a project like Octopus Teacher is how you can connect with it um, within yourself? Um, I think it's empathy. Um, and sometimes you don't know in the beginning why you're attracted by a subject. Mm -hmm. I think a filmmaker should never just do it because other people are doing it. 
not the way to go. Should they do it because no one else is doing it? Also not the way to go. They should do it because it speaks to them in some way. Mm. And you can discover um, enormous empathy as you learn more. You connect more deeply as you learn more. So in the beginning, I loved octopuses a little bit. But in the end, I loved them a lot, right? Or, you know, we're beginning now, we're beginning a very important film on a subject um, that's a difficult one to access, which is mining and deep seabed mining. How, you know, and, and so I'm still in development. I'm still in a place where I have to sort of say, where can we create the in? How can we connect people mm. with something so broad, so, so um, difficult? Mm, interesting. Um, mm. I found what you said just now about um, going into the projects you liked octopuses and then you loved them. But I thought that was a really beautiful sentiment. Um, but actually, when I was watching the documentary and preparing for this interview, I was thinking that for so many of us living in urban areas, we have quite a decoupled relationship with wild animals. And mm -hmm. a lot of us really just have no relationship with them at all. Um, so how do you think we can start to rebuild that connection and relationship? Well, even in urban areas, you have little ponds or little parks. And when, uh, you know, when I'm in cities for long stretches of time, uh, I make sure I go to those places and I just sit somewhere and I like to watch whatever animals mm. are there. It could be squirrels, it could be rats, it could be birds, it could be cats, it could be humans walking their dogs. Great fun to watch, right? Watching dogs play, watching humans interact with them. All those things help us connect. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's really important, it sounds silly, but... Um, Take your shoes and socks off and walk barefoot on the grass whenever you can, any time of year. It's really good for you. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> when I was little, I used to hate the feel of grass on my feet, but I think that that's a very good idea. That's it's really well. good for you. It's actually yeah. really good for you. And if you can do it, of course, on the beach, if you can mm -hmm. have a day where you just take a train, you go out to the beach, do it in the sand, it's really magical. It's really good. Um, the other thing I think people don't think of enough is um, our olfactory organ has a direct neurological pathway into our brain. So when Japanese people talk about ocean, I mean, uh, forest bathing, mm -hmm. they're actually talking about something scientifically totally astute, which is your sense of smell is very strong when you're in nature and you can pick up immediately a huge amount of hormones and chemicals and bring mm. them straight to your brain when you're wow. outside even if it's just in a in in a tiny little park in town but it's something i highly recommend and just smell consciously that's super helpful as well that's amazing i'll definitely try that out and i know that everyone listening will be as well um so i have a couple questions just for all of the yeah. students who are on the live stream today to ask you um, so do you think that movies or films or documentaries can change the behavior of youth, particularly when addressing climate change? I think they can. Um, I, I think um, certainly pictures, films depicting the youth movement can show mm -hmm. students all over the world, wow, people are doing it. You know, we just released a film on YouTube that had uh, an Indian climate activist. We filmed her when she was 14 kids all over the world go wow look For, so you can see it's possible you can mm -hmm. also see there's a huge network online network where they they involve and, and this again is you know that type of thing it's like a zoom meeting people have zoom mm -hmm. meetings so you can connect in, with something very very big by watching a film that's one thing you can join a movement the second thing is there are some images you just will remember and they'll stay with you. So I really feel heart when I say hearts and minds, you change your heart by experiencing a film, by locking certain images into your heart and mind. They will change your behavior. I'll give you an example on Water Bear. We launched a film called Slay about how animals are treated by high end fashion brands. And it changed my life to see how these animals are treated, wear handbags, 
and sweaters and leather, other leather goods come from. So mm. it totally works. That's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, so just to close off this interview, firstly, thank you so much for joining us today. Do you have a, a message or a sentence or just um, a call to action for all of the young people who are listening today? Yes, I do. I, I, I know from experience because I used to have a lot of climate anxiety myself. Mm -hmm. I have three children. I was very anxious. They were very anxious. It's very empowering to get involved. It's very mm -hmm. empowering to understand what's happening, understand who the players are, and then apply yourself by doing what you do best. And if what you do mm -hmm. best is express yourself in film or music or art, do it because it's fantastic to be empowered. I love that idea. Thank you so much. And I know that that's really going to resonate with people, um, like talking to people throughout the project. That's one of the things they always ask is, you know, how can you get involved if you're not into science or you're into the arts? And I just think that's amazing and something that we're really trying to do at TAG. So thank you so much for joining us, Ellen, today. Great, thank you. Thank you, Gila, for that amazing interview. I know that you've been preparing and joining us through travel and classes. <laughs> so we appreciate you being here. Um, also, I wanted just to thank Gila. If you receive our newsletters, Gila is behind all of our monthly newsletters at our awesome tag playlist. So we have songs for inspiration around climate action. So you can definitely sign up and be a part of our newsletter. But thank you, Gila, for all that you do for our program and for our classrooms. Oh, thank you all for allowing me to be here. It's great. And we will talk to you back soon with uh, our later afternoon interview. Yeah. See you soon. Okay, so we are ready to head over to our next session, which is a very special panel. And I'd love to bring in Sophie. And Sophie will be leading our panel. She's brought together she, three amazing guests who are backstage. Hello, Sophie, how are you? I'd love to introduce you and then Hi, Jennifer. You to give a little bit of your bio. But Sophie is a friend of TAG and her organization, Kite Insights, where she is the founder and CEO doing amazing things for our planet. And I know you have a great lineup for us today. So I'd love to turn it over to you and have you introduce yourself and then your guests. Wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. Maybe I can invite uh, my guest to join me on the show. If you want to turn your camera on, hello everyone. Can't wait to pronounce your name, having done a practice uh, phonetically. So um, I just want to, first of all, uh, thank you everyone that is joining us today to join this uh, session on youth activism and climate education. As uh, Jennifer said, I'm Sophie Lambin. I'm the CEO and founder of Kite Insights. We are a research, learning and capacity building organization and we're working at the nexus of human and planetary issues. I'm also the founder of the Climate School, uh, very, very appropriately so for this session, which really focused on providing employees in companies, in any job, in any company, with the knowledge, uh, the heart, uh, the motivation, sorry, the knowledge, the head, the motivation, the heart, and the tools, the hands, uh, to act on, on climate in their work. And I really like uh, what... Ellen was just talking about um, just now about really mobilizing people's hearts and minds being such an important part of creating the right condition uh, for action. So today we're really going to be talking about climate education, particularly focused on youth. How do we um, create the, the right condition for them to acquire the knowledge they need, uh, but also acknowledge and support them in handling their eco-anxiety, actually our collective eco-anxiety, how do we create also uh, the condition for learning so that they can act and, and really uh, find uh, the space within which they can um, find solace in action? What type of education is needed and, and what is the role of school uh, in preparing young people for the green transformation? So to have uh, that discuss that ambitious agenda, I have three amazing speakers. Uh, Matthew Hurok, Director of Global Education at EarthDay.org. Hi, Matthew. I have uh, Christina, uh, Christina Klock, uh, Research Director 
uh, of Unbounded Associates and Heads of Climate uh, Education at the Education Commission. Hi, Christina. Hi, everybody. And then Johnny Dabrowski, Youth Activist and Co-Founders of the Climate Education Team of Fridays for the Future. So as we only have a very short time together, I'll skip over the formal introduction and direct uh, you to the uh, Climate Action uh, Day website for more information on each of the speakers. And then I can go straight uh, to um, asking you all some questions. And if you want to interject at any point, raise your hands and I'll make sure to bring you in the conversation. So Matthew, um, I'll start with you maybe. Something that we talk uh, a lot about to our clients at Cat Inside is, is the issue of climate literacy. There is uh, no doubt uh, there is lack of an appetite for much more understanding by uh, employees. I want to know from your point of view at Earth Day, how do you think about climate literacy more broadly? And what are some of the aspects that you see as um, resonating the most uh, with people, especially young people? Sure. Uh, so at EarthDay.org, we've had this kind of climate and environmental literacy campaign that's been running since uh, 2020. And the goal is to get uh, climate change education or education for climate action or uh, whatever terminology we use for it onto uh, the agendas for governments around the world to ensure that all learners everywhere have access to high quality climate change education. And so we've kind of sat historically on two pillars. One is this idea of uh, kind of preparing learners for the green transitions, the green economies of the future, and then two, uh, civic action, right? Civic engagement. And so when I came in here, I was kind of looking around and seeing, well, what are some of the other things that people are talking about in the space? Uh, and then working with colleagues like Christina and with Johnny, and then also hearing from the earlier panelists, uh, thinking about these kind of multiple mindsets or these multiple frames that we need to understand when we talk about climate literacy that moves beyond just education for something. But what are we doing when we're educating, right? So thinking about justice, so social and environmental justice, thinking about these storytelling and communication techniques uh, thinking about how the social policies are embedded within these kind of technical systems, infrastructure, school nutrition programs, et cetera, and so on. And, and that, in addition to kind of thinking about what knowledge do we need uh, and then how do we translate that knowledge into innovations or jobs or economic opportunities? Uh, because all the while dealing with this climate anxiety that kind of sits as a, as a gremlin on our back, right? So having all of these kind of literacy tools may help us to better cope with these eco anxiety. So I'll, I'll pause there because I imagine that uh, my friends and colleagues have some things to add on to the statement that I made. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. So it's really uh, equipping people with an understanding of the broader system uh, that is in need of, of transformation and highlighting those um, intersection between those issues, which I think is maybe sometimes I think one of, one of the silver lining of this crisis is, is that maybe people will start having an enhanced understanding of all the part of the system are highly interconnected and, and so need the solutions. And maybe Christina, I can uh, flip over to you um, when you've, um, you know, in, in light of the research you're doing, uh, specifically around girls' education, how can improving girls' education is, is one of the key uh, driver of, of carbon drawdown, in fact, uh, in, in helping climate outcomes uh, you know, most people still don't get that. <laughs> so maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, that connection and, and what you're doing in that space. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think when we went, just as, as Matthew was saying, when we think about climate literacy, we have to think about the four, you know, climate literacy for what. In my case, I, I, I also uh, like to think about the who. So you know, who is is involved, who has access to this, because um, we know that climate literacy is a critically important building block for climate resilience and adaptive capacity uh, for climate justice. Um, but we also know from the education sector that opportunities to gain that kind of literacy through formal education is unequal around the world, uh, not to mention the opportunity to go to school, period, and get a quality education, period. Um, and this is especially the case for over 130 million girls around the world who, because of the intersecting effects of gender inequality and poverty, 
are denied the opportunity to avail themselves of their right to get an education and get a quality education. Um, we also know uh, from media, from experience, from research that the climate crisis wrecks disproportionate havoc on the lives of the most vulnerable communities. And within those communities, the burden is often disproportionately borne by women and girls. Um, and this is because gender roles and gender norms that shape their day-to-day -day activities, which especially in low and middle income country contexts, are closely tied to the environment and to access to its natural resources. And so with, with gender roles, placing girls and women at greater risk of exposure to climate hazards, greater risk of experiencing um, the environmental and social impacts of climate change. If we're not thinking about these issues as we're also thinking about climate literacy and climate education for all, um, then we're gonna hamstring our, our ability to be able to build climate resilience and adaptive capacity for everyone. And just, I mean, thinking about what we know about why we need to invest in girls' education or why we need to invest in gender equality in education. I mean, it's, it's critical because not only does it strengthen empowerment, build bodily autonomy, and build one's ability to control one's own life, um, one's reproductive, uh, sexual reproductive health lives as well, um, we also build critical leadership skills, critical green skills, critical um, you know, breadth of skills that are essential to participating in the green economy um, that are also essential to decision making that have pro-environmental outcomes for our countries and communities. So if we're not leveraging this, um, if we're not thinking about the who when we're thinking about climate literacy, um, we're going to really miss out on ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to gain the knowledge, the skills, the mindsets um, to be able to, to address the climate crisis. Thank you, Christina. And there is so much leadership potential, right, in um, while, while girls and women are disproportionately impacted, they are also disproportionately impactful in, in how the early adopters uh, of of sustainable solution or practice, so tapping not tapping into that seems uh, insanity considering what we're tapping with. So uh, I'd love to come back um, to to you later on this. But Johnny, maybe I can turn to you and if you could tell me a little bit about your experience as as a student and and where formal ed education has succeeded or failed in uh, reading. Uh, young people in your view for the climate crisis and maybe a few words about how is Friday for Fridays for Future trying to to close that gap. Okay so I will make clear that school did not prepare me for a climate crisis. Uh, the ones who taught me about climate change were David Attenborough, Al Gore, Jane Goodall, IPCC. They taught me by the books, films, documents, uh, the only teacher at my high school who taught me some geography as some as some climate change was my geography teacher. Um, and I live in Poland. I live in the EU in one in one of the most you know developed regions in the world. And still, the most affecting crisis for my generation is not taught at schools here. And we learn about wars. Uh, we learn about political crisis, we learn about uh, economic crisis, religion crisis. Uh, this is important. But we as a generation which is about to face the climate crisis and solve it, we need to be prepared for that. You can't just send us to a battlefield without a weapon and we will fail. This is as that simple. And I don't believe that teachers don't want us uh, you know, they don't want to teach us about climate. I don't also think that the ministers of education uh, try to stop climate education from schools, maybe in some countries, but not in all of countries. Uh, and in my opinion, we just underestimate the role of education, awareness and the right to information in context of solutions for climate change. Even my fellow activists sometimes ask me, why the heck we need climate education, man? We need to close, you know, coal mines. We need to stop oil. And, and my answer is that that's true. We need to prioritize renewables. But tell me, why are you activists? Why? Because you are inspired to do it. Because the information about the catastrophic situation of our planet is the information you were given by someone, by your parent, by environmentalists, by scientists, by PCC, you read about it, you watched some movie, you were educated about it. And it motivates you to change the world. 
And I agree, as Nelson Mandela said, that the most powerful weapon to change the world uh, is education. And I think that's certainly a very powerful weapon to reverse the course of climate change. A solution is climate education. And as a closing remark, I would like to announce that at COP27, because I'm also a member of EarthDay.org, and at COP27, at Earth Day uh, Climate Education Hub, more than 100 youth organizations and individuals will establish Climate Education Coalition, a global coalition which will strengthen um, collaborative action towards climate education in a lot of countries. And if any of you watching wants to join, I invite you to earthday.org social media and there you can apply. So see you at COP27. Great, Johnny. Thank you. And, and see you at COP27 because I'll also be there uh, talking about uh, climate education. So um, it seems to me from what you were saying that maybe one of the problem is actually how educated are the politicians that make those decisions about education, right? Same for business leaders. I think um, the youth is in fact much more educated uh, than the people mm -hmm. that are in position to make the decisions. And uh, I think that's that's part of the problem. But I, I'm just wonder how, in your view, you see, and this is a collective question, you, know, you see education policy um, be real, a, a real lever for, for, for climate solutions. And, and maybe, Matthew, you have some views on that in, in your role at um, org. But do you think there is enough emphasis on, on climate uh, education policy for, for climate action? So I'll, I'll just start by saying, uh, you know, that there needs to be more at the global education policy level to bring this issue into our community. And, and as Johnny just alluded to, you know, that's one of the things that we'll be trying to do at COP27. So we have organized this education focused pavilion. And one of the goals there is to center and elevate the role of education and bring that into uh, the climate community. Um, and the second thing that I'll talk about is work that Christina has 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 done uh, we've, we've done with Christina and also with Johnny and that's uh, over the last kind of six months there was a big kind of edu transforming education summit that kind of ran through the end of 2022 and is still kind of ongoing now uh, and as part of those proceedings a lot of the work that we did as kind of a network not just Christina and Johnny but a, a broader coalition of of actors right. Uh, was to try to influence those proceedings and get climate change onto that agenda. Uh, and we did that through a set of kind of policy recommendations that we sent to uh, summit organizers. Johnny organized a youth coalition and did a social media campaign uh, to try to influence the proceedings and get leader statements to include references to climate change education. Uh, and while we didn't get all of the things that we want, I, I think we can be pretty pleased with kind of how that agenda moved from the beginning of the summit documents to where we are now. So there were five thematic action tracks. And in the beginning of those kind of preliminary documents, there was very little mention of climate change beyond the education for sustainable development action track. But we got a whole paragraph into action track five, which was education finance that talked about the need for kind of leveraging climate finance in the education space. In the outcome documents, there was a youth declaration that included uh, a call for climate change education. Uh, in addition, UNESCO launched its uh, greening education partnership as one of the action items out, out of the summit. I saw Christina's hand go up, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I've said too much already. <laughs> no, this you. is good. We want discussion. We want discussion. Christina. Thanks. No, I just I, I heard a pause and I was like, I'll put it my hand next. But um, <laughs> I just want to build off of what, what Matthew is saying, because, you know, just like I mean, can we, and also going back to what Johnny said, you know, we don't have time for people to accidentally come across documentaries and news stories and influential <laughs> figures to come to the climate crisis and open our minds about the climate crisis. Like we need intentional transformative education. And that's and that's where an important role for policy exists. And we have a long way to go when it comes to ensuring that our policies are setting us up for the kind of success that we want to see when it comes to addressing the climate crisis. In, in, um, in a couple of days, Education International will be publishing um, an update of uh, an analysis of uh, non nationally determined contributions. Um, and in this analysis, we found that less than a third of 
140 NDCs, uh, updated, revised, and new NDCs are mentioning climate change education. And then when we talk about the who's the who again, um, only nine of 140 NDCs are talking about girls in the context of their education, and only three are doing so in the context of climate change education. So we have a huge bit of movement that we need to make when it comes to uh, getting the attention of decision makers, policymakers, and people at the top who are responsible for setting the agenda and setting the, the course of action for five years at a time, for 10 years at a time, to ensure that climate change education um, and climate justice is, is embedded in that. So I just wanted to build that off of what Matthew was saying. Like we have, we've done great work, but we have a long way to go too. Yeah, and, and sometimes, uh, Johnny, you go ahead. I just wanted to add one more thing. Of course, I agree with uh, what you have said. I think from the perspective of youth that um, since last COP, a lot of has changed for climate education. I think politicians are getting to be more open towards the subject. Um, I think also because of uh, the actions of um, the guests of the, on this panel. Uh, and I think that what, what is really possible to do is just for the youth advocates to meet with the Minister of Education in a particular country. I have done it myself with my fellow activists here in Poland. We have convinced our minister, which is a conservative uh, party minister, to introduce climate education to Poland, to Polish schools, and we're already doing it. Um, and, and I think that this is a subject which was forgotten. Uh, it's not as hard as closing a coal mine for a government. So I think the governments uh, are getting more open to it and it's good that they are. And that I think it's not, it's not that hard thing to do as it seems to reach out to a ministry, meet with them. Sure, there will be some obstacles, but I think it's a really worth thing to do. Thank you, Johnny. And you, you find that hard to believe, but uh, we already had time. Clearly, this is a conversation that needs uh, more time and, and it looks like we're going to have plenty more of it uh, in person and virtually at the COP. But basically, it seems to me that we need to embed climate, not in the geography lessons only, but across the whole curriculum. We probably also need to upskill the teachers that are embedding climate in religion, in math, in science and in geography. And uh, Christina, to your point, uh, we need to recognize one how um, you know existing cultural norm can dramatically uh, negatively impact uh, uh, girls, and yet girls uh, can be uh, and women uh, can be huge accelerator of climate action in a way that is inclusive. So let's not miss that opportunity. And then uh, finally, I think uh, the potential to really uh, embed this into the, the policy text as, as you um, enabling uh, Matthew seems uh, really uh, hopeful progress. So I just really want to thank you all for your so short but um, mighty contribution to this panel. And I look forward to continuing the conversation offline and in person. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Yes. Thank you so much to every one of you for sharing those powerful thoughts about climate literacy. Uh, thank you so much, Sophie, for joining. And uh, let's go to our next guests. Um, Jen, how are you doing? I'm great. We are cruising <laughs> along with our day very quickly and I don't know about you, Kuhn, but I've been checking out on social media. We have people sharing with the hashtag ClimateActionEDU. We have photos and excitement from classrooms all around the world. And thank you to our last panel. I love the emphasis on education and the need for climate action education and professional development for our teachers, something we are fighting for every single day. So that was really wonderful to hear. I know we have some classrooms ready to share their solutions that they've been working on. So maybe before our next session, we can head over to India. Great. My name is Aradya Borani. My name is Omkar Devan. We, we are, are studying in MPS Bhani Shankar CBSE Dadar. Which place is this, Omkar? We are in Mumbai Shivaji Park Beach. Look over there. So much garbage is on the beach. Yes, most people throw garbage, plastic items. 
uh, idle immersion, radioactive substances, etc. Like example, like this. So what can we do to stop the water pollution in water bodies? We can stop water pollution. Uh, we can stop water pollution by not throwing garbage like these example by using eco-friendly idols and by cleaning the beach frequently. So everyone and let's take action, action to change the climate, climate revolution. revolution. Thank you. And next we have Tanzania. Okay, so in 10 minutes, we will be going to an interesting interview with Andrew Jack from Financial Times and Dr. Matt Winning, an author. But first, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Juan Pablo Celis Garcia from the UN Environment Program. And he will be focusing on what youth can do, what their solutions can be for climate crisis. Hi, Juan. Hi, everybody. Hi, Quinn. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Juan. Good Welcome. Again, uh, after one year, it's, it's, uh, a lot has happened. A lot has, uh, ha has changed. And uh, I, it's really exciting to be in this conversation today. Thank you for joining us. And where in the world are you? Because I get to follow you on Instagram, and I know you are traveling a lot and sharing your message. So where are you tuning in from uh, today? I'm, I'm right now in Nairobi. I'm back to Nairobi, Kenya, where the UN Environment Program headquarters is. Uh, I, yes, I've, I've, been, I've been traveling a lot, um, but I've been able to meet a lot of interesting, empowering you know, uh, young people that are doing a lot of important work on the ground. That's fantastic. Well, we know you've been very busy and making a lot of noise advocating for youth voices, so we're excited to hear from you today. Thank you, Juan. Thank you once again. And I, I was, I've been watching the live stream and I'm really happy to see so many comments on the chat box in YouTube. And I encourage everyone to keep doing it. I want to hear where you're coming from. Please um, write it on the, on, the, on the chat box. I've been reading that you, many of you coming from India, Romania, places in, in, in Europe, in Asia. And it's, it's just amazing to see so many of you, you know, encouraged and empowered to commit to climate change, to tackle climate change. And it's, 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 it's really inspirational to me because in, a, in, in the next few days, um, world leaders are going to meet uh, in Egypt to commit and to pledge and to find a, um, a common understanding to tackle the, the issues of climate change. And uh, it's very important that what we're doing here today, this week, and in the past weeks, all of the projects that the you know you guys have been doing in your schools, in your communities, and in your environments have been you know really uh, bringing up the messaging and amplifying that call for action on the environment, and it's uh, it's it's really setting the, the the ground for what's going to happen next week, where many of the world leaders are going to meet and make decisions for our future. It's it's uh, it's really inspirational to have you um to have you um you know hear about your projects to understand much more about what you're doing in your schools and i i want to i want to have a little bit of an interaction with you guys so everyone who um you know who has uh you know access to the chat box i want you to raise your thumb up your virtual thumb 
uh, if you are interested in science, in technology, if you're interested in um, pursuing a career on, on, on these issues, on science, technology, engineering, are you interested in that? Please please give me your thumbs up in the, in the chat box. I want to see some of the, those comments. Um, I'm, and I want to direct that message to you, um, to those who want to, you know, pursue this kind of a field. Because in the last uh, couple of weeks, I have been uh, privileged to um, to meet with a lot of innovators, with a lot of uh, young people that are developing new technologies, um, with young people that are entrepreneurs. And I could tell you that we need you for our future. We need those young innovators. We need those, um, you know, those change makers, those scientists, those young scientists uh, to be able to solve the issues of today and those that will be coming on the future. And um, and I want to, to give that special message to you because I feel that sometimes, um, you know, we we. Um, we don't give that, uh, you know, recognition enough to the inspiring young people that are entrepreneurs, that are scientists, that are, you know, those innovators that are cre creating technologies. And um, and I, if I could, you know, share with you a little bit of a, an experience that I had, I met a few, a couple of uh, young people from several countries uh, two weeks ago, where I had the chance to learn about different projects on calculating greenhouse gas emissions. And they were developing, uh, you know, an app or a device that would allow us to, to calculate greenhouse gas emissions in, the, in high schools, in institutions, in the specific areas, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, in the rural, uh, you know, areas of, of, of a country. And this to me is so important. And that's why I, when I, when I see these videos of the high school students and the young people on the, on the communities doing, you know, projects that are educating the population about what climate change is, I think it's also so important that we bring in this scientific part, this technology part. Um, and, and that's why I want to really highlight the work of those young innovators, of those young change makers. And many of you who are watching today, who are really inspired to pursue these kind of fields is, is I, I want to encourage you because we really need you. And uh, the UN Environment Program actually uh, uh, a few days ago uh, launched a report the, called the Emissions Gap Report. It's a report that the, uh, it's one of the most important reports that UNEP uh, launches every year. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's telling us a lot of important information that we need to consider as young people, as the, as the, as the new generation, and also for those uh, governments at the policymaking level. And uh, some of the, the, the points that this report mentioned is that that for us to get on track to meet this Paris Agreement goal, the world needs to reduce greenhouse gases by unprecedented levels over the next eight years. And we really don't have a lot of time. So if you think, um, you know, I am perhaps some of you might be 15 year old, 18 year old, and in the next eight years, you will be 26, you will be, you know, uh, already a young professional and you will be in the workforce and, you know, if you think about what can you do to ensure that you know that our carbon footprint and those and the, those greenhouse gas emissions, you know, in the next eight years are going to be reduced dramatically, what can you do as a young professional from now on to you know contribute to to these to these uh, important task? And it, it, and it's it's a role of everybody. And of course, the governments and institutions have the you know the primary role than the private sector. But as as individuals, as young people, we also have an important task for today and for the next eight years. So think about like, how do you see yourself in the next eight years and how could you envision, you know, being a contributor to that, you know, to, to making that change and to ensure that we will be able to commit uh, and, to, and to reduce uh, greenhouse gases uh, before 2030. So it's, it's, it's something that, um, I, I know it might be challenging to even think about that, but um, but I but I also want to keep encouraging you and um, you know and 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 give you a motivational message because I I feel that sometimes as well as young people we feel a little bit discouraged by a lot of things that are happening out in the world and and um, you know a lot of things that are happening in our city that sometimes you know it's hard for us to be continuing to be those advocates uh, for for climate, but you know. 
no matter the circumstances, you know, young people around the world keep innovating, they keep building, they keep empowering. And this is the role that you are doing in right now. And please ensure that there is a lot of young people like you that um, that are doing the same in their communities and that are supporting each other in one way or another. And I'm, I'm, I send you all my, you know, my energy and all my, you know, um, you know, uh, support as much as I can as my work as a youth coordinator in UNEP. And, and, and please, uh, you know, um, make sure that uh, the initiatives, the things that you're doing, that a lot of people hear about them, that you share it with everybody, because this is, is, is really important that we highlight these voices as well. So I want to also give you a little bit of homework. So if you please go to unep.org slash youth, you're going to find some of the initiatives that we have for young people that you could join, that you and your friends can participate in. And um, I would really love to see you involved in some of them. One of those programs is called the Young Champions of the Earth, which I've mentioned last time um, in the last Climate Action Day. And it's a program that is allowing many young innovators to get support, to amplify their work, and to ensure that their, um, you know, their projects reach borders and go over borders. And um, I want to thank once again, Jennifer and, and Coin for the amazing work that you guys are doing to inspire all of these young people uh, from across the world and in schools. And thank you also for all the teachers and everyone who's so committed to stay at, you know, morning, day, night, connected to participate in this, in this uh, important uh, climate Action Day. So um, once again, I'll be watching you guys on the comments on YouTube uh, because I want to hear where you're watching us from and, you know, and, and the projects that you are working in. So thank you very much once again, and I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you so much, Juan, for your continuous uh, guidance and, and uh, yeah, your help, basically. So really grateful for you sharing thoughts, how youth how, how important youth is, is as part of this conversation, basically. So thank you so much and uh, see you thank next you. time. All right. See you. So um, I'm really, really excited. And you may think like, huh, he's been saying this like for several times. But next we will be having an author who's also an academic and also a comedian and we decided to have an interview for him by Andrew Jack from the Financial Times so I'm really 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 curious about this where this will end hi Matt hi Andrew thank you so much for joining hi Cohen pleasure to be here oh, um, you're still Andrew muted, you're on Andrew. mute Can you hear? We can't hear You're you. You're on Andrew, mute, uh, Andrew. Yeah. In the meantime, let me show a small <laughs> slide. <laughs> okay. Hi, Andrew. Hi, hi. Great to great to be here. Looks like a great uh, audience as well of uh, students and teachers around the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was fascinating to see the students uh, presenting from different parts of the world, and very inspiring from my side to to see the engagement across so many different countries. So, so, so Matt, I mean, um, this, uh, it'd be just really interesting if, if you might say a few words a little bit to explain your, your background, how you got in, interested in climate related issues and, yeah. and how you juggle a little bit um, your research with um, your humor. <laughs> so I do two things. I've got a very odd life. I am uh, a researcher at a university working on climate change, um, mitigation policy. I'm an economist by training originally. I used to work for an investment bank. Finance was very much my bag and I left that world and worked on climate change instead. Um, and I've been doing that for 15 years. Um, I did a PhD and I've worked at university for the last decade um, and during that entire time I've always been quite uh, interested in creative things other aspects and I think we should all personally I feel like we should all use um, what skills we have and our passions and our hobbies to also talk about climate change I think it's an important way of 
communicating beyond academia and beyond the normal sorts of things we hear about. So I've been doing comedy uh, as well. Uh, I've been a stand-up comedian for 12 years or so, and I've been doing it specifically, jokes about climate change for the last five years. Um, and I wrote a book and a radio series. Um, and I, what I try to do is reach beyond the normal sorts of people who would, uh, you know, be interested in climate change. For me, a lot of the messaging, the lot of ways that we communicate it is very serious. It's very earnest. It will only reach people who potentially already care about the issue or who it's going to appeal to. And actually, you know, education, I think, should be more about meeting people where they already are and, you know, um, trying to get people who wouldn't necessarily think about issues of climate or won't necessarily think about being educated about climate to try to um, to reach those people somehow. So I think comedy plays a, can play a really important role there um, in helping to, you know, get get the message out there in ways which and to people which otherwise w w just wouldn't happen at all. And, we, and we'll talk about the humour a bit more in a second, but just just for yeah. those of interest, I mean, just to say a little bit about what your your actual kind of academic research is focused on specifically. Yeah, absolutely. So I do, uh, at the moment, I'm looking at uh, steel decarbonisation and the circular economy related to steel and what the uh, economics of that might be globally and trade of uh, decarbonised steel, things like um, the... Uh, the, the 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 carbon border adjustment mechanism which is going to come into force in the eu um which is all very fascinating i've done some of my reports uh over the last few years uh looking at global mitigation scenarios were part of the ipcc's uh working group three report so you know cited in reports about that it's very much about how do we decarbonize what the economics of that are um what the finance related to that is. Um, so it's very sort of serious, heavy stuff, um, which is good. And I think it gives me a real grounding to be able to talk about the issues in, in a lot of depth. But what I then try to do is think about how does this relate to people's lives? How can it relate to the, how we uh, do stuff? So, you know, I go out there, I've got a bit about, for instance, uh, reducing the amount that people potentially fly, given that there aren't current alternatives to, to flying. What are the types of solutions? One of my solutions is that some people are afraid of flying. I think we need to make more people afraid of flying. That's a solution. I think we need glass floors on planes, actual snakes on a plane, all of these things. That's climate action to me, you know? So um, it's about, you know, I guess getting people to think about things a bit differently. Um, and, and some and some people would say that uh, you know climate's too serious to to make fun of, right? I mean, what, what's the what's the reaction in different audiences like when you're doing stand up even or or in yeah, other yeah, sorts yeah. of contexts? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things. That I think if anyone comes to see it and I, I, they don't they understand where it's coming from and the the message that it's coming across and the way that it's done is very much not making fun of the impacts of climate change at all because obviously it's incredibly serious. Um, but it's trying to make light of some of the more interesting aspects of what happens with climate change, trying to get people to think about it in a different way and try to get people to um, engage with it and how it might impact their own lives as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I tend to find that once people actually see it, it's normally people that haven't seen it or just hear about it that they go, oh, well, I don't know how you can make jokes about that. But once, you know, Again, it's uh, it's that thing where not making a judgment until you've actually, you know, understood what the, the concept is. And I think the fact that I'm coming clearly coming from an earnest place of something that I work on every day and that clearly I'm passionate about and want to talk about, I think that all comes across. Uh, so yeah, that's me, Andrew. Yourself, you work for the Financial Times um, as right. a journalist looking at education, um, and. Yeah, how do you how do you see the role of journalism um, in in taking action on climate change? And you know, what what could what does journalism do well, and what could it, what could it do better? 
Well, I think what journalism can do well is a bit like you were saying with humour, to get the messages out, the facts, the trends, the patterns, the, the good and the bad to a much wider audience beyond the, the specialists, the technical folks. And hopefully in the same way as you were, you were discussing with humour, you know, also to get to folks who might not be thinking about these issues in the right way or as much as they ought to be. And so to kind of spread that, spread that context, what I hope you know, the best journalists do is uh, find great stories, um, write stuff, often snappily, but in a quite um, accessible way. So kind of unearthing fresh ways to look at stuff. And then more and more, of course, journalism, including the, the FT, we don't just use words, we use video, we use mm -hmm. uh, graphics and animation, and we use data. We even uh, have kind of simulation models and so on that anyone can play with to sort of try and be, you know, a decision maker, an actor, an activist, and see what the different implications of how things are playing out will be, for example, on global warming and net zero targets. So I think at their best, they're great. As you know, over the years, there's been huge debates, a bit like with Brexit, amongst other things, about whether um, some journalists are kind of focused enough on the science yeah. or this idea of a kind of false equivalence. You know, if you've got somebody with a bulk of insight and evidence warning, as we do with the IPCC and others, about warming, there's a sometimes a tendency we have to have somebody on the other side, you know, even mm. if frankly they're not necessarily um, as knowledgeable or insightful. So I think we've got to be very mindful about the need of, you know, giving wide voices, but also being very much driven by the science and the evidence around what we do. So I think that's uh, that's some of the big, the key things. And then just in terms of my own role, so the FT obviously writes a lot about climate, partly because you know, is it and your former role um, in banking and so on, you know, decision makers of all sorts, whether it's in business, in public policy, in education and beyond, um, they want and they need high quality insights. And of course, it affects everything that happens to us, including, you know, fund managers investing in people's pensions, but also politicians going perhaps or perhaps not to COP27 and so on and thinking about, you know, how much and in what way these issues sh should resonate. And so I think we need to be very much uh, part of that debate. Great. And so, so I was really interested in what you said there about, you know, there's a there's sort of a responsibility, I guess, of journalism in in how it communicates and what it dis, you know decisions that are made. How 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 do we improve that? You know, do do we need more climate journalists per se, or do you think that there needs to be just a better understanding across journalism of why climate change is important to the areas that they already cover, for instance? I think we need both. I think I think it's been interesting to see. You know, there's been quite a lot of newer journalism sites, media sites, or kind of organizations that, you know, might not call themselves classic media, but are kind of engaging around mm. these issues through social media, through blogs, through podcasts and, and beyond. Um, I think hopefully more and more journalists, whatever the areas that they cover, the geographies or the sectors and the themes, will be thinking more and more about this. And we see it, you know, when you have extreme weather, of course, um, for example, and all the natural, so-called natural catastrophes that follow yeah. on, for example, it touches, you know, everything, people's day-to-day -day lives, um, where they choose to live, um, what the responses should be, uh, what the insurance claims might end up being on their, on their damaged houses and property, the disruptions to travel, to work, to leisure, whatever. So that should be something that affects and influences all journalists but then on the other hand i think it's absolutely right and necessary and we've we've certainly done this to kind of create these hubs and focuses and hire more journalists who are specifically focused on these issues so that you know you really get to a wider audience and, and another aspect of it is also thinking about um solutions so not just being catastrophic reporting on the negative and the eye-catching but also mm. trying to identify you know really good best practices alternative ways of land management, of looking for new sources of energy, of finding, which I think is just a tragedy, not enough work on conservation, for example, in the UK mm -hmm. at the moment. You know, we really need much more public messaging and ideas about how people could save energy that we don't really yep. see as much as we should, I think. Great. I mean, can you give us any, because uh, I realise that the FT do a lot of uh, work in this area and have sort of shifted quite a lot to cover climate. And 
you work in education as well. Is there sort of specific examples of climate education work that's that's going on? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, most of our content is available to anyone who subscribes to the FT yeah. via the paywall. For secondary schools, for high schools around the world, we actually offer free access. So teachers and students anywhere can get access to pretty much all of our content. And that includes a lot that's around climate and sustainability. And we also work with teachers and we're always keen to have other volunteers as the experts in the classroom to sort of say, you know, hey, this article would be really useful for whichever bit of the subject or the theme I'm teaching. Um, we ask them to kind of flag that up, maybe to provide a couple of questions to go with whatever the content is, and we can share that more widely. So that's at the school level. And as I said, you know, we do a lot around videos and graphics and animations and simulations that, that hopefully are quite fun for people yep. to use. Then at other levels, I mean, I focus on education at all ages and an area I'm quite interested in is business schools, because, you know, these are the, the managers and the entrepreneurs of the future. And so we've got a big uh, focus, including I'm literally at the moment in the process of shortlisting a series of awards. So for um, teaching uh, around sustainability, around academic research with a sort of bright, broader societal impact in practice, mm -hmm. and around identifying great student projects with third party organizations that have a kind of societal or a sustainability impact. So yeah, we're certainly doing lots, but I mean, more and more needs to be done. Absolutely. I mean, the thing that, that struck out, struck me a little bit from our conversation so far is this idea of and I'm not saying it ha obviously climate change doesn't have to be fun, but we've both sort of said different ways in which we've tried to make it more interactive or we've tried to make it more accessible so that you bring in more people and you make it a little bit, uh, I guess, more interesting for people in, in a way that they perhaps wouldn't normally think about interacting on climate change. Because, you know, I'm sure a lot of the people who are listening here already are very, you know, care about the issue, are very involved in it. but broadening that is obviously really important for society if we're going to solve this because it has to have sort of people from all different aspects of, of the countries and from countries across the entire world to become um, you know involved and to understand the, the details and why the changes are happening and what sort of changes will happen um, so yeah I guess if you can make everybody needs to know about it so if you can make that Make, make make that a little bit more fun than I think um, it just helps with the communication it doesn't it's not that the message is fun but it's very much that, that, that we all you know can have our own communication whether that's in teaching or whether it's um, uh, elsewhere and what, what would your be advice to Matt to mm. teachers for example if they were thinking about you know um, where in the in the curriculum or outside the curriculum they could engage and whether they should yeah. try to use Huber as part of what they're doing well, I, I think, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say all teachers should start, you know, telling jokes uh, necessarily about it or whatever. You may want to come up with one or two. Um, but I think, you know, there's really good, um, there are political shows out there uh, that, that do stuff on this that you could show that, you know, comedy shows that, that, that do things. Um, you also, I guess, the, the tools are about engaging people and making them uh with comedy i guess even just throwing jokes in throughout a, a talk or something like that is often a good way at the start of being self-deprecating so one one thing that i often do um when i'm doing comedy i think is make fun of myself right at the start because normally i come on stage and i'm an academic and i'm a doctor and people think that i you know i'm going to talk in language that they don't understand as an academic and that i'm already sort of have a sort of higher uh, position, but actually being self-deprecating, using humor can bring you down, you know, ingratiate yourself with people a lot more. Uh, so I think it's incredibly important to be able to do that. And it also can just keep people interested, keep, you know, their, their minds uh, much more positive. There are positive learning effects that people have said about using comedy. So I think that's always good. Do we want some questions? Do we have time? Yeah, for I was just going to say there's, there's some great stuff coming in. I'm happy, yeah, to, some... I'm happy to bounce so, some off. There's one here I see, Matt, from Sandipta, who says, how do you fight about the discouragement you face um, around climate and continue to advocate for climate action? Yeah, I mean, the positivity, I mean, I think what you have to do is you have to focus on the changes that you can make. So you have to be very aware of, 
you can't do everything yourself you and you also won't change everybody's minds you won't convince every everybody and everything but the positive changes that you can make give you a lot you know it, it, it sustains me it nourishes me and keeps me going um by by you know people have come to my shows comedy shows who haven't been interested in have emailed me afterwards and said oh we sold our car after coming to your so show and bought a you know something a much more uh, climate friendly car or we didn't our family didn't fly on holiday that year or we changed uh, our, our electricity provider or something um so people contact me and tell me about the actions that they've taken and that gives me you know a, a very uh short-term uh boost in terms of the feedback that i'm getting and knowing that there is an impact and that if if, if i'm doing that there are hopefully ripples of other people doing that out there as well um so that's a yeah an excellent question yeah it seems to me there's got to be you know there's got to be change as we know at the government and the international level around yeah. regulation and action but equally i think individuals can really make a difference and it's important they think about it in their own lifestyles and how they engage with their friends and family yeah, and, and I think it's important, you know, th th to make that point to people that it is there are things they can do, but that it's not all on them, you know, and that actually what what we consider to be action on climate change, those individual things are, are only a small part of what is your job and what is how you and, you know, your society, the community that you live in, how you engage in politics, all of that is the same thing as recycling more or something, you know, and, and actually there are, there are, you know, um, some are more important than others in terms of the impact that they can have so that's it's, i think it's, it's important to try and talk about it all within the idea of what we what we can do about it um great i can't see any more qu questions there's one, uh, one, one other me. here i see if you were given a chance to have a superpower as a solution for climate change what would it be and why oh superpower um maybe i don't know well there was that felt superman film where he sort of spun the earth backwards didn't he and he sort of I wonder if we could kind of go back maybe about 30 years and s s take the technologies we have now and then start them again 30 years ago. Maybe it's a bit too much. Um, invisibility, maybe, that would be good. You could go into places <laughs> and just, you know, sign some policy documents and all of a sudden something's happening or, I don't know, it's a very good question. I definitely like the idea of um, climate superheroes. Got a final, final brief and quick joke for us around climate oh, that people could take oh, away? Oh, a brief joke. What have I got that's short? Really nothing. I often, uh, what, what do I do? Um, I tell, tell people that I often change. So the warmest year on record is, is 2020 uh, so far. I, I always change my PIN number to, to the warmest year on record uh, to make, you know, it makes me more susceptible to fraud all my money gets stolen all the time but the message is getting out there you know i just tell people my pin number all the time um they can just guess it anyway wonderful you, um you hopefully that was yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully that was uh was interesting to people yeah i think that's that's great um kern anything you want to ask us oh you're, on mute. you're muted there <laughs> Well, there goes my question, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Ending with a joke. I, I just, I, mean, I want to thank you both for your messages around storytelling and that activism can be videos or articles or comedy just for our young people to get their messages out and tell their stories in whatever way makes sense to them. So Absolutely. I appreciate that. If you've got if you've got a talent or you've got a passion for something, use that. And it's great to see all the energy of of uh, the the different people who are kind of joining here on this call and the, the many I speak to um, almost every day, and it's really inspirational as well. So you know, it's it's there's a depressing backdrop, but there's also lots of possibility to do things and to be optimistic and to and to find some humour as one of the one of the tools we need to tackle this huge issue. Yeah. Thank you so it's much. It's going to be a long slog, so we might as well try to <laughs> enjoy it on the way. Get, yeah. Do it together, too. Thank you for being with us today, and we can't wait to keep the conversation going with you both. Thanks it's a lot. Pleasure. Enjoy Bye. the rest Bye. of the day. Yep. Ooh. Sorry, Jen. That was Good awesome. You. <laughs> yeah, and you look a little different. Uh, You think? <laughs> I think it's... 
my hair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's the <laughs> shirt. So I, I know that was a question of uh, the last <laughs> panel about superhero, and you're just like changing like Superman. You have all these costume changes for it today, but loving that Climate Action Project T-shirt. Awesome. So okay, we started off with sharing a small challenge. And the challenge was that you have to submit a picture of how you envision the world to be in 2030, hopefully in a good place. And this can be you as a teacher, you as a student with a group, um, working on solutions, taking action. It can be a picture of you watching this show because this is helping climate as well. Um, and you have to submit the pictures. Jen, keep talking. <laughs> yes. So we have a link that you can use to share your photos and your ideas. And we know that the first 500 that are submitting will be receiving a very special gift. And if you weren't here at this, the start of Climate Action Day, we had a special guest. Kuhn? Yeah, we had Georgina. And she was as generous to share not 100, not 200, but 500 books, e-books. Otherwise, they would take shipping would take too much carbon. Yeah. Uh, this book will be sent, this e-book, to the 500 people who will be submitting their pictures. And I was just checking, Jen, and I was like, yeah, I think 30 people or something like that okay. submit the book. But I can say it's a few hundreds already. Oh, already. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. So people better so hurry you up. you have to hurry up. <laughs> and maybe you can take a picture of a watch party with our next guest, David. But before we go to David, David was already like... <gasps> yep. Not yet. <laughs> before we go to David, <laughs> we just have a few announcements to make. And we also will be showing a few students... Jen, what do you think? That sounds amazing. So first off, shout out to our awesome community. So we have people that have been, I know we came on here and we had people that were already here for hours waiting for Climate Action Day to begin. So we've had our classrooms joining from 149 countries. Thank you to everyone for sharing in the chat and telling us where you're coming from. In addition to all of our amazing guests today, we had 25 schools who are sharing their solutions from the Climate Action Project. So we're in the final week of the Climate Action Project for this year, and we'd love to move over to Romania for you to hear from our friends there in just one moment. The earth is ours to save and to care for with Climate Action Project Let's Do More. It's time to put an end to climate change. Take action. Our minds and the range. Recycle, plant a tree and stop pollution. We are a global team. Let's find solutions. We've made mistakes. We cannot change the past, but we can still save Earth. So let's act fast. Climate Action Project is the key to build a better world for you and me. Wonderful. So the next video will be of a special group of students. Every student is special. But this one is of the school we built in the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. And although they struggle, um, they still managed to create a video. It's not perfect because it has a watermark on top of it. But I think their message is great. And we are really happy that they were able to Join the Climate Action Project as well. Planning trees. Planning trees is the most important thing to contribute to the health of the planet. For instance, it reduces the extreme negative impact of climate change, like water, scarcity, drought, wildfire, and high temperatures. Hello, world. Here we have a student from Kakuma. Hi, by the name William. Luis Ario, I will represent a global warming is predicted to have a strong and a massive impact on human health. This is because we are slow in taking action. We 
for instance, in Kakuma, the weather temperature is at 32 degrees, actually, it is not, it's not healthy for human population. For the past six weeks, we have participated in climate action activity and we are able to come with a pulse, which is made up of plastic, plastic stand and battery. And switch, this fan is used for circulating the half more of this in our classroom. I think we are solving global one. In week one, or locally, in our location, so this is how it works. And when you switch on, it will rotate the plants. Hi, by the name Ross John, I asked something to discuss with you, like plastic bottles. The world is producing a large variety of plastic products, which are valuable at their market price. The problems come in when we are done using it. We intend to grow them in a valuable environment, habitat of other animals. As climate education calls for in the world, we should activists in Kakuma decide to collect plastic bottles. That was uh, <laughs> that was wonderful. Okay. And one more vi uh, video from Sri Lanka. Single-use disposables are all over. They end up in landfills, adding to our already overburnt garbage problem. We took it upon ourselves to find out how our great-grandparents cooked, stored, shared, and served food. Our research led us to the humble banana leaves. They are versatile. They freeze well, are readily available, economical, and totally hygienic. They also come with a range of health benefits. When food is cooked in banana leaves, we benefit from a range of health benefits. They are naturally non-stick, making cooking with zero oil a reality. What's more, when you cook with banana leaves, it imparts a subtly sweet flavor and retains moisture. Leaving food juicy. Once used, they decompose easily. Go zero waste with banana leaves. Jen, we have one more. One more for now. That was awesome. Thanks to our friends in Sri Lanka. And now let's head over to Turkey. Hi, we are students Yeni Mahalla Campus College from Turkey. Thank you for teaching us. It sounds cheap to our environment through this project. Thank you, Jennifer. Climb and Climbing Action Project Team. We hear about the greenhouse gas effect and results for the first time with this project. Planet causes of climate change. By starting together, we work it hand in hand for our planet. We plant the trees for climate action day. We learn it a lot from each other by co collaborating with students from other countries. We share it. information, what we learn, our family and friends. Thank you for all. Okay. Have fun. So, next, we have a guest, which will be introduced by Jennifer. And after that, so stay tuned, we will have a real magician. Ooh, amazing. All right. So, we have a friend of TAG who our community has continually said, Please bring him back. So if you follow along on social media, you will see all of the awesome posts with our friend, David. Welcome back. We have you for Climate Action Day. We have you for webinars. It is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's incredible. Thanks so much for having me and putting up with me. <laughs> oh, we love you being here. So David from the Lego team with Build the Change, hopefully you are a part 
of our webinar we had two weeks ago. So we had two awesome sessions where classrooms were able to join in. And David and his team always are cooking up fun things for our classrooms around play and creativity and ways students can take action in really meaningful ways. So hopefully, David, you'll be talking about that and sharing how our classrooms can still get involved and can learn more. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Well, it's great to see you all. Great to see Cohen and Jen as well. Always good to be here. Now I have a very short time this time. I had an hour last time. I might have seen some of you. So I'm going to be very quick. And my main objective today is just to introduce Build the Change to some of you who might not know it and also give you a little bit more details on where you can get some of the course packs to do in your class throughout the year. And that's something that the Climate Action Day team as well will be linking uh, at some point on their site as well. So you'll be able to find it, no problem. So I'm going to try and share my screen now. One second. Here we go. Okay, now you can hopefully see that. If you can bring that up for me, Jen and Cohen, that'd be great. Here we go. Where's this? There we are. I always get this wrong. There it is. The slide. Can children's ideas solve real world challenges? Yes, they can. We know that. All of you know that. We're in the same boat here and we need to make a difference. And to do that, we need to listen to children, young people. You guys have the answers, but people don't listen to you enough. So in Build the Change, we're really trying to inspire and mobilize all of you young people out there to shape the, your own sustainable future. We're doing it with wonderful partners like Take Action Global and many others around the world. So do get involved with, with all of what we're doing. The, the reason I bring up Children's Voices is I truly believe and my team truly believe that we're not listening to you enough. We're not listening to young people enough. And we at the Lego Group, we see you as our role models. Who can we learn better from than children and young people? You guys have the best ideas. You think creatively. You think without boundaries. We need more of your ideas out there. This is an example of what we put out last year. You may remember from the Climate Change Conference, we created a small booklet. I just wanted to bring this up because Every time I read the last few lines, it makes me very emotional. This is a letter, this is a, a paragraph or two from children to adults of the world. And that last, those last few lines, the power may be yours, but the future is ours. Um, please act, please involve us. And we're going to do all we can in the Build the Change team to make sure you're represented. So Build the Change, for those of you who don't know, is a very simple program. It has three main components. One is learning through play. So you're using play. The previous guests talk about making these topics fun, engaging. We hope we're doing that with our content. So we want to incorporate play, use play to connect children to the final point there, which is sustainability. In the middle, making children's voices heard, which I just mentioned. We need to amplify your voices wherever we can. Good. So I mentioned it's simple. Could be simpler, it's three steps. It's immerse, create, and share. Very simple, whenever you see build the change out there in the world, you are gonna be introduced to a challenge that might be five minutes long, might be five hours long, but it will always be immerse, create, share. Immerse in a real topic, so it might be biodiversity and the impacts of climate change, then a big challenge comes along, big challenge, you start creating and ideating, and then when you're done, you share and we have ways that you can share um, inside our courses so you'll be able to see all of that now you may have noticed i'm holding a drumstick i'm kind of getting known for the drumstick so i feel like i should bang the drums because well let's think of it metaphorically we are banging the drum for you for your ideas out there nice link so build the change has three columns to it we have the educator courses which we're going to show you the link to later we've got the build the change workshops and events which some of you may have done as part of your climate action project and then we have build the change home so we're getting loads of digital games out there on various children's platforms so don't worry too much about the home i think for you guys the events and the educator the educator is what i'm going to focus on in a minute but these are just some pictures of events around the world and children getting really engaged with those. 
Um, you can see some, I like this one. I built a fox habitat and it's filled with trash and someone is cleaning it up and helping the environment. What a solid message to give. And then I like the one over here, an airplane that can make air electricity, can just use air and make electricity. Sounds crazy, sounds unrealistic, but if a scientist sees that and they think, hang on a minute, there's something really interesting there. Maybe we can unpack that a little bit and explore that idea. Imagine children's ideas can really change the world. And that's what we truly believe creativity um, unlocks. Now, I, I like this. I can't see what you're writing in the chat, um, but if you wanna put in the chat and tell me uh, which of these is your favorite, I would love to hear. And maybe Jen and Cohen can, can relay that back to me at the end before we say goodbye. But let's go through them. So these are some children's ideas. I just wanted to showcase the first one. And there's some Danish underneath. Don't worry about that. <laughs> we are a Danish company. Um, a, this is a phone booth time machine that can take us back in time and restore our doings. Interesting idea. We made an anti-cow farting machine. It drives around and sucks in farts and converts it to clean air. Hmm. It's got some good, good potential, that one. A machine that intakes seawater through the hose, cools it, and makes ice sheets. The polar bears never have to worry about the ice melting. Amazing. There's some really good ideas in that one, too. The last one is awesome. 100% reusable basketball court, producing energy every time the ball goes through the basket. So combining health, sport, and environmental impact. How cool is that? So just out of interest, if you have a favorite, Put it in the chat and maybe uh, they can let me know what you answered later. Very good. I love those ideas. Now, before I end, just checking time, some content to get you excited. So we are we are creating content. My, my small team, we're about three people and we, we create all of this stuff. And we love doing it because we always imagine young people like you and like your, your educators around you getting involved and really enjoying it and engaging with it. And that really makes us happy. But these are the topics that we've looked at so far. We've got sustainable buildings, cities and spaces. We've got a biodiversity and climate change course, which some of you may have done last year. We've got the circular economy course, which I'm gonna get to in a minute. That's brand new, brand new, hot off the shelf. And then a little sneak peek in a month's time, or maybe a little longer, we have a new course coming on human impact through the lens or through the eyes of birds, a bird's eye view maybe. I should I should definitely get that in the deck. So <laughs> you, you will love it. It is amazing. We've got some really cool Lego imagine, uh, animations that will really engage you. You will love it. And hopefully you'll see that again next year at the climate action uh, in the project. So without further ado, let me just show you how you can get involved. So Build the Change has a web page and the, the team behind Climate Action Day are gonna link that wherever they can um, underneath our partnership. And you simply have to visit lego.com build the change. Now, be careful when you go on there because if you wanna download uh, some free content, you do have to have an adult sign up for an account just because we use a lot of uploading tools that need an adult's account. So please make sure an adult signs up and downloads and uploads for you. It's not, not um, for you guys to do. So this is how you do it. You visit Build the Change website. You find a bit lower down the page, the download our free educator courses. Nice, nice and simple. It takes you to the next page, even simpler. And there are three there are three lovely courses there for you to download. One is coming soon, one is biodiversity, and the other one is our brand new one, A Future Without Waste, created with our friends at Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Now, please go and check it out. There's some images here from the course. Um, it's a course pack. Everything links out from the course pack. We've got presentations, awesome videos using Lego animation, as I mentioned. We've got workbook loads of stuff polls quizzes um we really want you to get involved but the the ultimate thing that we want from you is coming back to us 
with your ideas that we can then share on global stages in front of politicians, in front of decision makers and make them listen. We need to make them listen more. Good. A little. So this is for those of you in the UK. I realize that might not be that many. There is something coming next week. Do look out for that. Um, we do have a, a big partnership with Discovery Education, which is launching in December. Please look out for that. You'll be able to access that too. And then we have the new course going out in, later in December on human impact. So really exciting stuff. I feel like I should bang the drum. There we go. Otherwise, I'm just holding a drumstick for no reason. Good. So those are. that's what I wanted to share with you. I just wanted to get you excited about where we are and where since we last spoke last year and make sure that you're getting involved um, with Build the Change and getting involved, especially where Build the Change and Take Action Global and Climate Action Projects and Climate Action Day are mashing up together. That's where the beauty happens. Brilliant. Thank you very much for listening. I'll bring... Jen or Cohen back on. Are they there? Let's see. Hey, Jen. Hi, we are guys. here. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. That was awesome. Drumsticks. You delivered. <laughs> we didn't see any uh, mini figures, though. There's always like a, a mini oh, figure. That, oh, yeah. I do have some. Look, look at this. Okay, I'll show you. See one. This is next to my desk. Uh, I always have mini figures. So these are my some of my favorites. I've got, you know, Gremlins, Sonic, uh, Back to the Future. I think ET. Can you oh, see man. ET there? There's some good ones. And then, and then there's 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 me here. Ah, oh, there you have your very own minifigure. I think we've met it's that really, one in a past. Dude, That's so very cool. very very valuable minifigure. But um, how did how did people answer with the uh, the favorite contraptions? Did anyone answer? Yes, a uh, lot. <laughs> <laughs> What was the favorite? Many. But you can still submit your ID here, bit.ly slash BTC build to change ID. Oh, yeah. And uh, keep submitting. Every single one, every single submission goes to my mailbox. <laughs> so if you didn't get any emails back from me during the past weeks, this is because of David. Okay. <laughs> That's, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, David. Uh, Thank we you, really David. appreciate your presence. And Love what you do. Take care, everyone. See you soon. See you Bye. soon. Okay, Jen. He's the What's best. next? All right. So, hope everyone is enjoying your time at Climate Action Day. If you are just joining us, we are live all day long, and we have presenters coming from all around the world to share about their ideas on climate action education, something that we are really excited about. And we get to do climate action education with students and teachers and schools. And we have a few schools that want to share their ideas. This next one we love awesome team from South Korea and their work at Project Planet. So they have some messages that they'd like to share with you all today. Before we share that video, uh, maybe just the schedule, we will be showing one video of students and then we will be having Rachel McDonald from Jamaica. And then we will be having Matt and Oliver from WWF. We're looking forward to that. Coming up, special a new new dress change. <laughs> you never know what you're gonna get every time. We are Project Planet from South Korea. We are Project Planet from South Korea. Let me introduce our climate action project. Since the Industrial Revolution. We have been emitting 1 quadrillion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Our influences to the environment have become catastrophic and a mass extinction is expected in the near future. So, as a small contribution, we are coming up with ideas on this project, Climate Action. I am participating in various campaigns and I'm doing plugging and practicing small zero waste habits. 
I'm posting card news about recycling information, news about environmental problems, and anything which can promote the environmental protection. We help to help animals and nature, and we are trying to help solve climate change. Last August, I experienced flooding in my area, Sotcho. People said it happened a long time ago. My grandma said something like 150 years ago. When I watched the news about flooding, the reporter said it happened because of climate change. I'm making a webtoon about climate change, where I describe what will happen after a climate disaster. I make Lego stop motion animation to alarm people about climate change. I'm designing eco-friendly architecture including sophisticated state-of-the-art green technology. I am also going to interact with other people, such as politicians and other students around the world. I am also going to have an artwork using plastic bottles to prove that plastic can also be art. I'm leading this campaign with my friends cleaning up or Jeju Island. We wish creatures can live in a clean environment. We hope all of you who are watching this video can also participate in avoiding a climate disaster. My desire to protect the planet is getting bigger. I will no longer act oblivious under the excuse that I am young. I believe our small action matters. I believe our collective voices can make a big change. We can make big difference, global friends, with our collective action. In the friendship and solidarity, we now have the message of action to you, our global friends. They were super awesome. Thank you to our friends in South Korea for their message. So up next, we are really happy to introduce you to one of our family members, our team members from Take Action Global, Rachel McDonald, coming to us live from Jamaica, where there is a watch party happening. We have students who are excited, taking action. And Rachel, I know you've traveled a couple hours to get to this school in Jamaica, a country yes. that is facing climate change every single yes. day. And our world needs to hear your messages. I know we're going to hear a little bit later from Minister Samuda. But thank you mm -hmm. for bringing Educator Voice to the world today. So happy to see you. Oh, my goodness. It's so great to join you and to connect with you live, Jen Kuhn and all our friends from across the world here in Montego Bay, Jamaica. So let me just give you a little bit of back end information about Jamaica. Jamaica is a small island that's about an hour and 20 minutes flying from South Florida and about 90 miles south of Cuba. We are, if anybody's looking at Google right now, we are one of four islands in the Greater Antilles in the Caribbean. And I know that many people, when they think of the Caribbean, automatically associates us with the wonderfully beautiful shades of turquoise colored water that you've probably seen on television. But can I tell you something really serious? It's not always like that. It's always, there's always something else to consider. So do you know that there's about 8 million tons of plastic that end up in our oceans? And in Jamaica, pollution continues to be a huge problem. You see, we have lots and lots of waterways that we call gullies that run into the seas and everything somehow ends up in our beautiful Caribbean Sea. We have dead animals, we have plastics, we have solid waste, and we even have old and used appliances like refrigerators. And the problem is that many people live on and beside and in those waterways. And sadly, our garbage collection efforts aren't always the best, nor are our daily habits. But in schools like this school, the Heinz Simonage School here in Montego Bay, Jamaica, and just as a point of reference, they're a climate action school. They're the first climate action school here in Jamaica and they're taking steps the kids are out right now it is break time it's recess so they're playing but we have things like this that we've begun to introduce in this school and in a number of schools in Jamaica these are blue recycling bins so 
if you look down there, some of the kids actually still have plastic water bottles, but all the plastic is discarded here and it's taken to a recycling center so that it does not end up in the sea. Because like me, a lot of the kids here and a lot of Jamaicans love to enjoy the beach. And many of you from across the world come to Jamaica to enjoy our beautiful waters. So with that said, I want to share a little bit about a project that I have been working on in Jamaica to sort of incorporate climate action, education, and also community development. It's called the corner library. And that's our Jamaican slang for the library on the corner. So in Jamaica, the corners tend to be very interactive spaces. The corners in communities, that's where two roads or avenues meet. And there's always a lot of activity there. People hang out on the corner, they read books, they, 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 they get together and connect. And it's often really good for their socio-emotional well-being. So because of what was happening with all of the pollution in Jamaica, I was really, really bogged out. And I probably suffered a lot from the climate anxiety that we hear people speaking about. So what we did was this. We looked at one community and we engaged with all the community residents, with adults, with grandparents, with teachers, and a lot of different aged kids, right? And we decided to reuse and repurpose some of the old refrigerators that often end up in those gullies that then cause major flooding because the water can't flow freely. freely. And then what also happens is that they become breeding grounds and sites for insects like mosquitoes. And then that creates a whole nother level of public nuisance. So we decided that we would repurpose these refrigerators and put them into what we kind of call bookcases. So we would have three refrigerators that are repurposed into bookshelves and we have books that we have for kids for adults and a variety of school resources and school textbooks and what happened is people started to come out and use the textbooks so they literally started to have classes on the corner they literally started to just hang out and read and interestingly enough we have a crime problem in Jamaica and the crime is largely committed by our young males who are between 18 and 25. And guess what? These are the people that have started to use the corner library. And I'm just so happy. The community members are just so happy because we think it is one of the most wonderful ways to bring together not just climate action, which is SDG number 13, but several other ones as well. When we think about sustainability, sustainable cities, when we think about good health and well-being, when we think about a quality education. So ladies and gentlemen and friends from across the world, we just wanted to share that behind Simonid School, we remain committed to climate action through activities like the Corner Library and anything else that we can brainstorm. And my challenge to you today is that you join me. Join me and others across the globe in looking around you at what your realities are and thinking through activities that can begin to drive solutions that are unique to your space. It may not be the same in Jamaica as it is in Istanbul, Turkey, or that it is in, in South Korea, but we are all able to brainstorm and to come up with solutions and ideas that can begin to mitigate this terrible climate crisis. So my last words are that it's now time for us to move from talk and advocacy and to take action for climate education. So lots and lots of love to you all. And thank you for allowing me to share with you. And let me just do a quick selfie. <laughs> ah, got it. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Rachel. We love seeing into your school space and your beautiful home there in Jamaica sharing that out with the world and your message of action. I know you are all about action and you travel around from country to country sharing about that. I loved being with you in September at the United Nations as we oh, talked about awesome. transforming education. And please tell the students who were able to join for our NASA interview earlier that we appreciate all of their inspiration and, and great questions. Jen and Kuhn, they were so excited to participate. I mean, we, we, we are so thankful to be a part of this movement. The kids loved it. But they did have one other question. 
and they just wanted to ask TJ Creamer what this space looks like from outer space. Uh, what a cool question. Well, we, we have him on Twitter, so we can send that message to his Twitter so handle. We, yes, absolutely. We with him absolutely. With we definitely perfect. will. All right, Rachel. Well, we will be back in Jamaica a little bit later with our special guest, Minister Samuda. Yes. But thank you for all that you do every single day and for being a part of our tag family. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure being a part of the Okay. So next, we already announced it we will be having a little bit of magic. There's a teacher called Xuxo in uh, Spain, and he's also a magician. He's using magic to teach, and he has a few tricks for you. Hello? So, can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Hello, Coen. Well, first of all, I need you to think of a car. I have a prediction here. But, uh, okay, but that card is not for this trick, it's for, for another one, because these predictions say that now it's time for the magic. <laughs> well, time for the magic. This is Suso Ruiz, I'm from Spain. I was a Global Teacher Prize finalist in 2018. Um, I'm a teacher and also a magician. So I'm very happy to be with you today in a climate action day um i want to show you some some magic uh that happened in my class a few days ago i was talking about uh, global warming in in my class and then and the students say it depends it depends it depends if uh you see something like so and you see like so it is all perspective and i say hey be aware, be careful about the perspective. And then I show it him this. I tear a, a, a car, okay? And then I say, you have to be very careful because if I put this like so, it seems that it's bigger, okay? Bigger than the other one. But in fact, they are all the same size. But you have to be very careful because things, maybe, sometimes, they are not like you can see. And now, this is bigger, actually, quite bigger than the other one. So, very careful about the perspective. <laughs> um, this year, I'm working with kids, uh, with children, with uh, five, six years old. Um, in the first grade, I teach them math, language, arts. Um, now, I'm going to show you one thing that I made a few years ago, a lot of years ago, when I was six years also. And then I uh, painted my own deck of cards. It was my first deck of cards. Look at this. This is my first deck of cards, I made it. This is the queen, the king, sorry, the king of clubs. But look, look at the backs. <laughs> Four of clubs, look at the back. Ace or ace of hearts. <laughs> look, seven of diamonds, eight of club, queen, queen of diamonds. A lot of uh, cars, they are all different, well painting, well painting like uh, uh, six years old. If I take this car, for instance, the Ace of Clubs, the Ace of Clubs has something, well, you look at the back, it's quite <laughs> beautiful. But when I was a kid, uh, always I was thinking of becoming uh, an adult, and then sometimes I could see the ace of club like adults see wow the not only the ace of club but also the back wow but not only 
the ace of club on the back, but also all the cards I could see like the adults see. Wow. Wow. All the cards, all the cards. You can see, you can see all the cards. But I, I think that we can or we should take care of our inner child and then see the cards like the kids because all have inside a very beautiful child, very beautiful child, that very important belief in magic. So I hope you believe in magic, please. And then if you believe in magic, you will receive this, this magical hug. All for you. Big hug. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me this year. And I hope to see you maybe in a magical place. Bye. That was great. Thank you so much, Xuxo. And next we go to Matt, our friend at WWF in the UK. And Matt has in, been here um, from the very beginning, basically. Um, from the very beginning when we had just like very small and short webinars. So we really appreciate you being part of this, Matt. And I think you brought a guest. I did. We're delighted to be joined by one of our wonderful UK youth ambassadors, uh, Ollie, who's going to say a few words uh, as well today. So it's not just uh, not just me. And we've got a message as well uh, from uh, one of our other youth ambassadors, um, Will, who couldn't join us on the call today. Uh, so you've got uh, three wise men today from WWF. Um, so I was going to start before I hand over to uh, Ollie, just by setting the scene a little bit about WWF's uh, work at the moment. Um, I wonder if I can just uh, have my, my slides up just for a moment. So um, as some of you may already know, uh, this is kind of global news. Uh, one of the biggest things that WWF does uh, is release this uh, very special report every two years, which is called the Living Planet Report. Um, and the reason I'm bringing it up on, on uh, this webinar today is because when you think of WWF, a lot of people, um, you know, know, they know we campaign uh, on climate and we've been involved in the Climate Action Project, as Cohen says, for a few years. We think it's incredibly uh, important. And that's partly because our wildlife um, on our planet, the wildlife we share our world with, um, is a, as affected by climate change as, as we are. So it's something that we have to think about uh, when we're thinking about restoring um, wildlife. Um, but of course, WWF is mainly known for that. We're mainly known for um, looking after uh, wonderful species, endangered species, and trying to make sure that the habitats um, in our planet are looked after uh, and that we have this wonderful uh, diversity of life with us for the future. But they're not separate issues. And the reason I wanted to mention the Living Planet Report was it only came out a few weeks ago. It's always slightly scary reading, and this year is no exception. Um, it comes out every two years. It's not just WWF. It's also the ZSL, the Zoological Society of London. And what it does is it tells us how we're doing in terms of how wildlife is doing on the planet. Um, and um, unfortunately, uh, it's always showing a slightly scary picture of wildlife not doing so well because of human activity. But it also tells a really important story that is what I wanted to, to, to say today before I hand over to Wally. And that's that when we talk about looking after uh, wildlife and biodiversity on the planet, we're not talking about a completely separate issue to the climate emergency. They're actually two sides of the same coin. And so if you're you know, excited about the amazing wildlife that you see in the David Attenborough documentaries and the other nature documentaries that are shown all around the world, or if you love to go out and spend time in nature, but you're worried about climate change. There are things that you can do that are to do with the nature on your doorstep and to do with the wildlife um, that you love um, that is just as important when we think about climate action as working out how you can lower your carbon footprint and maybe travel in different ways. Um, and so there's a couple of things you can do um, as individuals, but there's also wonderful things that you can do as a school. 
And so um, I won't go into the detail on this, but um, there is a youth edition of the Living Planet, Cent uh, of the Living Planet report. Uh, so if um, schools want to pick up on this, uh, you can find this uh, on WWF's website, the Living Planet report for youth edition. Um, and you can dive into the ways that um, our climate um, and the well-being of our planet is actually um, helped by the living things that we share our planet with, the wildlife. If we have a functioning, um, wonderful, diverse life filling our oceans, and if we have healthy forests, we're much like much more likely to be able to overcome the climate crisis. Um, so at the moment, wildlife isn't doing so well. Um, we've had an average drop in the size of wildlife populations around the world of 69%. So that's how much has been lost from the average wildlife population since 1970. So that's, you know, like way more than half um, uh, of, of it has disappeared. Um, and that's really scary, but it's also something we can do something about really quickly, because if you start to help wildlife, you start to help wild places, they can recover really, really quickly if they're given the chance to. And what we want to move from is a world where we're having all of these problems that nature's facing as a result of the way we make our food, the way that we travel, the way that we treat our landscapes. And we want to move to a world where everything works for all people and all nature and for a climate that actually supports life as best as it can. So what can you do? So there's four things I want to leave you with before I hand over to our wonderful youth ambassadors. Um, first, we can make informed choices. So everything you've learned over this last six weeks in the Climate Action Project can help you to know when things that you might have the opportunity to do or to buy or to eat or ways to, uh, to travel, um, you can know whether or not that's something you need to think about, about how it might have an impact on the planet. And that's not to get you worried, not to make you do less, it's just so that you can make the choices between two things, you can make the choice that's good for the planet. The second thing is you can speak up for nature. I think you're gonna hear about that from our youth ambassadors today. Um, and, and if you're uh, looking towards what you might do after school, you can think about how your skills and your energies um, can actually do good for the planet in the way that you actually take your career pathway forward. So what course are you gonna do after school or what? Uh, career are you going to go into? What skills are you going to develop so that you can be a force for good for the planet? And that doesn't just mean thinking about coming into conservation and working for an organization like WWF or, or looking to be a renewable energy engineer. We need renewable, we need uh, people who know, know how to live sustainably and how to act sustainably in law and in um, accountancy um, and in uh, fashion design and in media and everything. And then lastly, we can all do our bit to give nature a helping hand. We've got a wonderful app called Seek, which I've mentioned on previous Climate Action Days, um, which is free. It's available all around the world. Um, if you can get that onto a smartphone like a parent or, or a school device, you can use that to understand your local ecosystem and understand what wildlife is in your local area. You just scan with the app, it tells you what species you're looking at and you can find out more about it. And you can also upload what you find into a global database to help scientists understand um, what, what's happening around the world and what we might be able to do to give nature a helping hand. And as a school, you've got a really special opportunity because you've already got, however small, you've already got a little bit of landscape, a little bit of the landscape that is within the control of the school community on how it's managed and whether it's good for nature or not. And there's some resources on WWF's website, but there's also uh, resources from other organizations that can help you to see how your school can be a force for good for nature. And being a force for good for nature is being a force fighting climate change. Um, so that's really the message I wanted to leave you with, but I'm gonna hand you over to hear some words of wisdom uh, from our youth ambassadors. So I'm going to start just by showing a very short uh, video from uh, one of our youth ambassadors, Will, um, who uh, couldn't join us in person today. It's only two minutes long, and then I'm going to pass over to Ollie, who's got a few messages to share. So let me know if the sound doesn't work. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Will. I'm proud to be a WWF youth ambassador. Young people are the future, but if we don't know the issue the world faces, then we cannot prevent them from happening. Biodiversity and climate change are closely linked, with many species in decline due to the climate crisis, 
As we, show, as we saw in the Living Planet report, everything we love about our world is under threat from climate change. And if we don't do something fast, nothing will ever be the same again. Bluntly, if we don't fight climate change, our favorite animals will die. But there is hope. As shown by people like Greta Thunberg and many others, young people have a voice that people in power will listen to. We have the potential to undo the negative impact of previous generations on the planet and bring positive change to the world. That's why it's important to teach environmental studies and climate activism in schools. So, what can you do to help? Every young person has the potential to, to make a big difference in the world. You can start by campaigning. Is there something you'd like to change about how sustainable your school is? Talk to your teachers. If you want to change something in your town and city, you can write to your local MP and tell them about it. You are tomorrow's voters and they need you. You can even start to promote positive changes with family and friends, encouraging them to walk or take public transport instead of drive, and turn off lights and other electronic devices when they are unused. Although this is small, they all add up to reduce everyone's CO2 emissions. It's up to all of us to fight climate change and save the wonderful biodiversity of the world, as well as ourselves. But we need to teach and mobilise young people today to start taking action. Thank you very much, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm Will. I'm proud to... Thank you, Will. So if we can take Will out of the screen now and I'll hand over to uh, Ollie. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, great to see everyone. So I just wanted just to touch on how essential young people are in the fight for nature and how important it is to educate them. Because why would you not educate young people on the driving force of where they live? Nature feeds us, it sustains us, it supports us. And if nature goes, we go too. And we live on a planet where everything is in such a delicate balance and we are destroying that balance. And every single young person needs to learn what it means to live here, to live on our planet. The planet needs every person possible on its side, especially at this crucial turning point in the next few years. And with as many youth educated and as many youth passionate as possible, we've got more people on our side and it boosts our chances more and more to turn around this climate catastrophe and after school young people will go into every sector they'll go in at every level and if they have the knowledge and the know-how of how we are impacting and how we can save the natural world then every industry will have members that are living consciously about the environment we are nature we are ecosystems but we learn about our history, we learn about our politics, but not as much about the makings and breakings of what actually makes the world keep turning. And while I was at school, I, I was lucky enough to be able to spend a lot of my free time trying to educate and motivate a lot of students at my school. I, I gave lectures, presentations and meetings to about a thousand students. And I do believe that this started to bring environmentalism and the state of our planet into their minds and into the forefronts of conversations amongst them all and at every school everything's such a whirlwind you're so busy and you're so packed all the time that to try and find spare time to learn about this and the motivation on your own is a real challenge so I try to find ways to help students learn without having to take time out of these busy schedules and if you can find ways to teach your peers about nature, you don't have to change their mindsets. You don't have to turn them into environmentalists. You just need to, alongside your teachers and alongside your school, try to teach and just educate students and make nature seem less like this big mystical thing that is a place that you visit, but it's more like it's who we are and it's where we live. And if you can start to change those conversations, then you can start to make more of a difference in the community at your school. There's no longer that same stigma that there once was around environmentalism. Everyone has heard of climate change. 
everyone's heard of biodiversity loss. Through the media, through Instagram, through Facebook, through the news, and everyone is always far more interested than they may first appear. And if you take the time to teach them from the heart about something you really care about and something that affects them and you show how it affects them, they will listen. You are just as inspirational to them as other people are to you. And so while at school, you've got access to hundreds of students with open ears. And if you manage to give a lecture to them, then they will listen. So use your school and use the opportunity and the time you have there to educate and to become an eco leader for these brilliant students that surround you. It's so much potential going on there. Um, that's my message. I really hope you all had a really great day. Absolutely fantastic to be able to talk to you all. And I hope you've enjoyed that. Thank you so much, Ollie. And such an important message that no matter how helpless you might feel or how far away you might feel from affecting the people who you might feel need to be the ones doing the big changes, uh, you know, the world leaders and so on, um, whoever you are, wherever you live, and no matter what your age, you are best placed to influence somebody. There's always some people who are most influenced by you more than anyone else. I think that's a really uh, important message. Thanks, Ollie. Thank you so much, Oliver and Matt. I think uh, a question we often get is from young people who are willing to take action, but they are really wondering how to do that and how to inspire other people. And I think you really answered that question today. Thank you so much. And see you next time. Thanks all. Thanks Bye. Again. Okay. Jen, we have a guest. We have an awesome guest, a great friend of TAG, and many people will remember Jack from Climate Action Day. Last year, he was live from COP26, hurrying around, trying to find a good spot. But it looks like, Jack, you are at home right now, maybe, or in the office. So great to see you yeah. coming from London. Yep, cold London. Um, cold somehow it's London. even colder than Scotland was this time last year. Um, <laughs> a more boring location, but I have brought some um, entertainment with me to spice things up a bit. Entertainment? Well, yeah. we're happy to introduce you, Jack, from World's Largest Lesson, our partners year after year. Thank you to so many of our classrooms, and we'll talk a little bit about ways people can get involved. But in the past few weeks, we've been sharing about a student survey that you all have launched, trying to get as many voices in on the conversation around transforming education and ways we can transform teaching and learning and make sure that students are right at the center of the work. So hopefully, Jack, you can share about that and all the cool things that you're doing. And then uh, Kuna and I don't know about this surprise, so we're like on the edge of our seats waiting to hear too. How <laughs> any disappear? It's magic. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Bravo. Yeah, that was um that was the first half. That was inspired <laughs> by our um our drumming earlier on today. Yeah, David, yeah, David has Lego. drumming. Yeah, exactly. So I thought, why not get involved? That's that's my secret. It's gonna be talent. our new thing. Yeah, I've, I've known about that awesome talent. A little the baby trumpet, and there's another a different horn coming up later on, a, a, a really? big one, a flugel horn. Oh. So that will be how we end this segment. Okay, cool. That's awesome. I've never seen a trumpet that small. Yeah, so it's a pocket trumpet. That's very well. Cool. Thanks so much, guys, and uh, it's really nice to to see you both, um, my my friends from around the world, and to see Rachel as well. Um, so yeah, I'm here to tell you about. Uh, one thing and one thing only which is the transforming education survey which uh i'm really happy to announce more than 1000 students have already taken just from climate action project alone so what is this survey well i can tell you a little bit about it um can i share my screen is that is that allowed general yeah you should be able to mm -hmm. let me see if i can do it let's see try my technology Oh yeah, this looks like it's gonna work. Cool. 
So let me tell you about this uh, survey while I do it. So we at the World's Largest Lesson work with these things, the Sustainable Development Goals, which hopefully lots of you guys know about already. Jen, can you see this that I'm showing now or has it not appeared? Not yet, but I know sometimes it takes a moment. It'd be great to see though, because I know you all spent a lot of time on the design, making sure that it was really great for younger learners, that they could access all the information. Well, what I was gonna share was a picture of the United Nations headquarters, which is in New York, where I met uh, Jen two months ago, which was really exciting. And um, the United Nations, for those that don't know, is a group of 193 world leaders. So wherever you're joining from, chances are the leader of your country is a member of the United Nations. And every year they fly in um, to New York, not very good for their carbon budget. Some of them take a boat like Greta Thunberg did, which was great. And they discuss the big the big issues of the day, whether that be about healthcare and COVID-19, whether it might be about gender equality and human rights, or about climate change, um, which is always a really important issue they talk about. This year, they were actually talking about education, which is uh, a matter very close to my heart and to Jen's heart. And also, I hope to all of the students who are watching this around the world, because education, SDG4, is what you experience every single day. And so all these world leaders were coming together in New York and discussing education. And we noticed something which didn't seem quite right. Lots and lots of adults talking about school and how they could improve school and no children being asked what they think about education, which seemed a little bit suspicious. So we thought, right, we have to do something about this because all of the students who are watching this, all of the teachers who are watching this, and all of the students and teachers that you know have a really good insight about education right now. You might think, oh, I, I really like um, school when I get to learn through play, but I don't like school um, when I get shouted at by my teacher, or I really don't like homework, but I do really like working in teams, or I love learning about climate change but I only get to do it once or twice a year. I wish I could do it all the time, which is exactly what Ollie was just talking about then in his um, amazing presentation. So we've created this survey and that was what was down there on the screen that Kuhn put there. And I think we can put it um, in the YouTube link as well. It's a really quick survey, it takes 10 minutes. And basically you can swipe it, you can reorder, you can do it on your phone or on a laptop or, or on any device. Um, sometimes it asks you what things you like. Sometimes it asks you questions. So the kinds of questions are, how do you like learning? What do you like learning about? And then there's one really big question at the end, which is if you could change one big thing about education, what would it be? And so we're asking with the help of the tag team and Climate Action Project and loads and loads of amazing people around the world we're asking students everywhere so we can create the biggest data set possible of students' views. And uh, currently we have answers from more than 150 countries. We have, uh, I think more than, we definitely have more than 10,000 responses and more than 1,000 just from Climate Action Project, but we want to get way, 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 way more. So if you can access the link, go and go, you can go and do it now when I play, um, the giant flugel horn. Yes. Um, it will take you just 10 okay. minutes and please share it with your friends and with your teachers. And together we can help change education together because all of your views will get taken to the United Nations, um, to UNICEF and UNESCO and to world leaders to say, this is what students think is good about education and how it should change. So I'm gonna sound um, the horn to, to announce that this is your opportunity. <laughs> this is the flugel horn, so it's this the big one. This is the one. moment. That one is bigger.
That was the survey horn. I hope you guys liked it. <laughs> and it didn't destroy your ears. I love it. What? It was perfect. This, we might need to hear the survey horn like month after more, month. This is yes, I think such so. an important time, Jack. And fun fact for anyone listening in, I think these SDGs, these 17 global goals are really close to our hearts because they've kind of been our connecting pieces. I know for me and Kuhn, the SDGs are what originally connected us. And Jack, the SDGs are what connected us. Mm -hmm. And now we are friends and we are working together to make sure that students have a say in this work. So the fact that the United Nations is focusing the whole United Nations on education, SDG four, our goal. We own this goal. I see it, education, and, and they I have all it, care. I have it on my back, Jen. I won't be able to see. Yeah, let's see if you I can turn all around. The... All those, all the SDGs. So you can check those out. You see number four right there, with the red, with the book. So that's our goal. And SDG thirteen, we like cross that poster from SDG four and SDG thirteen to take action for climate. So. We're just so grateful that you were able to join us today and that you come back year after year. We thank you and Allison and Kinvara, your whole team, for all you do every day for schools and with us. We'd love to come back. Well, maybe you will be in Wales next year and then we'll slowly cross off the whole of the UK. I know. We just need to keep somewhere, moving. Somewhere warmer next time. Count us in on that. Well, it was lovely to see you and Thanks, we will talk to you very soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank Jack. You, Jack. Bye bye. Okay, that was great. Hopefully, okay. you will all submit the survey. It's really important um, because it reflects what's going on there, and we need this data. So, Jack, we will be sending it over as soon as possible. So, Jen, um, we have uh, some great speakers coming up. Great. And most of them are in North and South America. Okay. Because this part of the world is awake now. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> um, anything you want to share now? A couple of things. So we've said some of these messages earlier in the day, but we want to keep sharing them as they're really important to us. The first thing is be sure that you are using the hashtag Climate Action EDU with your shares. So we have our community joining in YouTube. They're joining on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and we'd love to hear from you. If you're new to our community, we welcome you with open arms. We're thrilled that you are here. You're going to find amazing teachers on the other side of these accounts that are ready to help share resources, have virtual exchange uh, opportunities with you, and have their students meet yours. The other thing, Kuhn, we need to keep sharing is our awesome app. We have our Earth Project app that we love, and maybe we could share a little bit more about that too. Yes. So when we speak about climate education to teachers, they get it. When we speak about uh, climate education to youth, they get it, as you have been noticing during the past uh, slots, basically. But some people, and sometimes experts, scientists, they don't really see the effect of climate education about what ha you have been doing within the classroom, basically. And I think that's a real pity. And that is why we created our own free app, which is available for iOS and Android. And what this app is doing is really simple and really easy. It is showing you what you can do some really small actions like eating less meat using your phone a bit less um going to school by bike um and so many different actions there's about 25 different actions and when you take those actions you can see uh, the effect of it by the avoided amount of carbon you can even plant a tree and localize the tree in the app. And that way we can see the amounts of carbon uh, avoided. You can even do it in team as well. You can create a small team of like-minded people, which can be you and your friends, you and colleagues at your work, in school, uh, hobbies, whatever you want. 
And after a, sm uh, a short period, you can see the effect of your effort, how much carbon you have been avoided. It's also working for avoiding plastic, uh, single-use plastics. I'm sorry for that. And it's showing you per category what, is ha have, uh, what has been happening, basically, your impact. And there's a leaderboard, and we promise that we will keep working on it for the next months and years to make it more fun. We will add gamification and other new exciting uh, features to it. Please take your phone now. Put that great app on your phone. It's free, and it will show you and, your, and the rest of uh, your environment uh, what you have been doing for the planet, basically. Thank you. Well, that's the end of uh, this event, Jen, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that is not the end. We have a lot to go. We have hours more of great presentations, and we can't wait to introduce some of our next speakers coming up. I know, Kun, where do we go next? What do you think? Huh. Well, I know there's a certain Minister of Education who's really eager to share his message. And that is the Minister of Education of. Let me try to find it. Trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah, of Jamaica. Climate change is real. We are already seeing the impacts and the effects of this threat on our marine life, environment, and physical infrastructure. Caribbean small island developing states are among the countries that are most vulnerable to the effects of climate change with both natural and man-made systems in the regions already suffering from the negative consequences. According to the IPCC report titled Climate Change 2022, impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, around half of the world's population is highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change with those in highly vulnerable regions already 15 times more likely to die due to floods, droughts, and storms compared to regions with very low vulnerability. Jamaica is a part of the SIDS community, and recognizing the existential threat of climate change, we have already advanced our agenda. We have ambitious climate commitments and plans which have been lauded by the UNFCCC. We submitted our first plan called the Nationally Determined Contributions in 2015 and our updated NDC in 2020. We also have an NDC implementation plan, which is detailed analysis of Jamaica's progress toward achieving the emission reduction commitments that we have set out in our NDC. Our first NDC focused on the energy sector, supply and end use, and targeted emissions reduction of around 7%. The updated NDC added land use change and forestry sectors, as well as targets emission reductions of 28.5% by 2030. As we approach the 27th meeting of the Conference of the Parties, commonly known as COP27, we continue to lobby for developed countries to assist through the donation of funds, but also through increased access to and equitable sharing of those funds. We are also lobbying for loss and damage to be formally acknowledged on the COP27 agenda and for financial mechanisms to be designed to address it because for us SIDS, loss of and or damage to physical features and investments are very real threats that we face from climate change. Climate Action Day is a much needed opportunity for students, teachers and leaders from across the world to participate in a global online discussion to share ideas, solutions and innovative projects for climate action. Jamaica will continue to be a leading voice in the Caribbean on climate change, and we support Climate Action Day, where we bring together the best ideas and actions for climate education. Awesome. So, maybe something what we didn't uh, share yet, Jen, is that some people, they do like certificates. Do you like certificates, Jen? I like that people like them. <laughs> I'm always happy to help them if that's important to them. <laughs> yes. But you can claim your own certificate here. That's right. Isn't that cool? We did that's that right. for you. Yep. Yeah. So if, if you want to get that certificate, you can click on that link and 
what can they do? Then they will have to submit their name, email, a little bit of information, not too much, and then you can find the link to the certificate. And we made that for you. So um, this day is not only about great speakers, as in experts and presidents and so many different um, really inspiring people. It's also about teachers and students, what they have been doing. And Jen, who will be our next group of students? Okay, that's right. We do have classrooms who have been joining with us thousands and thousands of classrooms as part of the Climate Action Project. So they've been with us for six weeks. They've been learning about causes, effects, and very quickly they move into creating solutions. So all types of solutions we get to see from all around the world at all different age levels. So we have young students sharing solutions all the way up through university learners. So our last school was in South Korea. So we're going to move across the planet over to Argentina. So excited to hear from our friends in Argentina. Hola. Hola a todos. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcela Vichan and I am an environmental educator at Martin School, a bilingual school located in Lanús, near the capital city in Buenos Aires, Argentina. As it is a bilingual school, we enter the Climate Action Project in English, and these are some of my students who have something to tell you about it. Sure. Working for the Climate Action Project has been interesting and fun. We learn a lot about global warming and how to take action. We also investigate and learn about what Buenos Aires is doing in connection with Sustainable Goal 13. Our city is doing amazing things. We have lots of solar roofs, biking lanes to reduce traffic in the city center, and that's great. Yeah. What I love about this project is that we had lots of beautiful meetings with classes around the world and got to know what other people and other countries are doing to take action. It was fantastic. In friendship and solidarity, we now pass this message of action to you, our global friends. Bye. And next we have a video from India. Kolo kolo darwaze par de karo kinare khute se bandi hai hawa mein likke chhudao sare. Aa jao patang leke apne hi rang leke asma ka shaam aana aaj hame hai sajana. Kyun is kadar hairan tu? मौसम का है मेहमान तू वो दुनिया सजी तेरे लिए खुद को जरा पहचान तू That was a sudden end <laughs> And then we have Poland Hi my name is Amy I am from Kolegium Europejskiej in Kraków and my school has decided to participate in the Climate Change Project to increase our society's attention to climate problems. And this year, we are concentrated on two main issues, energetic crisis and waste utilization. We have already done a discussion about waste to spread awareness on this topic. And in the very near future, we're going to do online and offline meetings with very interesting people about this topic. We're also doing a creative exhibition about how the planet will look like in 50 years if we don't stop climate change. We've also gotten our primary school to participate in this project as well. For the primary school, we've done presentations explaining what is happening in our world, and they've also made posters. Let's save the planet together. Thank you.
All right. That's awesome. Thank you to our friends in Poland. Jen, we have a new guest. So excited for our next session. We have in the United States been watching as this climate conversation has grown over the past several years. So California is one state that really has been leading that dialogue. And we have a special guest here today who has been right at the center of that work for many years. Dr. Kelly Lay is the Executive Director of the Environmental and Climate Change Literacy Projects and Director of the University of California, Irvine Science Project. She is also, which I love this part, the author of a book for classrooms and teachers, Teaching Climate Change for Grades 6 through 12. It is sitting on my desk. It's an amazing book. So I hope that teachers joining today, if you teach in these grade levels, you're able to grab this book and add it to your bookshelf. Hi, Kelly. Great to see you joining from California. Wonderful to have you with us today. Hi, Jen. It's so great to connect with everybody today and to have this opportunity to share more about the initiatives that we have going on. And um, I would love to share my screen. Perfect. So I'm here to chat just briefly about how education can be a catalyst for climate action and wanted to share a little bit about um, the varying initiatives, but I also wanted to introduce myself so that way the students out there who are watching, I hope that my story resonates with all of you as well on how um, my journey progressed into this field. So these are images of me, my kids, my family. And the reason why I bring this up is because I am a first generation scholar. Um, that means I'm first in my family to go to college. And my mother is um, a Vietnam refugee who came here um, many, many, many years ago and started as an electrical technician for a company called Howard Hughes at the time. And um, when she left her home country, she left with really all but a third grade um, education. And so when she came here, it was an opportunity through her sacrifices for us to have um, just a different life. And um, having said that, you're looking at images of me holding my high school diploma. Um, I'm the first in my family to graduate with a high school degree as well. Um, and then me walking across the stage with my two kids who are five and seven, which is why I fight so hard for um, you know, climate action and really thinking about education for the future because it's it's the future for my own children as well. And so having said that, that's just a little bit about me and where I, you know, started my journey really in thinking about uh, climate change education through a social justice lens was in the classroom with teachers and students. And um, I taught for almost a decade in inner city LA where I grew up. So I went back to my own community and you're looking at my wonderful students in Los Angeles and different areas of Orange County as well. Um, I taught high school chemistry, nanoscience and earth science for some time. And, um, you know, I had 180 kids that were my own kids until I had <laughs> the two that I shared about earlier, but that's, you know, that's where my heart is. And that's where I find most of my inspiration. And when I speak to activating agency in students, it's because I've seen firsthand what it looks like when students who are already empowered, right, um, think about what they want to advocate for, think about how they want to make differences in their own communities, which is my own community as well. And so from being a classroom teacher, um, I also then went off to um, support different teachers in California um, in thinking about 21st century science education, meaning uh, thinking about how to teach that would fill the needs of today. And when you think about it that way, you can't negate climate change. You can't um, uh, teach about science in ways that wouldn't then um, address the issues that we are all bombarded with on a daily basis, although some more than others, right, disproportionately. And so for the UCI Science Project, if you'd love to learn more about what we do, we work directly with students, community, teachers, and educational leaders in thinking about what that shift looks like moving into the future. So that way we're evolving as the needs evolve as well. And I'm also happy to share as um, Jen shared earlier that I'm also the executive director for an initiative um, 
that connects uh, all the UCs and CSUs in California to support every California high school graduate as climate and environmentally literate students that are prepared for the workforce, but also informed decision makers, because we know that with the solutions that are needed for today and tomorrow regarding climate and environmental justice, it will be driven by our youth. And so this is an innovative partnership that will allow for us to support uh, new teachers going into the field because our systems educate one eighth of all America, te all of, uh, teachers in America, and um, also teachers currently in the field as well because they're tasked with teaching about climate change, but we need to think about the supports that they get and what that looks like. And um, how do we move beyond just teaching and teaching to again, activate agency? How do you transfer that knowledge? What do you wanna do with it? Um, and then lastly, as um, was, which was already brought up, I also authored a book called Teaching Climate Change, which with a really long title here, but um, it was based off of my dissertation work at UCLA because I wanted to research about how to effectively teach climate change, especially when it is one of the most important issues that we have to think about and communicate about today, but we don't necessarily have the supports needed. And so amazing organizations um, have definitely come together to be able to support educators, but um, how do we know which components are effective, which components work? Um, so that way we can replicate that everywhere and support our educators. So I'm here today to make the case. Um, in short, we need to invest and support in evidence-based PK-12. PK just means pre-kindergarten all the way to 12th grade climate environmental literacy to catalyze climate action and justice. Because again, youth are the future. And we know that you're driving this movement now, but how do we support you with literacy efforts needed to propel you forward, right? How do we support you in moving forward over something you truly care about that you can see the impacts of in your daily lives and around your communities? So just wanted to share some brief information here, but in America, we know that 77% of adults believe that it's the school's responsibility to teach young people about the causes, consequences, and potential solutions to the climate crisis. And this was provided by Yale's program on climate change communication and a little image to show you on the bottom right corner of um, which areas are um, leaning more towards this stance. And you can see it's pretty much um, uh, accepted around the country, but it's not presented that way in the media because it's still politically controversial. So how then do teachers uh, teach about it if they're getting mixed messages? So you can see here how those mixed messages impact what happens in the classroom. So we know that research then reveals today that although we have high support across the country, 55% of teachers will not teach about and still don't teach about climate change and those who do, on average, spend one to two hours on a topic per year. So in America, our classes in uh, secondary levels can range between 50 to 90 minutes, depending on the, the school structures. But one to two hours is essentially one class. That's it to talk about this, um, this urgent large scale crisis. And when we think about that, that in itself sends a message to our students of what we value in terms of the time spent on topics in the classroom. So if we omit it, if we take it out altogether, we're saying it's not that important to talk about. And if we include it, well, how, how do we include it? What do we say? What does that look like? How do we do that along with the current requirements that we have? And also what supports do we have? So although the expectation from the public is it's your job to do this. The reality is we're not sure really how that looks in America, which is why the efforts that are happening now are essential. We need to map the landscape. We need to see where it's working. We need to see what teachers um, are sharing with us are effective components that are working with students to not only learn information, but to take action with what they learn in meaningful ways, in culturally relevant ways. So the solutions are used in those communities. So essentially, we're calling for a reimagination of education to meet the needs and issues and diverse students of today. And there's no greater issue than the climate, climate crisis 
also because it further exacerbates or just makes worse the current inequities and injustices at the intersection, right? It might not cause um, those injustices, but it definitely makes worse a lot of those injustices like air pollution, air quality, when we're thinking about um, different injustices that are happening in the air, on the land, in the water, et cetera. It just makes it even worse um, for those who are already experiencing um, these issues at disproportionate levels. And so we know that we can position students as the drivers of the very solutions we need by first providing them with climate and environmental literacy that will be culturally and linguistically relevant because they will drive the solutions needed for today and tomorrow. So having said that, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to share what's happening here in California. It's definitely not the only place where it's happening. As you can see today with all of our wonderful speakers and the students across the world, it's just time to connect and it's time to amplify each other's efforts. We can learn so much from each other, but we need to center on youth voices. Um, and so having said that, please don't be a stranger. Um, feel free to connect. And again, thank you all so much for today. Um, I'd love to hear from you and I'd love to hear more about your efforts as well. Thank you so much, Kelly. And you are just a connector. I know you started in the classroom and now you're taking that message across California and always so open to hearing from other classrooms in different parts of the world about what's working and the challenges that they're facing. So thank you so much for everything you're doing and for being with us today. Oh, thank you for your leadership as well. Thank you. We'll talk to you very soon. Okay, so we are going to hop from California over to a state that we have been working closely with for the past several years. We're going to be welcoming back some guests who were with us in 2020 when New Jersey became the first state in the United States to mandate climate action education. I still get goosebumps when I say that because this is really a powerful and important. So today we are going to welcome in several guests. I'm going to start by introducing our good friend, Michael Dunley, and he has helped us to keep this message going. He is joining today from his school in Tabernacle, New Jersey, Olson Middle School with his fifth grade students, and they have a very, very special guest, which I will let him do the honors of introducing. So Mike, how are you? Hi kids. <laughs> I'm great. We're so honored to be a part of today's great event. Uh, this is our sixth year participating in the Climate Action Project and the second time that we'll be on the Climate Action Day webinar event. And we are honored, but I would like to first just add that uh, no one works alone. So I am collaborating today with Mrs. Gulick and Mrs. Egan, and we have a student teacher named Ms. Yeager who are also here as well as two homerooms of fifth grade students here in lovely Tabernacle. So I just wanted to give everybody a shout out to let you know who's actually in the room. And it is my distinct and honor and privilege to introduce to the world our governor lady, Tammy Murphy, who is a true champion for climate action change for our environment. Uh, as you mentioned, leading in in 2020, there was a lot of work that was done and we had the honor of interviewing first lady then. And it's so exciting to come back and check in because this is the year of implementation. And what's really special about this year and our time with her today is that instead of hearing my voice, we're gonna be hearing actual students who get a chance to talk to the first lady of our, our wonderful state. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce first lady of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me here. I am so excited and it is great to not only see um, some excellent teachers, we have the best in New Jersey, need I say otherwise, uh, and some of our aspiring students who are going to make be the change makers for the future. Hi, everybody. Everyone say hello. Hi. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Uh, <clears throat> we would like to introduce to you our first question. Come on up. This is my student named Luke. Luke, go ahead. Why don't you say hello to the governor's wife, hello. Mrs. Murphy, and Hi. you can ask her your question. My question is, how long have you been an advocate fighting for climate change solutions? 
Uh, hi, Luke. It's nice to meet you. Um, I have been fighting for this since well before you were born. I can I can promise you that. Uh, I, I uh, lived overseas in Germany in the 90s, and I was really stunned to see an entire country coming together uh, for recycling. Um, that was something that I had never seen before. And and not only did you have to have a, a bag to go to the grocery store, which we are catching up with that here in the United States now, but you had to separate your, not only separate your recyclables, but you had to separate by glass, the color and all sorts of things. Um, subsequently, um, I was asked to be a, um, a charter founding member and, a, and the secretary of Vice President Al Gore's Climate Reality Action Fund. That's the pin that I'm wearing here. Um, and since then, my uh, understanding of the dangers and effects of climate change has only deepened. Um, but like your, like the last speaker, um, um, the, the uh, Kelly Lay, I think her name is, from California, um, my children, our four children, Josh, Emma, Charlie, and Sam, have always been um, my passion, and they are the ones who um, have led me to this point, because I think as a parent, we want to leave the world a little bit better than you found it, and hope that your children can build on that as well. So here in New Jersey, we're doing just that, as I think you all might know. Well, thank you very much, Luke. That was a great question. Come on up. My second question, a student, is going to be Rowan. Rowan? Hi. Um, my question is, how hard has it been to get standards into New Jersey that focus on climate change? Um, nice to meet you, Rowan. Thank you for that question. Uh, I would say I, I started working on this with my team back in 2018. Uh, it wasn't until 2019, um, in the spring of 2019, that I actually made a speech and pitched the Department of Education on um, the, the hope that this might be a reality someday in New Jersey. And subsequently, I have worked um, really carefully with the 130 educators who were enlisted to actually update our state education standards, and they do this every five years. Um, our Department of Education uh, has worked hand in hand to make sure that teachers and superintendents and principals all um, have the tools uh, that they need to help roll this out. And the Department of Education has developed an incredible online toolkit um, in partnership with the Department of Environmental Protection uh, for teachers who are actually looking for more knowledge and guidance. Um, I would also have to give a big shout out. Uh, there's, we have great partners across our state like Sustainable Jersey um, and the New Jersey Education Association and several colleges and universities who have all come together to help us be a leader in the climate change education um, space. And uh, Mrs. Murphy, we also <laughs> collaborate down here. We live in the, in the Pine Barrens. Yes. And we worked with the Pinelands Preservation Alliance the other day where the entire fifth grade was working out on our bioswale, our rain garden, which is also part of the whole uh, effects of climate change. So we partner with a lot of local organizations as well, and it's all because of the work that you've done up there. I'd like to introduce our third student, which is Ava. Ava, come on up, and she's going to ask you her question. My question is, are other states and countries asking you and New Jersey for help in getting their learning standards? Uh, hi, Ava. Um, thanks for asking that question. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, we have had people from uh, Oregon and Wyoming and Colorado um, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania reach out within the United States. And we've even had people from as far away as Australia uh, touch base with us to see how and what we're doing here. Uh, but we are, we're really looking forward to understanding what state will be the second state to work together with uh, New Jersey because we can't do it on our own, as you know. And for our fourth question, it'll come from our student, Jaden. Come on up, Jaden. And I just want to say I'm so proud of our students. <laughs> Come on, dude. My question is, what can young people do to help address the causes and effects of climate change? Okay, well, hi, Jake. Thank you for that question. Um, there are so many things that you can do. Um, I know that in Middletown, New Jersey, where we live, uh, there are a group of students who are currently working with town officials to install solar panels on the town hall. Um, another group closer to our shoreline um, is planting dune grass to protect our shores from rising waters. It sounds like you all have been doing a lot down there um, in the Pine Barrens as well. Um, and and uh, I think under the great dedication of your teacher and the others who are with you, the, the biggest thing you can do 
is really just learn about climate change um, so that you are prepared to help address um, all the effects and, and prevent the causes down the road. Um, but you can, you can be everything you can be and, and more by just being in your classroom and uh, leaning in and, and trying to learn as much as you can. Well, it's um, we we did just celebrate the 10 year anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, which we yes. know and you know hit New Jersey, Middletown. Uh, my parents live in Atlantic Islands, right around the corner from you, and I live uh, out at the shore in Mystic uh, Islands and down in Tuckerton area. And this area got hit hard too. So we're very keenly aware of the impact of climate change, the causes, the effects, but making it part of the curriculum across all subject areas, all grade levels is truly a game changer. And I believe after six years of seeing these children become leaders in their own community that we have a lot to hope for and have a lot of optimism that we might be able to solve this problem if we all work together. So from everyone here in Tabernacle, we just wanna thank you for finding time in your, your schedule to come and really let them know that they, they matter and that they value. Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Hey, uh, Michael, I'd love to uh, come down to Tabernacle sometime and, and actually meet some of your students, perhaps in person, and uh, see all the great things you guys are up to down there. We would love to host you anytime. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for everything you're doing. Thank you. All right. Now they're going to wrap it up. So hold on. <laughs> Thank you so much to First Lady Murphy and to Michael Dunley and his incredible class of students who prepared those questions. So all eyes are on New Jersey. We've been talking about this for the past several years. As Michael said, this is an initiative of bringing climate action education across the curriculum. So it's not just reserved for the science classrooms. It goes into every content area at every level. So all students, horizontal and vertical alignment, able to participate in this important work. So we are so grateful for them to be able to join us today. And our next guest is also helping lead the charge at a district level in New Jersey. So I'm going to be introducing our next guest, Dr. Janet Fike. But before I do that, I'm going to bring on my colleague, Gila Davies who will be coming back in and joining us. So I'll add in Gila. Great to see you, Dr. Fike and Gila. Hope you both are doing well. Oh, we are. This is such an exciting day. We've been watching it and our students were in it. <laughs> they sure were. So if you were on our session earlier with NASA and an astronaut, that was a first for us at Climate Action Day. We had a United States astronaut joining in, and we had three schools joining. So Morris Union Joint Your Commission students were here. They had three awesome questions. And then now Dr. Fike is going to be joining us to share a little bit more about the work you all are doing leading climate action education. I know you're joining us as climate action schools this year. So moving beyond the six-week project to a full year commitment with your students. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'd love to introduce my colleague, Gila Davies. She's going to be back joining us for this interview as well. So Hi, welcome everyone. to you both. Hi, Gila. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Gila and I'm welcoming Dr. Fike. Um, so Jen, are we, would you like to start or shall I go ahead? I'd love to. Thank you so much, Gila. And Dr. Fike, we'll start with a question for you. I know you wear a lot of hats. You have many different roles within the district. You're leading at the state level, at the national level, international level, and you are an advocate of students. But I'd love for you to share. We have students around the world joining, and maybe they aspire to be an educator one day. So maybe you could share a little bit about what being an educator means to you and an advocate of education and all of those hats that you wear. Well, thank you. And, and I want to say hello to our incredible audience um, out there and to Gila as well. Um, I have been in education my entire career. I've either gone to school or, or been in schools working. And it so warms my heart 
to hear that people watching may be interested in joining the profession because I believe there truly is no better profession. If you're a teacher, you touch the heart of everyone you teach. You have the ability to make such an incredible difference. It doesn't matter if you're a teacher of kindergarten and young children or high school students or college students or students who've graduated from college and go to post-secondary uh, college experiences. You have the ability to, to, to shape their thought, to learn and to learn from them and improve your practice of teaching. So I think teaching is just an incredible uh, profession. Um, I have taught special education or been involved in special education my whole entire career. And I'm privileged now to be the superintendent of schools for the Morris Union Joint Year Commission. We're located in New Providence, New Jersey, and we're quite unique. We're a district formed by 30 member districts in five counties, and our role is to provide services to our to our 30 member districts and others in the area of special education. And that may be schools, such as what we have for students with autism. It may be transportation, bus transportation. It may be professional development. It may be after school services. So we have the ability to be at the Morris Union Joint Commission very creative, very dynamic, and very responsive to what the students in our districts need and what the districts would like us to do. It is an amazing school district and we have an amazing charge. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Pike. Um, so as you said, you're living in the state of New Jersey and for all of you in the United States. Um, and as we've just heard from the previous interview, New Jersey was the very first state um, to make sure that students have access to climate education, every age, every subject and everywhere in the state, which is so amazing. And we were very honored to just have the first lady of New Jersey speak at a Climate Action Day. Um, so why has this decision been important in New Jersey and why is it important to you as a leader in education today? Uh, such a great question, such a great question. When we were invited to be part of the Climate Action Schools, I'll be the first to say, I wasn't quite sure where the road was going to take us. And isn't that what life is about? You take opportunities because they're exciting and you're never quite sure where the road's going to go. And, and I can tell you, after being involved in climate action schools and seeing our, and, and living with our standards, um, it is truly what education is all about. As my colleague before me um, so rightly said in, um, in his district, the standards are across everything. There are age bands and you can pop in and out of those age bands depending on, on the needs and developmental levels of your students. Um, it is across math and science. You might think that's where climate belongs, and, and it does, but it also belongs in the arts, and it also belongs in phys ed, and it also belongs in world languages, and it also belongs in creative arts and performing arts and all of that. So you can pick and choose. Um, it's not a standalone. And what is so, so important is that it really is what education is about these days, right? Uh, we're no longer book driven. Learn this book and you've, you've passed the class. It's all about students having knowledge, but being able to problem solve with that knowledge and, and create learning far beyond a textbook. That's what we do in life. When we have a problem, we don't go to a textbook. When we have a problem, we take our wealth of experience, our wealth of knowledge and, and our, our sense of how a problem should be solved, working together with a group maybe, and we solve it. That's what that's what climate action does. That's what the standards do. They encourage, and I say three things. They they encourage knowledge and, and learning. They encourage purpose. It's driven by purpose. It's about our climate, it's about environmental issues, it's about conserving our planet. And it's about relationships. Those three things are our hallmark at the at the DLC at the Developmental Learning Center at the Morris Union Georgia Commission Schools, and it really is is what it means. It's problem solving, education, um, and and learning and standards are all about having productive means of being lifelong learners, mm -hmm. and the standards do that. And and that's to me what education is all about. 
You know, I, I love hearing you talk about relationships, Dr. Fike, because I know with us and, and you took that risk and you said, we're going to be the first school in New Jersey to be a climate action school with us. And I know a couple months ago, we had a hurricane here in Florida and you messaged me and said, you're part of our family here. How are you? We're thinking of you. And I think that's the, the message that we can start with. It's yeah. the entry point can be climate and then we all are rallying together for change. And so as one of our schools for the year, you have two schools there in Morris Union, and they are gearing up for a year of climate education. I know you're committing to professional development. So arming your teachers with the information that they need, because a lot of us did not receive climate education in our pre-service teacher programs. I know I didn't. I think that's changing now for our new students are moving into education, but we'd love to hear what are your students and teachers excited about for this year in terms of climate education? Yeah, well, when, when we first became a school, um, we knew that um, we needed our climate champions, which are our teacher leaders in, in the school. And I have to give them a shout out. Um, Suzanne Schneider and Shirley Perel in our schools, they took the charge and ran with it. So about a week later, I went up to them and said, what are you doing? Thinking they may say, well, we're thinking about, oh, they had it all together. Um, <laughs> one, one, um, one climate champion said, well, we're, we're kind of revitalizing our greenhouse and we're going to do this and it and that. And then the other one said, and we're doing bottle caps and we're showing conservation and we're showing environmental protection. So you know, we have great interest at the local level. It's so exciting to us. Um, but I think even a, a bigger thing and what's so important is oftentimes in, in, in life um, at, or education separately, uh, we, we tend to think of initiatives and we tend to sideline individuals with disabilities or who learn differently or who are different. Um, we tend not to maybe think of the um, the needs for their learning and involvement. And, and this has wiped that away. It really does away with any um, ability barriers or demographic issues or um, interest. It, it is something for everyone. That's what I've said all along. This provides, our climate action schools provide something for everyone. And it certainly allows our students the ability to be involved in a front center issue issue of the century probably um and have meaningful interaction and dialogue and be part of it no matter what the ability level is what no matter what the interest level is no matter what all of those characteristics are everyone can participate in a way we saw that today when our students spoke with the astronauts we saw it so beautifully um, they decided what their questions were they asked them and they they really made a difference and that's what it's all about, allowing people to participate at the level that they are, are engaged with and that they want to participate and allowing them to work as a community. Isn't that what life is about, working as part of a global community? Well, this content just typifies that to an extraordinary degree. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Fike. I think that's such a beautiful sentiment and also I mean I was lucky enough to be backstage watching your students ask the questions <laughs> and it's definitely been my favorite part of climate action day <laughs> um, it was very cute um yeah I mean from from this whole interview I can tell that you are an incredible leader um and as you are leading leaders and leading schools mm -hmm. do you have any words of advice for other school leaders or teacher leaders who are hoping to inspire change at a systems level um like you've been able to do in, with your work yeah um and I'm not sure I've inspired anyone but but uh, I'm let, sure me, you have. <laughs> but let me tell you um what I think is so important it's really two words and that is it's passion. It's loving what you do. Mm -hmm. And no matter it, you're not going to be successful at everything you do. Trust me on that, but loving what you do and, and always thinking creative ways to do it and being involved, but it's also the relationships. None of us would be nearly as successful if we didn't have all of us. And we have an amazing staff that work tirelessly every single day. We have an amazing board of education that is so incredibly supportive. We have amazing parents, our students, so it's working with those relationships and working together and 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 being sincere in our outreach and 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 really wanting to work as a cohesive whole i think passion and relationships 
are all about what motivates certainly me and probably everybody. It's beautiful. And I think your message today too, of everyone can be a part of this work. And for us, our mission is climate education for all and ensuring that anyone and everyone can be a part of this work. So we are so thankful for everything that you're doing. You are, I have to say, probably the most responsive person I've ever met in my life. We send an email and you were right there, ready to go with responses. So I don't know how you do it. You probably don't sleep at all, but thank you for welcoming us into your beautiful world and, and sharing moments with your students, with us. We are so excited to see what we do this year together. And we'd love to welcome you back next year so you can share yes. on the progress and yes. everything that your students did and learned. One final thing, how can yes. others follow along? So we have other school leaders, systems level, country level that would love to learn about the work you're doing. How can they connect with you all at Morris Union? Okay, um, through our website, which is www.mujc.org. We also have Facebook and Twitter and that's our world. It's like our closet. If you go there, you're seeing everything we're doing. <laughs> it's all out there for everyone. We love that transparency. Well, we will talk to you very soon. I know we have okay. a climate champions meeting next week with your two awesome climate champions. Yep. Please congratulate your three students for their I awesome will. questions and your team there behind you that's been helping throughout the day. So we'll talk to you very soon, Dr. Okay. Fike. Thank you, Hila. Thank you so much. Bye, Hila. Soon, Bye, everyone. Everyone. All right. Okay. Kuhn, Wonderful. that was quite uh, an hour action-packed uh, California to New Jersey. Can't wait to hear where we're heading next. Yes. Well, next we will be having this Sir Bob Reagan from Gates Ventures. We're really excited to have him. And um, I will not be the one asking him questions, Jen. <laughs> For that, we have our friend... Riley. Hello, everybody. Hello, how Riley. Doing, how are you doing? Now we're going to hop over to Michigan. How, how's wonderful. the weather there? <laughs> it's actually gorgeous today. Oh, wonderful. It's so good to see you. What people don't know is that Riley, Jen, and I are meeting every single day. <laughs> sure are. A lot. And um, yeah, it's great to have you on the event now, Riley. Wonderful to be here. Okay, so um, hi Carla, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? Well, a bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Carla, we really appreciate your work in Switzerland as well. You have been working with the German part of the project. So a big thank you to you as well for that. My pleasure, it's always an honor to be a part of it. Okay. So let's bring in our friend, Bob. Um, hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Okay. So I will leave and um, I will leave it to Riley and Carla. Wonderful. Thank you, Kun. Greetings, Bob. I'm so happy that uh, you could be with us today. Um, I'll give you a little bit of introduction then give you an opportunity to share anything that I missed. Um, but Bob is the Senior Director of Education at the Gates Ventures. Uh, he divides his time between building products, advising education, and other efforts to think about the future of education. His efforts include leading the Big History Project, the World History Project, and Climate Project. Bob began his career in the classroom as a teacher in Chicago and New York City schools. He earned his master's in elementary education from Columbia University Teachers College, and he focused his research on performance assessments. Bob has previously held product leadership roles at Macromedia, Adobe Systems, and Pearson Education. Welcome, Bob. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's about that's the, that, those are the important highlights. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the Gates Ventures is the private office of Bill Gates. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is a separate org, focuses on systemic change. Uh, in my with my remit within Gates Ventures, we look at uh, smaller scale projects. We operate a little bit more like an innovation studio. What does it mean to create great curriculum? How do we help teachers be successful in implementing that curriculum? And um, 
how do we work with state and national partners to help support that kind of implementation where, you know, at the end of the day, the single biggest impact on student outcomes is teachers and doing everything we can to support our teachers. That's amazing. And kind of to, to pivot from that, I just wanted to ask you a question about, you know, before we dive into more of the work that you're doing with the Gates Ventures um, and work with school districts and organizations across the world, uh, I'd love for the classrooms from around the world to get to know you a little bit. And with your career and background in classroom teaching and classroom education in America's biggest cities, how has that work informed your work today? Is there any specific moment in the classroom that you can recall that was significant in the trajectory of your career? Uh, you know, it, it, it's a lot easier, I think, in my experience to take a teacher and help learn to um, to build tools and resources for classrooms than it is to take somebody with an MBA and help them understand the classroom, right? And um, and I think that constantly keeping myself rooted in the classroom is is critical. Um, having teachers around us all the time is critical. Uh, you know, I uh, I think that in particular in climate where you know at times these conversations can be a bit turbulent. Um, I'm reminded of my own youth, um, you know, a million years ago, uh, where I was uh, a first year teacher. And I had a really great principal who um, handed me a book by Jonathan Kozal called On Being a Teacher. And, you know, I had a very passionate, like, I'm going to speak truth to power. And sometimes all that got me was some angry parents. Um, and so thinking about how to create a respectful civic dialogue at the same time, not, not stepping away from my ideals. And I think in a lot of the work that we're doing when we're developing uh, resources for the classroom, we're thinking about how do we help that first and second year teacher shorten the distance to the sort of seasoned veteran that, um, and all of the tools that they have to, to have these kinds of conversations. We need them now more than ever, particularly in a topic like this. And, you know, given the current environment, you know, one of the things that we really have to remember, a friend of mine, Deb Morrison from the University of Washington keeps reminding us, the parents are with you. And so we shouldn't isolate ourselves from our parents. Um, most of the parents uh, agree and are, are focused on climate as a concern. Those that don't are often just, demotivated. Um, it's a very small portion that's, that's highly engaged and disruptive. And, um, and so oftentimes our best allies in helping to have these conversations are other parents. And so I think we need to remember that. And, uh, and, and so, you know, because that if it only takes one really angry parent to make life very hard for a young teacher. And so we have to we have to enlist the help of our other teachers, our administrators, and other parents. I'll hand it over to Carla. <laughs> yeah. So um, Bob, I'd like to change the direction a little bit. So in terms of looking at your work at the Gates Ventures, um, I know that the Gates Ventures they fund some of the most amazing programs and organizations from across the world. But through your world, uh, role as a director of education, personally, I assume that education is kind of always central in your mind somewhere. But I'd like to ask you, how does education and specifically climate education, because that's where, what we're here about today, act to inform the practices, uh, decisions, as well as the mission of the work that you do on a daily basis um, at Gates? Okay, so... Um... Yeah, and I think that, you know, we're not a grant-making organization, like I said. I mean, we, we operate as a, as a bit of a studio. And, you know, um, when we started, we had this course called Big History that, you know, um, that we were looking at. And it's, it's, a, it's a history course that starts with the Big Bang and ends with the future, right? There are no state standards that require that course, um, there are, there's not an hour in the day to teach that course, but we've gone from eight schools in our initial pilot program to 3000 last year. We're on track to hit 4,000 schools teaching it this year, keeping in mind that there are 40,000 
schools in the United States, high school and middle schools. So as we started to really focus the office's energy on climate, one of the questions became, how can we make climate have that hour in the day? And so one of the first things, the easiest thing for us to do is to write a curriculum. And it's an important thing to do. And so in thinking about that, I went back to an experience that I had as a, as a high school senior. I was something of a challenging student when I was young. And so my English teacher, um, to try and corral my friends and I, came up with a project where he said, okay, so we're going to give each group of you a challenging topic. My topic was the death penalty. And they rented out the community center in town and they put us all around picnic tables and they gave us muffins and juice. We never got muffins and juice. So we thought this was the greatest day of our lives. And so, um, and, and, you know, here I am 30 plus years later thinking, ah, that was such a, that was one of the, like the marquee experiences for me as a kid. Thinking about climate. Now I have the challenge of how do I create a curriculum that is going to get at some of these big issues and go beyond the sloganeering and the um, in, into really thinking about what are the things that we can do? How do we enlist kids in a program that can actually bend the curve towards net zero and really have a positive impact and not celebrate the things that are so small, they're not going to make a difference anyway. Um, and so we thought about looking at each of uh, the, the major sources of greenhouse gas emissions and pull together uh, samples, you know, snippets from community action plans around the world and say, okay, so from your community, young person, what can be pulled in and what can you advocate for? Uh, the other thing that we did in terms of the curriculum is there's so much that is not solved. We don't have a solution for cement, which represents 13% of greenhouse gas emissions right now. Um, we are going to need something that will allow us to operate in high energy manufacturing, steel and glass, as well as cement. Um, and so we're going to need more kids going into material science, high energy physics, um, to help us solve this problem. And it's no longer just an academic pursuit. It's a grounded pursuit that is focused on issues that they see in their own community. So in terms of creating that, um, that kind of curriculum, that's the first step. Uh, I am so glad and so honored to be on the same uh, agenda as uh, First Lady Pam Murphy from New Jersey. New Jersey being the only state in the nation that requires climate education in the social studies. And this is like one of those things, whenever we talk about climate education in social, um, in the humanities, you know, invariably someone will go, well, we'll introduce you to the science folks. And I, and you know, we are seeing traction in science. The science classes are teaching kids what's happening. What are the mechanics? What, are, what, what kinds of things can we do? But in, um, in the social studies class, when we look through more civic education, we have the opportunity to invite kids to help in answering the question, what are we gonna do about this? What are some of the specific practices that we can put into place? And finding that hour in the day is one of the big challenges. Uh, you have uh, the state of Washington, which has a requirement for something called contemporary world issues. Uh, that's the only requirement so that the topic be contemporary and an issue. Um, so climate fits there, but it's not, it's not specifically focused on that. Uh, in the state of California, we recently funded the development of a climate education curriculum to the tune of about $5 million, which is, which is substantial, but there's no requirement that it be taught. So is that going to get us? Is that going to help advance? Is that going to help move things forward? So we have to operate at, um, at all of these levels at the same time in thinking about what is the curriculum? How do we help the teachers be successful in implementing that curriculum? And how do we help uh, school leaders and leadership find the hour in the day where that those questions can be explored by the kids? That's wonderful. And you know, as us with TAG and members of this community, we look at climate education as a way to transform education in a general sense. Yeah. Um, to make it more equitable and reflect the needs of learners. 
So what do you think about this year? Um, you know, we have implementation in New Jersey. We have other states that are starting to make a difference and make changes around climate education. Do you think this is the year or this is the time that innovation is coming? I've got it. I would love to be able to say yes. Um, I really would. But I think that we're, we're fighting, uh, an, you know, we're fighting a number of headwinds uh, uh, in that at the first level, just trying to get attention. Uh, this, is, this is critical. It cannot wait. We do not have another year. We don't have more time to think about this. You know, um, and there is so much happening in schools right now. You know, it is not uncommon for us to hear from teachers. I just don't. It's just one more thing. It's one more thing on me. And, um, and so I worry about that because there's a, there's, a, there's a real kernel of truth to that. Coming out of the pandemic, what have the teachers been, um, what have the teachers been through? Are they prepared to take this challenge on? In an environment where everyone's really worried about the, um, the weaponized right and, and creating disruption and distraction in school board meetings in the classroom, um, how are we gonna get these kinds of topics? Uh, on there. So I think that um, the, now that said, it is far, I don't mean in any way to be uh, uh, dismissive of anything or, or, or more than, you know, anything less than totally dedicated to keeping the conversation going. Um, and I think that we have to keep pushing. But I think if we believe that like all the pieces are coming together, I think we might be missing the larger picture of the political landscape that we're operating within. So I have one final question for you today from my side, um, which in, I mean, as you're leading and driving the mission of educational equity and climate education, of course, across the whole globe, um, I'd like to ask you, are there any pieces of advice that you would like to give to our students, our teachers, um, the leaders listening today, our community in terms of making long lasting and meaningful change within everyone's own community? I, I think that, um, and again, I, I realize we're over time, so I'll, I'll try and keep this as brief as possible. Um, the, the, to the extent that we can take something that seems like a far off challenge, whether remote in terms of time or remote in terms of place and make it immediate, I think we're, be we're, we're, we're better served. I think by looking across your community and bringing in disparate stakeholders into the conversation, you know, it shouldn't just be those in power, but how do we look at whose voice has been excluded and bring them into the conversation, create those opportunities for those kinds of voices. I think that's also critical right now so that we, we build universal buy-in to, to uh, what's happening as opposed to just further disenfranchising groups that have long been pushed to the side. I'd just like to say thank you so much, Bob, for your time today uh, and your, your wisdom. Uh, we look forward to continuing the relationship with you and, and have you back again. I, I, I really appreciate it. It's been a real pleasure and best of luck with the rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Bye now. All right. Thank you so much, Carla and Riley. Let's bring in Jen. <laughs> and we can have a meeting. Wow. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> Our Love weekly it. meeting right here with the world. That was a fantastic <laughs> conversation. I know I was receiving messages last night with classrooms. We had a class in New York that has been following along with Bob and his work. Knew him back in his Adobe days and then now doing work with him at Gates. So they were watching. So shout out to that school in New York with Tim Needles. But thank you so much, Riley and Carla. That was a fantastic interview and we still have a few few more sessions so we are not anywhere near, near done yet correct because next we will be having uh, Vladislav Kaim and we also will be having our new member Ayanfe uh, from DAC who will be running the interview so welcome to you both um, hi Vladislav how are you you're still on mute, I think. Yeah. Uh, Vladislav. And uh, Ayanfe, we are not able to see you at this stage, but I think we can hear you. 
How's this? Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. Thank you so much. But can you see me? Uh, not yet. No. no. Is my video visible? No, at, at this stage, uh, it isn't, unfortunately. No, it's black. Yeah. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, yeah. But we can hear but, you, which is fine. All right. So, um, yeah. Go ahead. All right. Yeah, I, uh, um, I'm uh, apparently having some connection issues, but I hope you can hear me. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. I leave it to you. Hi, Vladislav. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, yeah, so my name is I Am Fair, everyone. Um, thank you, likewise. Calling... Yeah, thank you, too. Uh, I'm calling from Kigali, Rwanda. And yeah, um, I'm a student here. And I'm originally from Nigeria, um, down in West Africa. And um, yeah, it's a pleasure to have you at this event, Vladislav. And um, as an economist and a passionate youth activist for green and decent jobs. What do you think is the role of education in tackling climate change? Education to me is the pathway to first and foremost awareness because everything starts with it. But apart from that, it is also a very, very important way to understanding what your concrete specialty is and how you can hone in on it to make the most impact, to make the best out of the skills that you have and you are going to gain. So to me, education is uh, this highway on two lanes, the lane of awareness and the lane, the lane of specialty uh, on which you need to move both on the way to being the most efficient in making your impact uh, in climate, but in climate action, but it also can be applicable in other spheres as well. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, as a segue to that question, um, the the second question is um, like to globally, the cost of clean energy has been falling over the past few years, right? And uh, that's that's great news, no doubt. I've grown up in sub-Saharan Africa for the most part of my life, um, specifically Nigeria. And um, green technologies like solar panels are still expensive to, to purchase and operate for, especially the working class. With that in mind, how, how can developing countries make the shift to a greener economic system since the majority of people there have trouble affording green technologies? Well, uh, this is uh, one of the issues, for example, on the agenda of uh, the COP27 climate summit that I'm currently at right now, and which will be starting in a few days. But if in, if we look at it in broad strokes, first and foremost, we need to understand that uh, this is not uh, entirely possible without outside help. Uh, developed countries need to step up uh, yeah. to provide finance for uh, such an important transition because clearly the scale of the challenge especially if we're talking about sub-saharan africa we are talking about approximately 600 million people to have uh, no access to any kind of energy let alone the clean one mm. uh, so we need to take into account uh, this one as well this parameter as well um, so for example in this case the negotiations on the climate finance uh, new climate finance goal that are going on uh in the un uh, climate space right now are very important because they actually laid the foundation of a potential success or failure of international effort to bring developing countries on board in the green energy revolution and into mass consumer adoption there uh secondly there is of course homework to do uh, for the all levels of authority in developing countries uh, where possible uh, it is important to clear all red tape and regulatory hoops that uh, cost have real cost for people who might want to adopt uh, various forms of clean energy to be their main source of energy at home but cannot do it uh, so we need to make sure that um, our permitting systems work for innovation in clean energy and don't stymie it and uh, this is also the case for developing countries 
we need to make sure that consumers face a transparent market with clear rules uh, where it's intuitively understandable even for the person in the most remote community what are the costs what are the benefits to make an informed to make an informed decision about why it's important to move to say to solar for example compared to the situation that they have right now and this is something that only national and local governments could do no, uh, no one else will do it for them yeah, I agree. Um, there needs to be equal participation in in situations like this, so that you know there's you know collective growth and um, progress. Um, yeah. So it turns out that I forgot to introduce Vladislav, and Vladislav, I really apologize for that. Um, to audiences listening from everywhere across the globe, um, Vladislav Kaim is a young Moldovan economist and climate action and advocate, um, sustainability advocate with vast experience at the UN level, as well as on multi multi multiple national and local platforms in Eastern Europe region. His main fields of advocacy have been green jobs for youth, just transition, green and sustainable economic growth, and reforms to the multilateral climate finance agenda. In July 2020, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres appointed Mr. Kaim to be one of his sev seven youth advisors on climate change and to oversee the implementation of his climate strategy. Vladislav is also the contact point in Green Jobs at Yonko Official Youth Constituency to, to the UNFCCC and 2021 IMF Youth Fellow. Yeah, so that's Vladislav's bio. Um, so Vladislav, um, my third question for you is that given your experience in political discourse around climate change as a young adult, how can youths around the world participate in political discussions around climate change in their respective nations? There is no stronger tool in uh, my understanding and in my experience than voting for you what believe in. This is the strongest weapon that we have uh, in uh, our hands and in our minds and of course uh, running ourselves for office um, and uh, having and creating that ecosystem of support that will enable those whom young people elect and elected young people to thrive and to create meaningful change for their fellow young people to increase their trust in democratic systems in climate action and in education yeah thank you for that and a final question before we go um, how can how can we encourage youths in developing countries to get more involved in the fight against climate change? Because I'm from there, and it's it's uh, it's a bit different. It's a, it the, the atmosphere here is a little different than it is in the West. So, how would you encourage youths um, in developing nations to just you know get involved? One key thing: bring information to them in the languages that they are the they are the most able to understand. We kind of assume by default that we live in an English centric world, but there are so many people in communities out there for whom this is not the first language or not even a language they speak at all. You cannot engage if you cannot get the information and create the basis for further aware for the need for further awareness and engagement. So this component is crucial in my perception. Yeah, thank you for all those brilliant, brilliant um, points and message. Thank you so much, uh, Vladislav, for sharing your uh, expertise. Um, really a shame we were not able to see Ayanfe, um, but he's our newest member to tech. We are really happy with you, uh, Ayanfe. Thank you. Um, it's really great to have your voice as part of the team. And Vladislav, thanks again, and see you next time. Bye. Bye. And now we are really happy to have Esther Wojcicki. Esther uh, has like a bio. If I had to read it, it would take me like forever. Um, she's a really inspiring uh, woman. She has been doing a lot in, within education. And um, I think it would be great to hear from you, Esther, about your last initiative um a really exciting uh new tool and how it relates to climate as well and uh, the floor is yours thank you 
So thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm very happy to be here. So I think that the future of the country or the future of the world lies in the hands of the youth, young people, because they're the ones that are going to be taking over, you know, in 10 years or even five years. And we face a lot of climate issues at the moment. So what I did is with one of my former students, I created a platform called Tract, T-R-A-C-T dot app, A-P-P. And it's free and open to kids everywhere around the world. It is in English now, but it can also be in any of the languages you want it to be in. It's where older kids create learning for younger kids. And we have a whole section devoted to climate. And of course, the reason we do that is because climate is so important. We won't need to worry about any of the other things if we don't solve the climate problem. Um, so I would like to invite you to check it out. As I say, it's T-R-A-C-T, tracked.app. Even though it says app, it's not an app. It's an on-the-web program. And um, I, I think it's very important to empower the kids to come up with solutions that might be used in particular their area of the world or it could be used for the whole world, but we really need to come up with solutions. And the kids have the most creative ideas of all. And it's because they're not, they haven't been educated out of those creative ideas. So I would be very excited to invite them and invite your teachers, invite um, leaders, anybody that would like to participate. And we're adding to our program every week, we add new functionality. So if you have suggestions that you think might help, you can email me at Esther, E-S-T-H-E-R, Esther at tract.app. And I would be thrilled to hear from you and whatever we can do to help it work for you. So, um, that's, that's my message. And um, if you have any questions, also feel free to email me those questions. Or I don't know how much time we have right now, but um, perhaps if you have questions, I would be happy to answer those questions. Okay, great. great, great. So please, everyone, uh, you can send your comments and your questions to Esther, and she's really happy to receive them. So thank you so much, Esther, for sharing about tracked.app. It's a great tool, and I think many people are going to use it. I have one question, though. So people call you the godmother of uh, Silicon Valley, and I know that you're so much more, um, but what is it that um, you think should be different within education? I know that you have a very strong opinion for this. So I, I also know that you have to go now. So just for like one minute. Yeah. So what I think needs to change in education is I think students need to have more control, more power. Right now, the teacher has all the control. They tell you what to memorize. If you don't do it, you get a bad grade. And so the students have no ability to be creative or think outside the box. My suggestion is that they use tracked for 20% of the time in typical school. And if 20% is too much, 10%. But right now, there are 0%. Kids don't get any opportunity to be independent thinkers. And we cannot solve the problems of today with the answers of yesterday. And that's what we're trying to do. We have kids memorizing all the answers of yesterday, and then they're trying to apply it to problems today, and it doesn't work. So um, I recommend more student control, more student agency, and giving them an opportunity to work collaboratively, like with each other. That's where all the learning takes place. It takes place in collaboration. If it was such a good idea to line everybody up in a row and not have them talk, then all the companies of the world would be lined up in a row and the people wouldn't talk. So if you go into a company today, you see people collaborating and talking to each other and working in groups. Why don't we do that in schools? I have no idea. Um, it's just historic. And so this is what I would like to see change for the 21st century. And thank you very much for including me and including my very strong ideas. And I can tell you they're based on 
years, 40 years of experience in the classroom. And that's how I got that title, Godmother of Silicon Valley, because so many of my students became incredibly successful. It was like crazy. So the rest of the world, you too can be really successful if you stop memorizing the answers of yesterday for the problems of today. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for being who you are to all of those students. Um, thank you so much. And what I take away is that collaboration is key. Thank you so much, Esther. You're welcome. And I'm very happy you invited me. Thank you so much. Take Bye. Bye. Okay, Jen. That was exciting. Yeah. That, that was a great session. Thank you. So the end is near. But we still have a lot of students. But we also have Ayan Fei. <laughs> and his camera is working this time. So That's we are really great. happy, Ayan Fei. You may be frozen, but still we wanted to make sure that everybody is able to see you. And thank you so much for uh, that interview with Vladislav. It was my pleasure. Hi, everyone. Okay, so Jen, um, let's take a look at some more videos. Um, Great. I have a question for you. Okay. Which was the last? I know the answer students? to this question. Ah. I'm ready for the answer. So last off, we were visiting our friends over in Poland, which means we are now going to hop back over to the United States to Evergreen Middle School to see our friends, Julia and her students there. I'm Jumbo. I'm Virginia Mwangi, presenting from Kenya at Syllabus Secondary School. As a school, we have taken the issues of climate change with a lot of seriousness. First, we have created awareness to our school community on what climate change, its causes, effects, adaptation measures, and mitigation measures as well. Second, we have narrowed down on one of the mitigation measures of climate change that is planting of trees. Since we began the project, we have able to prepare about 10,000 surplus tree seedlings. We have planted 700 trees in our school, and the last we have been donating to school within Nyandara County. So far, we have managed to donate and take part in planting trees in about 20 schools. As a school, we would wish to encourage all learners and educators to take part in planting trees and also make a school-wide commitment to climate action. Finally, 
I wish to thank our teachers, the school administration, and Take Action Global for giving us an opportunity to acquire this vital information and be part of our change. Let's not forget that by planting trees, we plant seeds of hope and peace. The little things we do matters a lot, and more so if done repeatedly. Our little thing as a school is planting more and more trees. Hope you'll join us in this cause. Thank you. In friendship and solidarity, we now pass this message of action to you, our global friends. Thank you. That was a message from Kenya. Next gen, we have a message from Turkey. Okay. <laughs> and next we have the US. Hi, my name is Emmett O'Brien and I go to DePaul College Prep. Hi, I'm Rachel and I go to DePaul College Prep. Hi, I'm Isabella from DePaul College Prep. My name is Jack Hosty and I go to DePaul College Prep. We, we are, are DePaul, DePaul College Prep, Prep in, in Chicago, Chicago, Illinois. Illinois in the United States, States of America, America and welcome, welcome to, to our garden. At DePaul, we have been working on growing a regenerative garden on our urban campus, composting, seed saving, and cooking with what we grow in the garden. We're also working on reducing the number of plastic water bottles used in our school. Please join us in eliminating single-use plastics by using reusable water bottles instead. In friendship and solidarity, we now pass this message of action to our Hi everyone, I am Sai Ifono, a teacher at Patrice Lumumba in Guinean Elementary School that I'll also attend years ago. Located in Kekedu City, the above tree is very historical and it's been here for more than 100 years now and it has been very advantageous for the school and the community as a whole because it protects our environment. And without this tree here, high winds could have caused huge damage to our school's building. For sure, this tree is very historical and I hope it will benefit our own own children. Thank you very much. Mangrove swamp restoration done by women along the Guinean Atlantic Ocean. From Gikedu City, Muritundu Feduno, Kappa Ambassador, Kine Konakre, West Africa. That was a message from Guinea. Our next speaker is a professor in Brazil, and he is called Alexander Dura, and he is a professor at the Oceanographic Institute of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. So I'm really excited to hear from him. Hi everybody, I am Alexander Turra, professor of the Oceanographic Institute of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And I am also coordinator of the UNESCO Chair on Ocean Sustainability. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the relationship between the ocean and the climate, but also the relationship between the climate and the ocean. And how this relationship is mediated by us, individuals, society. The ocean has a strong role in pushing and shaping the climate. I will give you two examples. The rain, the patterns of pluviosity around the world is governed mostly by the ocean, the water that is in the ocean and that evaporates uh, and will reach some parts of the world, but not others. This pattern is changing and may cause strong uh, consequences on the crops we produce, on the food we need to produce to, get, to have food security around the world. So we are also talking about the role of the ocean 
in removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this causes uh, a very important uh, effect that reduces the greenhouse effect and makes the atmosphere less warm than it could be or would be if the ocean uh, didn't have this, this role. So it's important that we understand this because if the ocean is not healthy or it changes, these benefits that the ocean provides to us will, will not happen anymore or will change. And this is problematic because the climate changes or the changes in the climate are also putting pressure in the ocean. Uh, the capacity of the ocean to regulate the climate is being uh, changed, is being difficulted by the changes the climate is pushing into the ocean. So it's, it's extremely complicated because as uh, the temperature of the atmosphere increases, the water the temperature of the water of the ocean also increases and we may we are facing uh, heat waves in, in the atmosphere and also in the ocean that causes deaths in the biodiversity or causes changes in the distribution of organisms in the ocean which, which have uh, problems related to fisheries to invasive species that also impact the biodiversity and then um, we have a very big challenge to face. Another example of the effect of climate changes in the ocean is ocean acidification, because the, uh, the carbon dioxide that the, the ocean uh, removes from the atmosphere is changing the pH of, of the water of the ocean. And this has extremely uh, worrying, worrying problems uh, to the biodiversity, especially to the organisms that build skeletons based on calcium carbonate. So considering this, uh, this situation and the possibility to uh, have it uh, uh, being worsened in the, in the future, we need to take action now. And action means we need to act as individuals, but we also need to act as society, as a world. And this is what we are trying to bring to, to the students, to the schools, to the youth, so that we can have an opportunity to bring the discussion, this discussion about the climate, about the relationship between ocean and climate, promote ocean literacy, and uh, together with school teachers that, that need to have um, their capacity being uh, constantly um, uh, um, updated, but also with different types of resources like videos, books, uh, and, and tools, so that we will have the possibility to uh, capillarize this uh, these discussion in, in the schools and bring the youth uh, to this uh, arena where we need to discuss the causes of this problem, understand the consequences and act, changing what we are doing as individuals and changing what we are doing as society, influencing decision making and taking part of this huge responsibility to shape the future and to promote the sustainable development. Okay, great. So for the rest of today, we still have um, messages from students left. We have a very special message from the UN. And we also have Regina from Mexico, um, who is going to share a very short message. I would say another 30 minutes. I think so too. An ID. But also Jen and I would like to share a few things. Um, Jen? We have some updates, don't we? We do. Awesome. I think it's good to know that this is not the end um, of today, but also of our work. Um, it's good to know that we are going to be back next year with Climate Action Day and Climate Action Project. So marking our agendas that we will be back with the Climate Action Project on September 25th. Climate Action Day, our event, 
November uh, 2nd. But we have been doing more than that. I think we have been able to go to the next level this year and we try to do this every year. And so we also have a new thing uh, because we have been listening to you and we had two comments which came back from you as a teacher and students a lot. And that was like, we want to do something which is more than just six weeks, a few weeks. And also, um, we want to be trained as a teacher. We want to be certified. So, Jen? That's right. So, you know, several years ago, we had schools joining. There maybe was one teacher, kind of that forward-thinking risk-taker who cared about the planet and wanted to bring this new idea of climate education into his or her classroom. And then that excitement spread. So maybe it wasn't just one teacher, maybe it was several teachers and then full schools, as Kuhn mentioned, coming to us and saying, we want to commit to this in everything that we're doing. We wanna have sustained commitments, year long, full school, bringing in professional development for our teachers. So we have been hard at work on building this out over the past 18 months. We piloted it with schools last year, and this year we have our new Climate Action Schools program. So we have been working with schools for the past six months, doing interviews, and we are kicking everything off right now with schools from around the world. A hundred global schools, and we have room for a few more. So if your school is interested in learning about the Climate Action Schools program, we do have scholarships available. We've gone through our scholarshiping application process, but we'd still love to hear from you if this is something that your school may be interested in for this year. And then we'll be continuing to learn and grow it with our current Climate Action Schools. And you've heard from a couple of them today. So we had Morris Union joining. We have our school in Jamaica, our school in Illinois, you heard from DePaul. So we've had a number of our climate action schools here with us. And so we'd love to hear from you and other ways that you're interested in expanding climate education within your school, within your region, within your country. We're trying our best to be responsive to the needs of teachers and students in our mission as a nonprofit organization of climate education for all, including Climate Action Day and Climate Action Project. As Kuhn mentioned, we will be back next year. I'm already taking notes on topics and speakers for next year. We're hearing from friends. I know in the form we have for the certificate, Kuhn, you included that great question of if you could have anyone join as a speaker, who might that be? So, so thank you for the opportunity to share about our awesome new schools program and here's our link for the form yeah because anyone who would like to claim a certificate you're able to do that through this form um, and indeed we have included a few poll questions which will allow us to give more insight into what is really important and how this day may affect you and your students so let's go to a few more schools. Okay. Jen, you have like a preference? <laughs> hmm. I would say we were last in Guinea. How about we head over to Canada and they are going to be sharing in their language of French. Bonjour, mes amis autour du monde. Je m'appelle Katia Mbukulo. Et moi, je m'appelle Rim El Alani. Et nous représentons Notre pays, le Canada. Le Canada est connu pour ses magnifiques paysages et ses forêts. C'est pourquoi c'est extrêmement important pour nous de protéger notre environnement. Ici, à l'école secondaire publique Pierre de Bois, on se met tout en œuvre pour lutter contre le changement climatique et connaître ses effets et comment on peut les prévenir. Cette année, on se concentre sur les traits des déchets. On a déjà fait plusieurs actions pour le démontrer. Premièrement, on a fait des annonces sur les sujets liés au changement climatique comme les effets de consommer la viande, le mode rapide, les transports et l'utilisation de plastique. Deuxièmement, on a placé des affiches autour de l'école pour que les élèves prennent conscience de leurs actions et qu'ils sachent s'ils sont bénéfiques ou ils sont néfastes pour l'environnement. Nous avons aussi préparé des présentations et des ateliers pour apprendre aux élèves comment réfléchir de manière critique sur les produits qu'ils achètent et les entreprises auxquelles ils donnent leur argent. Et pour le futur, 
futur, nos élèves de la 9e à la 12e année vont en charge de leurs projets interdisciplinaires liés au développement des rats. On vous souhaite à faire des changements et à protéger notre planète. Dans l'amitié et la solidarité, nous vous transmettons maintenant ce message d'action, nos amis mondiaux! Awesome. Loved it. Next, we go to Jamaica. Wagwan, everybody. We're the Heinz Simmons School, and we're from Montego Bay, Jamaica. We're representing Take Action Global. Good morning. Today at Heinz, we're going to kick things off a bit more sustainably. So, for the first time ever, Heinz is going to close with no AC day. Usually, we have the ACs running throughout the day so that our students can sit a bit more comfortably while they learn. But instead, today they will be tasked with coming up with different ways to keep cool with our ever changing climate and conditions. How cool. That was awesome. So two of our climate action schools there. We have one more coming up, a climate action school that we're going to be going to. But before we go there, Carla, welcome back. Thank you for your awesome interview with Riley and Bob today. How are you doing? Hi, Jen. I'm good. I mean, there's nothing else to be on such a great day. <laughs> and um, you've been helping think... behind the scenes, I know, all day, getting quotes and helping speakers and, and supporting us. So thank you for all the things you've been doing today. Uh, it's been great fun. <laughs> yeah. So I think we're heading to a message from the UN next, right? Is that correct? We're heading over to New York City to the UN headquarters and with our good friend Danny from the UN Foundation. So let's head over there. Hi friends, I'm Danny Zapatazin from the United Nations Foundation. We are a proud partner of Teach SDGs and Climate Action Day. And I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm at the United Nations right now. It is a beautiful day this November 3rd. The flags of 193 countries are behind me representing all of the countries that you are tuning in from. That's the Secretariat building. And behind me, the General Assembly, where countries gathered this September for the Transforming Education Summit, in years prior for the Climate Summits. So this is the place where people are gathered to make the policy. And then what happens is people like you, your teachers, who are bringing this to you today, who are running these projects, who are so appreciative of the work that you are doing, you take this into the communities that you live in, where you take action that is really critical to actually protecting our planet. So we are so thankful for the climate action projects that you've been doing. We are so thankful to the hard work that you put in into making your communities better, safer, more sustainable places to live. And we are so excited to see all of the outcomes of your work. It really takes uh, a partnership. You know, the SDGs, Goal 17 is about partnership. And it really takes a partnership between the United Nations, between the member state countries, and between people in communities all around the world if we're going to actually build a more sustainable planet. So thank you for your partnership. Thank you for all that you do. We appreciate you, and we are very excited that you are all taking action together today. Take care. 
That was awesome. I love seeing all those flags out in front of the United Nations. If you haven't been to the United Nations, we definitely recommend that you check out their website. You can do virtual tours and there's a lot of great ways to get connected with them and of course with the sustainable development goals. Yes. And we have one final speaker and maybe Jen, you can introduce her. Oops. Very excited to introduce our good friend, Regina, and she joins from Fridays for the Future. You may have heard of this organization. It's led by Greta Thunberg, and there are countries across the world that are having leadership around youth activism. So, you know, we commit at Take Action Global to ensuring that youth are a part of the work that we do. You've met a couple of our awesome interns and fellows today. And Regina is an advisor on our team and she's actually heading to COP and she will be representing the voices of young people, particularly girls and young women, you'll hear from her. So she's joining from the airport with a message to you all for Climate Action Day. Hello, my name is Regina Cabrera and I am a climate justice activist from Mexico. I am part of Fight the Future Mapa, and uh, right now I am at the airport heading towards COP27 to represent the young women out there. Uh, well, my work as an activist is like basically I do like social media campaigns about uh, climate education. I also uh, am involved in campaigns about uh, like suing. Uh, fossil fuel industries here in Mexico, like Pemex, and uh, other things like connecting with the international community. And uh, the message that I have for the youth is that if you believe in a cause, if you believe in anything, you can do it, you can make it happen. Like we are the change and we can change the system. It doesn't matter why everybody said we are the change and we can change the system let's have some hope that's, that's a great a message great message yeah i really wonder how the students are in honduras are doing right now we should go find out Greetings from Tegucigalpa, Honduras. We are part of Go School and in this important day we're going to share with you some actions that we do to support our environment. We're a mercury-free school. We eliminated traditional mercury-based lamp projectors and changed to eco-friendly data projection. The school has a culture of waste management. Waste generated at school is segregated into paper, plastic and waste. We raise awareness about the importance of biodiversity. <laughs> we have stickers on the walls to remind the community of turning off the lights and faucets. We collect paper for recycling. We have reforestation activities. Every year we do a school-wide blackout during morning hours to promote environmental awareness. Thanks to all teachers and school in this event, in friends and solidarity, we now pass this message of action to you, our global friends. Bye. Well, we always speak about every continent, right? And there's one continent which is still missing and that is a little bit because of time zones but still jen we have to head over there to get our last one checked off we're going to oceana We went to the Earth Day Expo 
show and got to hear from different environmental organisations on what they were doing to help. We decided to set up soft plastic recycling to minimise the amount of waste a school sends to them. We had a reward for conservation version where we learned That's wonderful, right? That was so cool. <laughs> really great. Okay. So this is not the end yet, but still we would like to thank a few people. Jen? Okay. So we have a number of people we'd like to thank. First, let's start with our community of teachers and students who have joined us for the Climate Action Project that they are here today with Climate Action Day. We are so grateful for you and thank you for always reaching out, sharing your ideas, being so open to this type of teaching and learning. We know that you all have a lot on your plate right now and you are prioritizing climate education and we have lots more and many more ways that you can partner up with us and we would love to keep connecting you with all of the awesome speakers we had today. So Kun and I are here representing a team of committed educators, youth activists, people who really care about this work around climate education, and that is our Take Action Global team. And you've met a couple of them today, but there are many, many more people who've been with us a long time. So we have facilitators and ambassadors and tag team members. We're going to talk about each of those, but maybe Kun, we could start with our tag team and offer our thanks to them. So we have at TAG a couple different teams. So we have engagement teams and partnership teams. We have people who are doing outreach to the schools in their countries, and you've met some of them. We have a dev team. So we have people who are working to build platforms and build apps for our teachers and our students. We have climate scientists and we have teachers. So we are uh, growing our team. We're, we're so happy to see Ayanfe today and Carla joining a couple times with Gila as well. And they were here with us doing interviews. So uh, maybe we could say one more thanks to Carla and see that she has been with us really for so many things with Climate Action Day. If you access the uh, speaker guide for classrooms. She wrote that amazing document. I think it's like 50 pages long. And so she has really worked day and night between her work as a full-time student to get that resource ready. She also has been with us for years now, translating, joining, meeting other classrooms as a mentor. I know, Carla, last week you had a couple mentor sessions from schools around the world. So thank you for being here and representing our whole team. Thank you. And can't yeah. wait to see what we do next too. Thank you so much, Carla. Yeah, what started with uh, two teachers doing something, a uh, small project, uh, really grew to a lot. And uh, yeah, so I'd like to confirm, thank you so much for all of the teachers and students joining us drop in the comments make sure to comment how often you have been joining the climate action project as well um we launched it in 2017 and now we have like a big big team working on this and we may be the face today but so many people are working behind the scenes we also have some trusted partners which we really appreciate and which have been supporting us in different ways and uh, so a big thank you to them as well 
We also had a few teachers reaching out to press. Um, some of them have been covered in their countries. This is not uh, every article which has been covered, but uh, we have been in India, in the UAE, in Spain, Turkey, and Austria. And uh, by the end of the event, we will be sharing a link and we will also be sending an email which has a press release. So if you would like to reach out to press as well, because of what you did during the today and the, the past weeks, feel free to do that. I think the world needs to know about you, about your efforts. This is your moment. Uh, so thank you so much for doing that. Well, Jen, we still have a few videos left of uh, students. Which one will be next? Well, I would love uh, to head over to our friends in the Ukraine. And I know we've had a lot of schools joining from the Ukraine. You mentioned them earlier today. And no matter what they're facing, they are still prioritizing climate action. We're so grateful for them. Probably, hopefully, they're sleeping right now. <laughs> but if they rewatch this, we send our love to our friends in the Ukraine. And here's a video from one of our schools. Okay. <laughs> and then there was silence, right? Yes, that's right. So, yes, I want to confirm. Um, I was kind of amazed that um, students in Ukraine have still, still be able to do this, uh, still be able to join the project. Some of them being forced to do it online and others in their schools. But we are really appreciate their efforts. And next we will go to Spain. Ideas para combatir el cambio climático. Love right. that. <laughs> What's next, Jen? Okay, so I think we should head over to our friends in Mexico. Right. 
So we have one video left, but before that, we would like to thank our ambassadors and our facilitators. Um, we found a way, Jen and I, um, to give the project and the day a bit more structure. And the facilitators are doing a lot. They are teachers who have been running the project for years. They have uh, quite... Um, forgetting the word <laughs> they have <laughs> a, quite a lot of experience yes. um, but they have been guiding a lot of new teachers as well within in their own native language which allows us to run the project in hindi in arabic in french portuguese help me out jen um, oh we have a lot more we have spanish we have romanian we have we have 15 Ukrainian, groups, 10 Turkish. of them are, yeah, it's yep. like the list goes on. Vietnamese this year. Languages. Yes. German. <laughs> and we would we like to thank them as well. And also the ambassadors, they are taking the lead within their uh, country, reaching out to governments, to other schools, uh, to press, and a lot more. So thank you so much to the facilitators and the ambassadors. Okay. They are they are the heart of our program and and volunteering their time every day they're in the groups leading and we thank you all so so much awesome let's go to syria let's do it hello i'm badria tamuri the syrian coordinator for the climate action project after working for four weeks on this project my students devised initiatives as measures to protect the environment including cleaning and planting school gardens and public parks in their city and they won the alert initiative whereby awareness raising guidelines are drawing on both leads and use it as medals attached to their school pairs and also the initiative of the fund and life map whereby students prepare bleach cards for endangered animals and put them on the map of the climate action project in their location as well as the initiative to manufacture plastic from environmentally friendly natural materials all these initiatives were supported by the director of education in latakia city to be circulated to all schools in the syrian cities thank you for giving us the opportunity to communicate with you and work together to save our planet earth Amazing. So great. Yeah. So, well, if you made some pictures today of you, students, a group, a watch party, watching the event today, it would be really great to see those on social media. Feel free to share them on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, using the hashtag. Otherwise, we would, may not be able to see it. And feel free to follow us for our next adventures. We also would like to refer to our website because we have made a great website for this event. And that is climateactionday.net. Well, it's a great website because there's more. Uh, we had a few speakers and they are at the website and you can find them. And they include, um, let me check briefly, <laughs> uh, a lot of buttons to do this. Um, <laughs> it's amazing. Andreas Schleicher, he had uh, a really great video about the numbers behind uh, climate and education. It's a really great video and make sure to find it at the website. And also we had the Minister of Education. She's a new minister for Costa Rica, is also sharing her thoughts. So what I would like to say uh, is thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, we've been doing this for a long time and still we only met twice face to face. Well, that's not right, three times. <laughs> 
That's um, right. Three times. That's right. But still, <laughs> we are meeting every single day. Um, we are reflecting about what we have been doing, thinking ahead, working with the team. It's a lot. And uh, really grateful for, in particular, what you, uh, you have been doing for the last months with the Climate Action Schools program, which is new. That was really a lot. And so really grateful for being my friends and doing this together with me. I wouldn't be uh, on this adventure without you, I think. And um, also, thank you so much again to everyone attending. It is, for some people, I'm really sure it's in the middle of the night and still they are watching uh, and they will be there for the last seconds, which is now. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much, not only for watching this event, but also for taking action, because that is what really matters. We have so many people talking about it. Um, we have so many people ignoring it, but you are going the extra mile by taking action, finding solutions, sharing your passion, and making sure that other people around you are also concerned about uh, the same thing. I'm really proud that we are always able to go to the next stage. Um, it began with just a few, a handful of teachers, and now we are working with governments, with big uh, NGOs. Many, many organizations know about what we are doing with climate education. I think we can say that we are the largest organization working on climate education, or at least uh, having the most people, most uh, students involved. So really proud of that. And the last words, the last minutes go to you, Jen. Thank you, Kuhn. So you are exactly right. We have had people with us from the very beginning of today. I see that they are still sharing out messages. It is the middle of the night for them. They are always with us and we are so grateful for all of you being a part of this journey with us. So uh, 3 a.m. in Singapore, hi friends in Moldova, hi Devra. So we have friends that are teachers that come with us project to project, event to event. They are in this fight. Kuhn and I say all the time, we're not going anywhere. This is, this is our life's work. And for those of you who have already heard our story, uh, my message to you is just have your eyes open for opportunity because I remember I was that third time you're thinking of Kuhn. I was at a conference presenting in Belgium and Kuhn wasn't too close, but he messaged me and he was like, I need to come see you. I need to talk to you. And I was like, I only have five minutes. And he was like, it doesn't matter. I'm going to find a way. And he did. And we sat outside of that school building. And he was like, I have this idea. I think we can make it happen. And those are those moments. And it was actually caught by a student with a camera. So my best pal, Kuhn, we, we start our day and end our day messaging each other. <laughs> I wake up and he's already there messaging me. And when, I know when he's going to sleep, uh, I'm messaging him. So know that all of you teachers, you are in our hearts. You are in every moment of our day. And Kuhn, I send that message of thanks right back to you for inspiring all the greatness of the Climate Action Project, Climate Action Day, our new program, Climate Action Schools, and generally climate education. We can't wait to see what we're all able to do next together. So we thank you for being with us today. It has been Incredible. I have to say, and I was messaging Kuhn on this earlier. I'm like, this is the best one yet. I think we're getting this down. We are just, as you mentioned, we are two teachers <laughs> trying to find a way to, to make it happen. So so thank you all for, for being with us as, as we learn and as we grow. We can't, uh, we can't do this without you. Yeah. And we're also open to feedback. So if you think next year, make sure to do this, invite this speaker. Um, we really would love to hear that. We want an experience which, which is not just listening to, but also having you involved. Um, some of the great speakers really didn't work out. So we have been trying certain public figures for years 
And Years. maybe <laughs> once we will <laughs> succeed, we keep pushing for it. Um, but yeah, I think having students asking the first lady great questions so great. and having other students in an interaction with astronauts who have been on the moon or no, not on the moon, but in so space crazy. at least. It's amazing. Crazy to the um, um, close to the moon. Close to the moon. Amazing. <laughs> I think that is that really makes my day. Makes my day too. So thank you so much. And see I'll you see soon. you all next time. Thanks. Bye.